matters of battle between the arms of government, not all of them will be resolvable in a court of law, Thank you. Uh, especially when you want actual resolve. Some might be met with political, you know, uh, 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 what we call political skirmish. Mm. And I think that the best thing to do now is, is not to go and hang all of us. Yeah, it's good to go to court, and uh, it's definitely the, the suit has merit and must be heard. But at the end of the day, uh, if you want to counter what is happening, uh, it is politics, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think there's any legal issues con in, in this matter. It is politics, and uh, I think it must be resolved also through another means of politics. Now, the second question you asked uh, is whether it will have political ramification for any of the parties. Let me tell you one thing. In this country, the main thing that controls politics is not religion, it is, it is not uh, uh, economic status, it is tribe. That is the most dominant factor in our politics. We don't often talk about it, but it is tribe that de determine who wins elections, you know, in this country, mainly. So I don't see this, you know, LGBTQ thing influencing any political, you know, it, it won't have any political effect on any, anything. No, even religious matters don't. And so I don't think that somebody who, who tries to vote for, you know, uh, Dr. Baumia or the NPP would go to the polls and because of this LGBTQ thing would decide that you vote for, you know, someone else. Neither do I think that someone would vote for NDC entirely on this. I mean, of course, individual, some individuals will do that, but in, in the general effect of this, will know, there will not be any much influence on any electoral outcome based on this, this, this law. Thank you, uh, Doc, for joining the conversation. Squeezing out time, you would have used to lecture and all of that. Thank you. We are grateful uh, for your time. Thank you morning. so much. And have a nice day, senior. No, no, the man is not in Ghana. He's not in Ghana. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm in Ghana. I mean, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Ghana here, right? Very well. Very well. <laughs> but right. we'll talk. Thank you very much. We'll sir. talk. And that is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Justice uh, Srem Sai. Uh, he just joined the conversation as well. I could tell he was in Ghana from the picture on the wall. Oh, I see. If, okay. if you hadn't <laughs> noticed the picture on the wall, but I could have been mistaken as well. Uh, so your reflections, Dr. Sremsai has had a lot to say. He says yes. it's a, there's a complete lack of candor yes. or honesty. Um, he also talks about the fact that, in fact, in referencing the e-levy at the time, it wasn't just the suit in court. Uh, there was also another suit from yes. Oliver Baka yes. Vomao. Yes. Uh, to stay the hand of the GRA in implementing the tax proceeding, reform or the proceeding tax with the, uh, with the proceeding with the tax. And, and in spite of all that, the president went on to give his assent. And, and he believes this is just a tactful way of President Ekufuado. One, me, I'll not veto it, but I'll also not play ball. And in the end, I'll finish my term and walk away. Well, what do you make of that? Well, uh, it's... it's um it's a destination that uh, some of us saw some time ago. And you see, like, like my brother said, it, it's a complete lack of candor. I mean, honest belief, it's missing. Look, if you recall the Dome level case, his removal from office, the, the constitutional action to determine the constitutionality or otherwise of his removal, the president proceeded to do all that he did even though the matter was in court. These arguments from Bedou Ito didn't arise. In fact, he wrote some of the letters. The Domele for removal from office, Bedou Ito wrote it. You understand? So, they, 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 they've taken everybody for granted. They are running the country like they are sole proprietorship. Rule of law, governance thrown to the dogs. They do what they desire. And when they think that the law must come in, then they, they quickly made those arguments. Where the law must come in and they disagree, they disregard it and proceed. So, but in all this, we are in court. And I think the parliament has the power to remit the bill to the office of the president. That has to be done. That has to be done. If anybody feels parliament in doing so, has conducted it, itself contemptuously of the court. Let's, let's, by all means, let the contempt proceedings be initiated. Mm. And let's go and show cause why contempt must not lie against parliament. 
I mean, people want to talk law when they don't want to talk law. Because so, so you think you think the MPP is shifting the goalposts at at every opportunity? Is at that every opportunity. Mm. At every opportunity. I mean, look, every morning, nearly every parliamentary sitting days, mm. you, okay, or nearly every week of parliament sitting sittings, we receive communication from the president. When the president travels outside the country, he's constitutionally mandated to inform the speaker of parliament. Mm. Of his, of sometimes of his itinerary. So can we expect Parliament to engage in tit for tat? Why not? This, this is a whole power clash of powers. But it would be petty to just. It would not be petty. Matters no. That oh, you because see, you've done this to me. No. We also, it would, no. That, that, it that would, could. That it could. Uh, hold, no. hold for me. Hold for me. We're not talking of two quarrelling people. We're talking of two. Organ arms of state, organs of, organs of state. It, it's a crucial matter. It's not just about ego. It's about the workings of the state, basically. So have you media men criticized the government for its conduct in this matter? We and, have discussed the said, issues. We've discussed, you discussed the issues as they ought to be discussed. Have taken a position that what the president has done is wrong, against parliament is wrong? We don't necessarily need to take a position. You have to. In, in the discourse, you we see, have spelled out see, how things see, have gone do that, and voiced out on some see, of these if matters. You don't, we don't do need to do that. Take a you are the voice of the nation. Mm. You, you, you say you are the fourth estate. If the three estates, if Isn't it we who say? Oh, yes, you are saying so. <laughs> you are the fourth estate. We say we are the fourth Yes, estate. you are the fourth estate. So <laughs> the fourth estate must be loud in this matter. What is wrong is wrong. Right. So if parliament decides to pay back the presidency, do you think that matters can proceed properly in this country? There will be a gridlock. Parliament will tell you that we will also not receive communication from the office of the president. Mm. And we will find so, position in the law to back it. So government business could come to a standstill. Exactly. That is why you don't conduct yourself as a public servant or a public officer this way. It's totally unacceptable. And yet there will be no consequences when people misconduct themselves, they misbehave. Nothing happens. That's why things like this continue to happen in the way they do. Uh, Harun Idrisu, the former minority leader, yeah. he talked about Article 93 of the Constitution, uh, clothing with legislative authority and could not be injuncted that Parliament, by Article 93 of the Constitution, is clothed with legislative authority and can't be injuncted from undertaking that mandate as is being sought by the two applicants, that is um, yes. Richard Delaskai and um, yes. Odoi, yes. right? And he says an application for injunction is not an application in itself for the president to de delineate his duty as he's enjoined uh, by the constitution or to shirk his duty. Yes. Um, so, so you have the suit, Yes. right? That uh, let me let me explain let me explain let me touch on article 93 yes, no um, um, le leaders leaders mm. comments he granted the interview yesterday your former leader yes right. look the same amanda audrey was in court last year and the supreme court told her that you cannot injunct parliament from working on the said bill she brought an injunction to injunct this same parliament from proceeding to deal with the bill. The court dismissed the action. And the contempt proceedings consequent upon her, her claim that parliament speaker was proceeding to deal with the bill was subsequently also withdrawn because of the dismissal of the, of the injunctive application. Mm. So there's already a Supreme Court pronouncement on the fact that when, when a bill remains a bill to a bill, no authority can be brought to bear to disaffect it in, uh, as, as regards parliamentary work. No, but everybody is oblivious of that decision. The same applicant. So the bill as it is in parliament is not an act of parliament properly as defined in Article 295 in the Constitution. It is still a product of parliament. So. I agree with a lot of lawyers who are saying that this, 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 these actions are premature in the manner that they have been couched. Okay. Now, regarding my action, 
I told you two weeks ago that the decision by the president to dismiss some number of ministers of state in a, in a, in a publicly issued statement with immediate effect was pursuant to Article 81A of the Constitution. They have been removed. Their portfolios have been revoked. And he himself said so. And actually added that he wished them well in their future endeavors. Now, the president then proceeds to make fresh nominations for purposes of being run through the requirements in Article 78 and 79 of the Constitution for occupying those portfolios that is designated for them. Then the president again said, he, the person, some ministers that he had already, whose appointment he had already revoked, he was reassigning them to different portfolios or different ministries. Right. And that is why I think that he had. It's a violent breach of the Constitution. I raised the matter. In the, in the corridors of power, in quiet tones, they will admit that it was, a, it was a grave error, that the communication ought not to have been done that way. So I was expecting that there will be a formal correction of that. It hasn't happened. And we cannot allow such constitutional anomalies to persist. So I've sued. What am I asking for? I'm saying... Those, those persons that whose um, appointments we revoke as ministers of state and deputy ministers of state with immediate effect were no longer occupants of ministerial portfolios for which they could be reassigned. That's my argument. Mm. And therefore, he's, he's mandated under the constitution to make, to appoint anybody of his choosing if the person is qualified within the qualification criteria set out to be a minister of state. If, if it does so, then they must be subjected to the requirements under Article 78 and 79. That is pure parliamentary approval. Mm -hmm. But what I've done is that I have tied the hands of parliament to proceeding ahead with, with the current vetting process until the president does the needful by submitting the names of the other ministers, the six or so of them, to the vet to the list board to parliament for vetting for that to be done so that's where we are what in essence does all of this mean what what in essence does all of this mean we must not allow the constitution to be breached if i may read if you read article one of the constitution Article 1 2 of the Constitution says, This Constitution shall be the supreme law of Ghana, and any other law found to be inconsistent with any provision of this Constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. Now, any other decision that is also considered to be unconstitutional can also be challenged. So, it is on this basis that I'm proceeding to challenge the fact that the President cannot mm. dismiss a Minister of State and decide to uh, reappoint that, that same Minister of State to another portfolio without having recourse to parliamentary approval requirement under Article 78. It's a procedure, it amounts to constitutional procedural impropriety that must be remedied by the Supreme Court. Mm. He must be compelled to, to submit those names for, um, uh, for, for parliamentary, for the pre-approval process of parliament to be given effect to. And this is right. This was the same arguments they made in G.H. Mensah versus Attorney General in 97 in this country. Well, thank you, um, Roxanne, for having joined uh, the conversation. For those of you who were watching uh, live via the stream on Facebook, we apologize. The stream went off at a point and uh, we had to start it up again. You know about the internet connectivity issues. We apologize uh, for that. And um, I guess you would have a full package of what happened, a full complement of that. But we've been discussing 
the issue to do with the president failing uh, to give his assent to the anti-LGBTQ plus uh, bill. The matter in court, the positioning of the attorney general, the positioning or the communication from the executive secretary to the president, Nanasa Antibebietu, and the posturing of parliament as well. Only time will tell uh, how we proceed on this matter. But stay with us. We still have more very pertinent con uh, conversations coming your way. We'll still be uh, discussing that issue as well to do with uh, Ghana Connect, that town hall meeting in uh, Tamale. All that and more still to come. Do stay. <laughs> of November last year, His Royal Majesty the King Osei II, the second, two four, um, launched the Hill Confanochi project. It's a drive to raise funds for the rehabilitation or renovation of the almost 70-year-old Confanochi Teaching Hospital, which was named after the great priest of the Ashanti Kingdom, Okonfanochi. Incidentally, when uh, Okonfanochi first put the sword that was supposed to be a unifying factor of all the Ashanti states on the ground. It was a two for said to the first who was the king of Ashanti then. Um, and so as part of the 25th anniversary celebration when the king decided that the time had come for him to lead that drive for people from far and near to contribute to the renovation of the almost 70 year facility which has never seen any renovation when, since it was built in 1955. It was welcoming and refreshing. And it's marked of leadership that every young man or woman would aspire to. Now, like I said, every day, on the average, we receive about 1,000 patients who are coming from at least 12 out of the 16 regions in Ghana. So Convanochi serves as a referral facility for 12 out of 16 regions in Ghana. Ordinarily, retooling of a hospital like Convanochi would be seen as the responsibility of government. It is indeed true, but in many developed democracies, like the United States, Canada, UK, Germany. I'm sure many of us who have lived there at one point or another in our lives are aware that these things are done. Private individuals, philanthropists, and so on, give non-governmental organizations, give towards the renovation, the building of new hospitals, and so on, and so forth. And so the king being a golfer himself, the golfers decided that it was one of the ways by which they could contribute to the king's vision. And so today what has happened is that the golfers are launching uh, a competition of a sort that would see to them contributing generously to the king's drive. I have absolutely no doubt for that for this that the golfers have done, their names will be written in gold. Posterity will judge them for rough. Thank you very much and God bless you. is big. We know the passion gets you going and you have the potential to make great strides. The Chartered Institute of Market in Ghana has always been an avid supporter of industry excellence and innovation. This is why we are excited to announce the CIMG Professional Marketing Qualifications. CIMG has designed practical courses to help you make that dream a reality right here in Ghana. We are geared up and ready to support you on this journey to becoming a world-class professional marketer. Register today and be on your way to greatness. For more information, call us on 055-274-6592. Visit our website www.cimghana.org or email us on info at cimghana.org. Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana. Working for Ghana.
Countdown to December 7, political party manifestos will anchor the key issues that will define the next government. The need is urgent to guarantee that the manifestos reflect the real needs of citizens. Star Ghana and Joy News proudly present the Ghana Connect Town Hall, live from the Northern Regional Capital, Tamale. Citizens will gather at the Bagabaga College of Education on Wednesday, March 20, 2024, at 3 p.m. for the live live town hall engagement. Join us for the pre-live event engagements from the morning as we sift through the key issues of importance to you. The Star Ghana Joy News Ghana Connect Town Hall. Live on Joy News, Joy 99.7 FM, myjoyonline.com and across our social media platforms from 3 p.m. this Wednesday. Make your voice count in the crafting of manifestos only on your election headquarters. To the online platform I had infiltrated. I when I look at the economic management team, it is quite clearly a fantastic team. Professor Jan Bafo, Senior Minister Yao Osafu Maf. What a solid team. your essential guide to the pulse of Ghana's democracy. Election Brief offers you a front row seat to the latest updates, in-depth analysis and comprehensive coverage. What does this mean? We therefore project it is almost statistically impossible for President John Dramani Mahama to achieve 50% plus one. Our projection is that Nana Adodankwa Kufado will win the 2016 presidential election. During this campaign season, our experienced team of reporters will bring you exclusive insights, breaking news, and unbiased reporting from every corner of Ghana. The people have met him with excitement and they keep chanting savior uh, to imply that they believe that he holds the key to turning the economic fortunes of the country. As, as vice president, I am like a driver's mate. But by the grace of God, if you make me the president, I will be in the driver's seat with constitutional We dive deep into the strategies, the promises, and the people shaping the future of our country. Election Brief isn't just about the headlines. It is about the voices of the people. This is an election. These people came to us that they are going to maintain everyone. And here lies the case. We have the video evidence. And now they've taken our names out. Look at the number of people here. And you expect us to let the election go on. Never. Join the conversation and have your say. Your voice matters in shaping Ghana's future. Catch the election brief every weekday from 2 to 2.30 p.m. only on Joy News. Joy News, your election headquarters. Plus, a Sifu Abaje just wanted to help his mom fix her milling machines whenever they broke down. But with the skills he has acquired, he's now designing and manufacturing agriculture and construction machineries. We feature his startup, Age Engineering, this Wednesday on the Joy Business Van. I also discovered a challenge that is in the agri sector, which is uh, post harvest loss in cereal production. So that was where I gained interest in developing. Um, a threshing machinery for the large section of the underserved market segment who are into agriculture who do not really have the means to purchase you know, these humongous machineries that are or treasures that are on the market. So the, the aim um, was to add um, threshing machineries to the production 
so that we will have machines that are professionally designed of high quality standard and economical as possible. Theophilus's vision is to industrialize Africa and create jobs for the youth. Age Engineering on the Joy Business Van this Wednesday on TV, radio, online and on ground. Powered by Joy Business and supported by Ecobank, A Better Way, A Better Africa and MTN, What Are We Doing Today? down to December 7, political party manifestos will anchor the key issues that will define the next government. The need is urgent to guarantee that the manifestos reflect the real needs of citizens. Star Ghana and Joy News proudly present the Ghana Connect Town Hall live from the Northern Regional Capital, Tamale. Citizens will gather at the Bagabaga College of Education on Wednesday, March 20, 2024 at 3 p.m. for the live town hall engagement. Join us for the pre-live event engagements from the morning as we sift through the key issues of importance to you. The Star Ghana Joy News Ghana Connect Town Hall live on Joy News, Joy 99.7 FM, myjoyonline.com and across our social media platforms from 3 p.m. this Wednesday. Make your voice count in the crafting of manifestos only on your election headquarters. Welcome back on the AM show and we continue our conversation, salient conversations. And um, we're going to be talking about the power issues because now the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission has issued a directive to the Electricity Company of Ghana asking for an incident report. They are also asking for detailed information on power outages starting from January the 1st, 2024. The question is, why are all of these things happening? I have a personal question as an individual, but maybe collectively as well. I use the Comstrap 2 kind of ECG meter, and guess what? In recent times, it's been problematic. The same thing happened sometime last year, where for a whole week, five days, I was without power. It took some intervention from the managing director of the ECG, um, Samuel Dubik Mahama. I had to place a call to him, and uh, some things eventually uh, were done. But right now, another issue that is pending those using Comstrap 2, I don't know whether it's nationwide, but those in my community, including me, you cannot load electricity even if you have money. You can't buy at a vendor because there's no connection. You also cannot use the app on your phone. It basically means you have money, you want to purchase electricity credits, and you can't. Your food or whatever in your freezer or fridge will go bad. If you have equipment, there may be issues, you cannot iron your clothes, you may have to go out. That is the sort of inconvenience. And then there's the other issue that uh, the PURC is addressing. But joining us uh, for a conversation on that all-important matter, we have Kojo uh, Poku, and he is an energy analyst. He joins the conversation. Kojo, good morning. Uh, good morning, my brother. How are you? I am well, and uh, especially relevant as you are a member of the MPP's Energy Committee when it comes to the manifesto. I'm sure these two issues I've just put forward. I'm sure you heard them. You know of the PURC issue. And then I've just added our Comstrap 2 uh, circumstance where, again, here you are. You have money, you want to purchase credits, and you can't. For me, it's been two days now. Last year, it was five days. But what do you make, for starters, of that development in respect of the metering? Well, um, you know, the metering is also affected by the internet. 
So I, when I, I know that, but I'm reliably informed that right. this. I'm just, I'm just saying. There. I'm just saying that that could be a reason because you said that the last two days, mm. and the last two days you have um, experienced connectivity issues with the internet. Because mm. what it does is that your meter uses the SIM card in there. The same like the cellular network, which has not been working, to mm. connect with the server in the billing system. Okay. Um, so that could be the issue in the last two days. I'm so, not saying that is, but right. it could be. I made, I made um, the inquiry. I made the inquiry because I thought it could be that. And I was told it wasn't that. In fact, you know, there are different types of meters. And uh, the yes. cam strap is a bit advanced. In fact, it is being phased out. But you know that this is free. And let me make that point. It comes to mind. I know of people who have gone, because I hear ECG has outsourced to some people. And some people go and say, oh, they are getting you the new meter and pay. It is free. You are not supposed to pay for these meters. If people come to you and they say pay for them, they are lying. So call them out. You can reach out to Joy News, Joy FM, and let's deal with such people. But they are going through a phase of taking out these comes up to uh, meters. It's a slow process. I, I know how it's gone. It, it, it seems to be a problem with those specific meters rather than any internet connectivity issues. But in the meantime, in my community alone, I know seven people personally who are going through the same situation where they can't purchase credits. Do you know what that means? That means even without yeah, th the regular power outages, <laughs> you, you are still without power. Yeah, I think um, the solution in most cases has been that people are given, that those meters are taken away. And whilst you don't have one to replace immediately, everybody is given a flat rate to pay. Um, the flat rate is like a, sh a, 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 a gap measure, okay, to basically make sure that you have connectivity to your house whilst ECG resolves the problem that exists. Mm. Um, please do contact the customer service in your area. If you can let me know the area of air, I can tell the regional um, engineer who can also be of assistance. Mm. Let's get now to the substantive issue. Uh, the PRC has communicated to the ECG in very certain terms, no uncertain terms, saying it has seven days to provide a detailed incident report on power outages. You do know as well that, especially the business community among others, people have called on the ECG to come out with a timetable so that they know and they can plan. Um, before you get to the PRC statement, what do you feel about that call? for a timetable now, so that we know when there's going to be a power outage, rather than just be there and boom, power is gone? Well, um, we have tried to explain to the public the reason for the outages. And I have always said that there are a mixed bag of problems out there right now. There are localized problems, which the ECG has come out to say that it's a result of, in certain areas, there are transformers overloaded. Now, the localized problem, it will be difficult for anybody to give a timetable for localized problems. Now, let's talk about the bigger picture. In the last six to seven weeks, we have had um, intermittent and regular power outages across the country. And some of us have come out to basically explain that it's as a result of some maintenances that have been ongoing. The plan that was done didn't go well because some companies were supposed to come back for maintenance and they couldn't come back on the time that they're supposed to come back. A big example of that is NGAS, who were supposed to come back at a certain time of their maintenance to guarantee us the 50 mm gas of gas, um, the 50 mm scarf of gas that comes from Nigeria, and that maintenance delayed a little. So the pressure from Nigeria is not as we expect it to be. So that has also created some shortages in the gas that we get. You have TICO, Tico and TAPCO, which went into maintenance last year and has still not fully um, come back into our stream. Then you have View Power, who also have some challenges with one of their units, and they are trying to repair that. And that right. is our peaking plan. Then you have Amandi, which nobody thought would go through the situation that is going through now, because it's a rel relatively new machine. And Amandi at times is down. So these misbag of um, misfortune or mishaps, should I say, and the maintenance is creating that shortfall in the peak time. It's difficult to give a timetable when you don't know what your demand is going to be at peak, because you do have the supply. Now, if the peak wait, is wait, low, wait, 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 you're but, saying we don't know what our demand will be at peak? I thought I yes, thought we know, had specific figures. You don't know what figures. your demand will be at peak. Say it again. 
I thought, I thought, and I've even heard the ECG boss talk about at peak times we we expect around this this figure. Uh, I just it just escapes me what he mentioned, but we know we well, have but, we have but, a bracket. But that is yes, but if that is the peak, then you will not have to load shed in that instance because you know what your mean your mean is roughly. You know what your mean is because they do this reconciliation maybe around before four o'clock every day between Greco and all the IPPs and ECG. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, everybody knows that everything is fine. But then you now have an unexpected load, which is the peak. Because, the, look, no electricity in one day is the same. Okay? We don't have the set electricity after 6 o'clock, one set of electricity. The demand on the grid varies day to day. In some days, it's very low. In some days, it's very high. Recently, we've gone through very heat waves, okay, where we are experiencing... Um, heat of about 40 degrees Celsius, which is unprecedented, never happened in Ghana. So, in but, but we also know exactly what is happening, Kojopoku. And this is where sometimes I get, I get a bit. We know we've been told that the the positioning of the equator and where Ghana is positioned, and that for months I have read um, a, a GMET yes, or some I, other but, report but, but, about yeah. that. So it's not like we don't know. We've been told for a number yeah, of months, but, but maybe three or four months. We'll that, go through. What them. I'm saying to you is that. Ben, what I'm saying to you is that we know the heat wave is there. Whether Kwesi Mensa or Yamenu put on their air, their air condition, I don't know that. You don't know that. The point I'm making is that, yes, we know the heat wave is there. But whether people put on their ACs at night, who knows that? Doesn't so stand to reason. That, Does it not stand to reason that the hotter it gets, people will want to cool down, and definitely you can expect that people will use this. Doesn't not stand to reason? Yes, that is, the, that is the logic. But I can't give you a timetable based on that. That's the problem. What I'm saying to you is that, we have the capacity. The load, the, the, the supply is there. Now, if I know that I have over, let's say, 4,000 supply on the system, or I have, let's say, 3,500 supply on the system, then in the evening, my peak load now goes more than the supply I have. Then I have to manage the frequency on the grid. Then I take some areas off. How do I give timetable for that eventuality? That's the point I'm trying to make. Look, so, so, in so the time part, Mm. But let me explain this. In the time past, when timetables were given for six months, there was a reason for that. Because we knew that no matter what we do, even Confanochi comes, we are short of 300 megawatts. So we can plan that effectively within the next six months. That Look, here's a timetable. This is how we are going to basically uh, shed load for the next six months because we don't have 300 megawatts. We are not in the same situation now. Now, let me add this. I don't know whether some journalists cannot read or it's mischief. Everybody, most front pages are saying that, oh, the PULC have asked ECG for a timetable. No, they have not done that. If you read the directive from PULC... Well, I don't think that has been referenced here. here. I don't think that has been referenced no, here. No, but it's in, it's in a lot of front pages that mm. EC, PULC have asked ECG for doom's or timetable. They have asked it's for an, an incident a, report. So, mm. so say that again? They've asked for an incident report. Which is what yes, we have reported. And also, they've asked for a timetable for the areas where they will be doing the transformer insertion and work on transformers. Because mm. remember, ECG came out and said that there are about 630 transformers that are overloaded and they need to replace them or do True. insertions. True. So, what PLC is saying is that in those areas, the time that you'll be doing that work, provide timetable for the communities where th that will be affected. That is the timetable that PLC is asking ECG for. PULC have not asked ECG to provide a doomsday timetable or a load shedding timetable, as many journalists have put out on their front pages and social media. It's really sad. Look, are we out there to educate the public or just to create sensation? This is a problem where people think that creating a timetable will go to, um, I, I don't know, but it, it gives me some level of political connotation because nobody's scared of giving a timetable. I could you for Google, ask for a timetable if the situation arises. But and, as and, it stands now, that and, you can't give one. Right. And, and that's what I find, because I go back to some of your utterances in the erstwhile administration. And you, you, you were talking about timetables, load shedding timetables, and, and the yes. need for them at a point. I remember clearly you were talking about them. Yes. Uh, you were basically saying, and mind you, this erratic power situation, Ghanaians, if we activated the phone lines now, would have quite a take on this has been going on, if I'm not mistaken, for about two years, on and off, on and off situation, this and that. There's always an explanation. 
Listen, Ghanaians are tired. No, no, hold on, hold on for me. Hold for me. Ben, lights have been going on since Kwame Nkrumah. So there's a difference. There's a difference. What are we talking about? If, 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 what's the difference? If every week my lights go off maybe two or three times a week, sometimes I am not home. You will come back and gadgets. You can tell. And then you ask and someone will tell you, oh, the lights went off maybe around 10 in the morning or 9 in the morning, came back at this time. You can tell because some gadgets are, my fridge now is acting up. I have a friend whose freezer has gone bonkers and the person gave them two options. You can fix it for a cost of over 2,000 CDs, but there's no guarantee that this will last. And so you may have to do this again in the shortest possible time. They had to cough up money to go and buy a brand new uh, deep freezer. So this is not a situation of if or when, it is happening. And it has been going on for yes, quite a I, while I now. Agree, for about, I agree with is you. this not long enough for us to know exactly what is happening and, and plan no, along? Ben, I agree with you, but you see, Ben, the situation you just explained, we all agree. That is why some of us were very sad when the PSP was cancelled. Look, as far back as 2016, 2015, we knew that ECG needs about $500 million worth of investments. We went into Compact 2 and said that, look, we, we should bring a private company who will inject $110 million into ECG every year. Unfortunately, that process was truncated because of the problem with PDS. When we truncated that process, I, some of, most of us have asked the government that PSP should happen, okay, because ECG do need that investment. Now, that investment has not happened. We have done, the government has found money to do certain things. But the most of the transformers, most of the equipment that ECG have are, are old. So the low voltage and the high voltage that you are describing, which is causing havoc to people's machinery, needs to be changed. That needs to be solved. One of the things that my committee is looking at is that we make sure that Ghanaians have what you call reliable, stable, and affordable power. What you are describing is not what we are supposed to give Ghanaians. So I agree with you. But is it enough to give a timetable on that? The fact that there's going to be high voltage or low voltage, can I give you a timetable on low voltage and high voltage? That is the problem. You see, well, there are two instances. I think that whenever there is a problem, ECG should communicate effectively to Ghanaians. That is not happening. In some instances, yes, they come up with flyers to tell people the areas that are going to go off. But they work with what you call electrical and mechanical gadgets. If something happens immediately, what next? The effective communication of these um, information and what is happening is what we should all push for. But this, this thing of obsession with timetable, what does that solve? It doesn't solve anything. That's the point I'm making. I see. As the business community has said, I wish, uh, I wish we could speak to some members of the business community. I believe over time we would do that. But it would have been interesting because in recent times we've heard some of them respond and say that our businesses are literally crumbling. You would have people, I mean, hairdressers among others say, in fact, I come to work, the light is off, so I can't do anything for hours. And then I decide to go home, only to go home and be met with dooms off at home as well, because <laughs> I'm running from the frying pan and I ended up uh, straight in the fire. And that is what members of the business community from those operating in some kiosk somewhere to that person operating on huge levels, pr production chain, is saying, look, and now we have to fall on, you know, we're either forced to go solar or we have to get generators and all of that. I, I don't know what you think, but what then do you make of the PURC uh, coming through to give this ultimatum of seven days uh, to the ECG? The ECG has to come through, and the, the story, by the way, is in, in fine print on myjoyonline.com. You have seven days to provide detailed incident report on power outages, PURC to ECG. You can check it out there. What do you make of this directive? Well, look, if you read the entire document, there has been a certain level of agitation between PURC and ECG. PURC feels that ECG is not doing the right thing. And as a regulator, they have every right to interrogate it further. The value chain players have been complaining that they have not been paid and they are not being paid. They made that complaint. PURC feels that, look, the cash waterfall mechanism, which is the process put in place to make sure that everybody gets something small so that there is liquidity in the system. VRA, Rico, and other companies are saying that, look, we are not being paid. So there was an audit of um, ECG that was carried out by um, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And PLC feels that they did ECG did not comply. Mm. 
And I think the report is out there. There have been various levels of meetings on this report. ECG has an explanation to give, and they've always come to that meeting and given their explanation. I, I listened to Samuel Dubik Mahama explain on that in, in, on, in light of the recent report by the PRC. I listened to the MD of the ECG react to that. Yes. I was convinced on some points and not so convinced on other points. Because in that very conversation, exactly. in fact, Mr. Is it Ametogbo, or Ametogbo, representing the IPPs, came and spoke, and he, he rebuffed some of the assertions of Samuel Dubik Mahama. So it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, on, exactly. On that so that is, why, that is why PRC have come back to now issue this directive to say, look, Provide us with these things. We need to get clarity and basically move forward on this issue. So they've mm. given them timelines to provide them with the documentation that they need to be able to get clarity. Look, I, I honestly don't think that if you listen, like you said, when you listen to Honorable, uh, uh, what do you call it, the MD, Mohamed Dubek, he has explanation, right? And most of them, like you said, it is convincing what he did, why he did what he did. But look, we need to be fair to everybody. PULC will listen to the players, will get the information they need. And what Ghanaians want is that our lights should stay on. We should have reliable and stable power. I'm worried. Everybody's worried. It's not something that everybody thinks that everybody goes to sleep and they don't care. Our president stood in the floor of parliament and said that, look, doom so is a thing of the past, right? Which means that we are no longer going to shed load. Now, what is happening today, in some instances, is not like it's, syst it's systematic. It's not. It's just a matter of some maintenances that are happening. But you now have our friends on, in the NDC on the other side who are doing everything possible to push that to the front burner and say that, look, when the president says something, it's a lie. Ben, you will be amazed to see the length of which people are going to make sure that there's power disruption. Have you seen the images in front of the Daily Guide this morning? What images? There are people going around in rural areas to basically make sure that they take down the powers of ECG and Greco so that there is power outages in some communities. It will amaze you. What will amaze me is the fact that you find that amazing because I have known, whether it's street lights or anything of the sort, I know that there are people who steal cables, who use them for various purposes. So to put a political slant to it, I don't know about that. What I do know is that people take advantage in communities that are pretty quiet with people not very alert and steal some of this and use it for their own personal. Some of them melt them and all of that, unless you are not aware of that. Well, Ben, uh, boats and knots, somebody will go and take boats and knots from a high tension cable. For what? What are they going to do the boats and knots? When you go to Kokumpi and Abusioka, you find the boats and knots on the floor. So well, somebody will go because they want to steal boats and knots. They will go and undo a high-tension cable, a high-tension pole. I don't think that, that that's what we are talking about here, but please. I mean, I can understand people digging cables on the floor and stealing the copper, but what I'm talking about is when people go and go and screw, unscrew the boats and knots on the, on, on the towers of these high-tension towers. What other motive would that be? If not, just to create that thing that, oh, power, the light is not stable. In any so, case, Ghanians in, in, are, sorry? Go, go ahead, go ahead. Ghanians are, 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 are discerning. I'm not Ooh. saying that it's the NDC that did it. That's not what I'm but saying. But you've basically alleged that. that. You've insinuated people, that. Well, I, I, I didn't say that. I mean, you said it, I didn't. I'm saying that I some people, it. okay? <laughs> oh, no, the first part I said was that the NDC wants to push the light conversation to the forefront. Right. And I went on to say that some people around the country are, are going around basically creating this havoc so that lights will, be, will go off, so that the conversation of light interruption will come to the forefront. I'm not alleging. And if I came across as alleging that, I'm sorry, I take it back. But I'm no way alleging that it's NDC that did that. Mm. Uh, in having this conversation, we can also talk about debts owed and all of that. You remember famously or infamously, whichever way you choose to look at it, Recently, uh, the same parliament where Mr. President stood and said they had dealt with Doomso, that same parliament went off recently in proceedings. And when Samuel Dubik Mahama was asked, he said, well, parliament is working. ECG is also working. Um, I guess we are showing working here. But looking at where we have, we have got to, you say we've not got to the point where we need a timetable. Power supply is still erratic. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission has given the Electricity Company of Ghana seven days to provide a detailed incident report on power outages for the period January 1, 2024 to 
date. Now, according to the commission, the ECG is also to state, and this is my next point, the volume of load curtailed, because you've been talking about how many, what's the peak and all of that. The volume of load curtailed for each power outage incident, energy not served, and the number of customers affected. I believe the devil is right here in this paragraph. What are your expectations as far as that is concerned? Well, well um, we will see what ECG comes up with with the volume curtail. Like I said, for one, nobody is denying the fact that in because in this maintenance period that we have, um, some management of load has not been done. So I don't think that everybody's going to say, ah, we told you, you guys were basically managing load and you said you weren't. We've admitted everybody has come to say that, look, it is because of this and this and this, that is why those load management happen. So the, the amount of load management that has basically happened, um, privately, some of us are privy to it. Uh, maybe in the media, if it is made available to the media, then you guys will probably also get uh, become privy to what has been shared. But there is a very important message that I want every Ghanaian to understand this morning. When we have instances like this, and some people will come and say, oh, government doesn't have money. Um, if government had money, they will buy uh, fuel so that the light won't go off. We are looking at prudent management of this economy. And there is not by any illusion that we are in IMF. Nobody is saying that this government is one of the richest governments in the world. We know we don't have money. Everybody admit that as a country, we are in IMF. How do you now safeguard the finances of the country and not overburden the Ghanaian populace? If you have a situation like this, and you decide that you will buy expensive fuel like diesel and LCO to keep the lights on for Ghanaians, bear in mind, I have always said that when it comes to power, if you don't pay by tariff, you pay by taxes. So if government takes money to go and buy LCO, which is expensive fuel, go buy diesel, which is expensive fuel, and get the lights of T3 and Gensa to run these liquid fuels and keep the lights on, in the next PLC review, government will have to submit these expenses to PLC and they will have to factor it into electricity tariffs so we pay for it. Does Ghanaians want to have increases in electricity tariffs? No. Recently, by God's grace, we had some 6% reduction for um, people who are high-end consumers over 300 kilowatt bank. What people should understand is that if the government feels that in the next two to three weeks, this problem can be resolved, why go and rush to buy these LCOs and the um, diesel to overburden the Ghanaian? So we all day in it together so that we can basically go through this short period of disruption. I think the communication is very important. What I expect to find in that resolution that PULC is trying to do is to call BRICO also to the table. Because if you listen to ECG, the problem is not only with ECG. BRICO also has some questions to answer. So I think some of us will also be writing to um, PULC and say, look, if you are trying to do the regulation that you are trying to do, also bring BRICO to the table because they also have some questions to answer. How long was Doomso under the NDC? Oh, wow. From, I think the whole thing started massively from 2013. Doomsa lasted three years, thereabouts. More, more, more or less, yes. Three years. Um, it's been about two years of this intermittent power outages, sometimes for long periods of time in the Ashanti region, in Greater Accra. I have had my fair share. Ben, where, ben, oh, no, 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 hold, 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 hold. I let, you make, your point. I let you make your point. Ben, I let you make your point. Let me let me make my point. Where are you getting let, let me let me make from. my point on this. I, I intentionally posed that question. It's been two years of this, and somehow you refer to it as this short period within which uh, we are facing power outages. I, I, I just wanted to focus on your wording, the semantics. It lasted ben, three years I, under I, the I, Oswald that, administration, that, two that, years of this. Way you are doing there. It's like you're doing some cross-examination in court. What do you uh, Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it is what you do here. When you come on, it's going to be hard. That's just the way it is. But anyway. <laughs> Before you go, before you go, <laughs> I like the way you're laughing. Before you go, uh, part of the directives of the PURC, it says, in respect of operational matters, detailed incident reports of power outages. Then it talks about uh, the ECG to, in respect of outages attributed by ECG to the 630 overloaded transformers during peak hours to give, you know, GPS locations, ratings, and current loadings. It also talks about the time frame for compliance. Uh, by March 25th, the mode of compliance, 
and the effect of non-compliance. Let me just read that and get your response. It says, non-compliance with this order shall be enforced by the commission under section 38 of Act 538 and Regulation 45.1 of the Public Utilities Regulatory Com Commission, that is Consumer Service Regulations 2020 LI 2413, which provide, and it goes on with offenses and penalties, sanctions against public utility, among others. In other words, it's basically telling the ECG, if you fail to comply, we're going to have to crack the whip. Your take as we yes. end. Uh, ben. Uh, you see, this two years thing that you mentioned, you see, let me tell you something. It, it are, even goes beyond that. Of our own, <laughs> let, let me say this. MPP government, and I do let government is a victim of its own success. For a big chunk of the last, from 2017 till when you call the two years, which I don't think there's two years, but there has been a very big improvement in the quality and standard of power supply to the nation. Right. So when we have entered a period where it is a bit unstable, compared to the high standard that the Narado led government have set, then yes, people will complain, which everybody will chest it and say, look, let's try to even achieve better quality for Ghanaians. So I don't think it's two years, but if Ghanaians feel that the standard that was set from 2017 has lowered, yes, then everybody is going to crack the whip to make sure that that standard is upheld and improved upon. Now, in terms of PULC and the... Yes, before you get to the there, PULC, 20 it, seconds on this. Um, how exactly has this administration set those standards, especially when we've had this conversation before? Not even one megawatt of electricity has been added. How has it set those high standards you speak of? It, it, it's, not, it's not true. And Ben, the question no, I asked you is that when they no, no, signing let me, the let agreements me, you ask that versus question. Let, me answer, let me answer. When you say that not one megawatt has been added, is it that it was added to the grid or, M or PPA signed? We, what are you referring added to? Added to the grid. Okay, so that's not true. I can run you through all the power that has been added to the grid since 2017. If you have time, I'll run you through that. We've so, added so, over so, 1,500 megawatts to the grid since 2017. So the agreements have been signed. Let me, and let, they me, are... let, me, let, me, let me quickly run you through that. No, okay, go ahead. Two, go ahead. Assembly phase two, mm -hmm. same power. Mm -hmm. um, Assembly phase two, same power. AXA. You mm -hmm. know, AXA came online after um, the AXA came online after 2017. So Asogli phase two, right. AXA, Sempower, Amandi, okay, those are the big, um, and then bear in mind, car power was moved from Tema to Takrade to double the capacity. Mm. So that was also an addition on the grid was after Was that an addition or a shuffling around of, of No, of adi an addition capacity. because it was 250, it was 250, it was 250 when it was in, um, it was 250 when it was in Tema, and I think 235 was added to run on eight on gas when it went to Takradi. So it's never true that nothing has been added to the grid from 2017. Again, so, U Power has added 50 megawatts of, of, of solar. Um, VRE has added 35 megawatts of solar. So mm. there has been a lot of addition to the grid post-2017. Mm. So, so these additions, where are they reflecting? Oh, they are in the, the, the what do you call it? If you go into the Outlook, you see the Energy Commission Outlook, you will see all those powers that have been. You see, I have said that, granted, those PPAs were signed in the, His Excellency John Mohammed's time. But when they were added to the grid, they were added to the grid post-2017. That's why I asked you, what, and, the, what and, are you and, referring to? And that to? is exactly PPA the point I was making. Added to the grid. That is the point I was making, that... These were, and, and the last time you spoke about a continuum, which I agree, but this administration has not signed any of those that has been added on. Okay, they are so all that's from the I previous administration. You, so, so, Ben, if you want to know what we've signed, then that's a different conversation. So that's why I asked you, what are you, what do you want to hear? Added to the grid or signed PPAs? You but, but, said added but, to the but, grid. But you, I'm you what you, has been added. Now you want to know what, what has been signed? I do know of what has you, been signed. Should I, should and I tell it's you not what been added been signed. on, so it's... I think we can we can wrap ex ex on that. Ex exactly. So that conversation is muted. In, in a minute. In a minute. Not added on. In a minute. So the penalties and and the PURC. You you were about to go to that in in less than a minute. Yes. Can... Um. The penalties basically for me, I think that uh, we should and uh, we should close PURC to bite. The reason that people feel like look they can flout some of these regulators because it's a, it's, it's it's a penalty in fine. So they will find them and they can pay the fine and move on. Um, I think we should basically have a bit more. One of the conversations that are coming up that is a bit 
interesting, and my committee is looking at it, is that is it possible for a government-run regulatory to basically, um, sorry, or a regulatory, let's call it a regulatory agency to basically regulate government-run institutions? Is it, is it really effective? Okay, so we should level to try and create some level of independency to now bring in the private participation players in the value chain so that the regulator will be able to regulate better or okay. give more um, powers to the regulator, though it can now bite better on these government-run agencies as well. Gojo, um, we are virtual, but fist bump to you. Michael, bump to you. Boza. Um, uh -huh. Thank you for joining uh, the conversation. Uh, we, we, we should, Ben, I think we should plan. Me and you, we can do once a month in studio, and I'll be educating you, because there's a lot of education that needs to go on between me and you to basically make sure that the right. MPP and an adult led government with Dr. Baumia coming in, we are the best for the nation. Ayo, I hear you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Kojo and Safwa uh, Poku, he is an energy analyst, and he's joined us for uh, this all-important conversation on power and the directives of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission as far as the ECG uh, is uh, concerned. Uh, there'll still be more time to talk about this. But up next, even before uh, we head to uh, Tamale and catch glimpses of that town hall, Ghana uh, Connect, we're going to be serving you something based on health, your health. It's uh, an interaction with Endpoint Homeopathic uh, Clinic, Sweetie Abochi. Uh, my colleague was on that beat. We'll serve you that up next on the AM Show. This is still the AM Show right here on Joy News, your home of independent, fearless, and credible journalism. And today we are hosting another doctor from Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. The last time we hosted Dr. Kwating, and he enlightened us about what really is homeopathy. Today we want to pivot into stroke. And my guest is Dr. Edu Boateng. He's also a homeopathic practitioner at Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. He's going to help us really understand what it means when we say someone has got a stroke, um, get into some misconceptions about stroke, especially as it relates with young people, and the way forward, how we can keep safe. Dr. Dubating, it's a pleasure to have you Thank join you. the conversation on this Thank important you. matter. Thank you. And um, how are you doing at Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, we including Dr. Kwate? Yeah, you need yeah, we're doing very well. <laughs> I'm sure he's watching you right yeah, now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Let's just get into the conversation straight away. We've heard someone got stroke, somebody died and it was stroke. When, some, when we talk about stroke, what really does it mean when a person has suffered a stroke? Thank you very much. Uh, this topic, I think uh, we should be able to listen to it with rapid attention mm -hmm. because uh, I, with throughout my experience in this field, I've seen that a lot of people are now disabled because of stroke attack. A lot of people are dying because of stroke. But uh, what, what, was, what I would say is that stroke occurs when blood is unable to get into the brain, mm -hmm. when there's a disruption that uh, makes it difficult for enough blood to enter into somebody's brain. What happens is that uh, human beings as we are, every part of our body needs blood, mm. enough blood. And in we, every part of the body also needs oxygen. Okay. And with blood, your, the water that you take, the food that you eat, the nutrient, the nutritional part of every food that you eat mm. enters into the blood. Okay. So at a point in time when you're not getting enough blood into your brain, what is going to happen is that you are starving the brain cells of these food nutrients. And then you are also starving these brain cells out of, uh, from this oxygen. So when there's, uh, when there's a disruption, whether the, the arteries is not permitting enough blood into the brain, or when there's a break, or when there's a, uh, uh, when part of, uh, any of the arteries burst into your brain, right. blood oozes into the brain. And that okay. is also another form of uh, stroke. Okay. So they are in this case, there are two forms of stroke. There is one what we call ischemic attack mm -hmm. or ischemic stroke. That happens when, I mean, you are getting enough blood. You are, you are getting blood, but the blood that you are getting into the brain is not enough. 
or does not have enough oxygen? Do not have enough oxygen. Okay. And because of that, maybe mm, some people may have uh, maybe blood clots mm. in, the, in the arteries. Okay. And once there's blood clots in the arteries, blood will struggle to pass through the arteries into the brain. And in so doing, that can also result in stroke. And then there's another type of stroke, what we call hemorrhagic type of stroke. In that case, what happens is that the artery that supplies blood into the brain can end up rupturing, or it can, what we call rupture, or it can, there can be a break in it. Okay. That, will, that will cause blood to be oozing into your brain. When that also happens, we call, we, we, it's also another means for you to, for one to be able to get stroke. From my understanding of what an artery is, they are small yeah. um, tubes that carry blood and other nutrients or whatever to the important parts of our body. What could possibly cause an artery <coughs> to erupt or what could cause that kind of blockage in the mind or any part of the body that would impede the great circulation of blood in the body? Yes, sir. Uh, usually. Uh, cholesterol can even result in that. Mm. When they are, there's too much cholesterol, that's the bad cholesterol. When you have so much of that, that can stampede okay. or that can cause the blockage in your arteries. Or sometimes too, when there's too much pressure, when there's too much pressure, you see, one of the main causes of uh, stroke is pressure, hypertension. Mm -hmm the main causes of it. I, I would say with my, uh, with a number of people that comes to endpoint to a particular clinic, I would say that about 80 or 70 percent out of that get stroke because of uncontrolled pressure. Whenever one is having pressure, we should understand that that means the amount of pressure, that's the meaning of pressure, the hypertension. Hypertension, yeah. So high blood pressure. High blood pressure. Right. That's the pressure pushing your blood through your vessels. If it's so much, that can also cause the the, the artery to even break or there could, there could be a rupture of the... Of so mm -hmm. when blood is pushed at an unusual, abnormal speed... Speed, yes. That's what we call high, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, yes. And that can also that cause... Can cause yes, stroke. that can cause... To, and indeed, from the people that comes, I realized that about 70-80% get this problem. Mm. Most of them, by the time you finish with your medical history, you realize that most of them, their stroke yeah. was caused by the hypertension. Right. Because the the, it's just like you having a gutter. And then when water is supposed to flow to your gutter, mm. to, your, uh, to your house. Mm. And then when you see that when there's flood, when there's flood and the water, the pressure in, the w in that water, that flows through your gutter is so much. What happens is that sometimes it ends up breaking the gutter, the walls of the gutter. And then when it breaks that way, you see that the water will be channeled to any part. You, it will not be channeled through the gutter again. Then it may end up end, ending in people's wounds. Okay. In the same way, when the pressure that, pushes you, that is pushing your blood through your vessels is so much high, the pressure in it is so much high, mm. sometimes you may end up even breaking the, the, the artery. And that can result in stroke. Apart from that, a, a, a medical condition called diabetes. Okay. It's also causing so much, especially those with sust uh, high sugar level. Mm. When the sugar level is so much high, the end, uh, the, because the sugar level, meaning that the glucose level is so much high, mm. it will end up affecting the artery. It starts weakening the, the walls of the arteries, and that can also result in what we call uh, stroke. Okay. Apart from that, what is actually happening these days, you realize that the youth are, are actually getting stroke. Yes. And it's because of the lifestyle. I'm saying this because, you know, people, when you talk about other risk factors such as alcoholism and so on and so forth, there was a patient that asked me some years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, people used to drink alcohol and all that. What has changed? And that time, it was difficult for you to get somebody getting stroke. Before you get somebody getting stroke, the person might have been in the, the yeah. uh, 70s, 80s, and so on and so forth. And today, 30s, 40s, 50s. What is happening? We are not taking alcohol, and are we not taking alcohol? The alcohol content that we are taking now is more than what they were taking. Now, just to a challenge, if somebody comes to your home and you offer the person a bottle of water and then a bottle of <laughs> alcohol, you realize that as the person is taking the water, a bottle of water, they are sipping the water. People are actually People actually sip water. So we are not drinking enough water. We are water. not drinking enough water. Okay. So now it is, it, it is not 
it is not it is it is so easy for people to come to you when once you pick a blood sample you realize you've not even conducted any test on them you realize that there, there is something wrong with the with the blood because people are consuming too much alcohol people are consuming too much uh, recreational medications the the weed and everything now you can ask so many of these ladies around or so many of these gentlemen around that do they take weed they'll tell you no no i don't take it but they are taking the weed in so many forms in a, in a, in a toffee form in a so many t you know some now they've even gotten some name for it edibles they'll tell you yeah. edibles oh if i take edibles the right yes yeah now people are growing too much balloons there are people blowing to you know the balloon that i'm talking about it's not the normal balloon the that gas. yeah the natural yeah. gas yeah 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 those gas are not good for the system right the, the gas that we need for for the system to work well mm. is the oxygen okay any so other gas we introduce into the system if it's too much can result in all this is so now i would say that lifestyle it is lifestyle is actually causing about 60 or 70 percent of what it's causing yes, yes. stroke. So aside these lifestyle or behavioral um, causes of stroke or behavioral causes of mm. hypertension, high cholesterol, which also leads to stroke, are there cases where it's just a purely medical situation? Someone has impeccable health record mm. but ends up getting stroke. Yeah, there are times like that. What accounts for such rare situations? Yes, uh, there are times that somebody may could ha be having even a cardiovascular condition, mm. a heart-related condition. The heart is unable to pump enough blood, and mm. for that matter, the person, and this might have happened for a very long time, the person could end up, and there are times that people who are aged, you know, people right. who are in their 80s, 90s, are getting stroke, because naturally, when once you are aging, the arteries, weakens okay. naturally human beings that's how it is once you are and that is how you know it is expected that when somebody is 70 80 90 and the person ends up getting stroke it's not so much uh, of a problem because at that at that age you can uh, it's not surprising but we are talking about a situation where we find people like myself and yourself getting stroke you understand you realize that most of them is because of the lifestyle. But the aged getting it, obviously, once they are aging, the arteries is also weakening. And All for right. that matter, it can it can end up breaking. Once there's a pressure, once there's a even the pressure going too low can also result in that. Once there's a sugar, uh, you know, which is yeah. not controlled, yeah. that can also result in it. So medical conditions can result in it, mm -hmm. and then lifestyle also can also result in. What stroke. we've done, what you've done so far, is debunked some myths associated with stroke. For instance, the issue about only young, uh, only adults that um, suffer strokes because we see young people also getting it. And you say it's lifestyle choices. Correct. It's behavioral. Correct. It's the things we consume. You also talked about um, the appearance of stroke only in people who don't take care of their bodies. But we know that there are rare conditions where yes, medical issues cause stroke. Correct. So then let's move to, is it true that stroke and heart attack as one and the same issue? Or are there any differences between them? And then we can talk about how to deal with yes. um, the situation. Yes, uh, when, when you have a, a heart-related condition mm. and, if, and you, don't, you, know, you, you don't visit your practitioner, if you leave it for a very long time, what is going to happen is that the heart is the one that has to pump blood to all parts of the body. Okay. So if you have a heart condition and care is not taken, if medications are not taken, it cannot only result in stroke. It can result in so many things. So a heart attack will rather result in a stroke. That's right, yes. Okay. Because you see, when the heart is attacked, what is going to happen is that the heart is unable to do its primary function, which is pumping blood, because that's, that's the work of the heart. The heart is just like a, 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 a you know, the, it's a central part of the uh, circulatory system. Yeah. Its work is to be able to pump blood to all the parts of the body. Okay. Now the heart is attacked. When the heart is at, a, when somebody's heart gets attacked, yeah. the muscles making even the up, up the heart mm -hmm. can end up even damaging. So a heart attack is simply failure of the heart to pump blood to, to pump blood. all parts yeah. of the body. And once the once it's not pumping blood to the to the brain, what happens is that it you can get stroke. stroke. Okay. When if it doesn't pump blood to the kidneys, 
you can have kidney failure. Okay. Without, so, I mean, the heart attack alone can cause so many okay. complications. So, a heart attack and a stroke are not the same thing. They're not the same thing. A heart attack can, can result, result in excellent. Stroke. excellent. Great. Thank you for mm. uh, debunking these two mm. myths. Now, let's go on to how do we deal with stroke? How do you even identify that someone is having a stroke? Because we know that when you catch it early, you go to the hospital early, you just might be able to save that That's life. Right. So how can you tell that someone is having a stroke? Yes, the first thing that uh, will show in somebody getting a stroke is that usually uh, paralysis can take place. Mm. Usually people with stroke, it can affect either the, the right hand side or the left hand side of the body. So there could be paralysis. Somebody, you know, if so typical if you are home and you realize that somebody, you suspect somebody has gotten a stroke, mm. you can tell the person to raise up the hand. Mommy, can you raise your right hand? Let your mom try to raise the right. Mm. If the person if the stroke has affected the right, you see that as she's raising it, it becomes so heavy. Okay. The arm is so heavy, the, the arm is so numbed that your own arm, you find it difficult. You f it feels like you are carrying about 50 kilogram of, let's say, cement or whatever. <laughs> okay. So you have to, you realize that the person will not be able to raise the arm freely. So you have to support it with another arm. Okay. That will tell you that if it's the left hand side too, it's the same thing. Okay. You cannot, so you see that all the arm, will, he will, the person will try, they will make the attempt of raising the arms, but one part of the arm could be raised. The other one could not be raised. That would tell you that the person, mm, so paralysis. Paralysis, it okay. can. It. And then sometimes the speech. Okay. You know how I'm speaking. I know how sweet your voice is. <laughs> yeah. And you all of a sudden, may God forbid, if we start speaking, mm. and then your voice is not coming. Partially, you are losing your voice. Or some people can even lose their voice completely. Just the voice the or the, the speech. The flow, okay. yeah, the yes. Okay. So the, the flow may not be there. Somebody may even lose the voice at all. Somebody may also be able to talk, but the... Uh, may lack the difficulty. The person will struggle to speak. Okay. Or sometimes some, some people will start stammering. You know that oh, this person speaks very well. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you are, the person is not able to organize the thoughts. Difficulty in organizing thoughts. Mm -hmm. You understand? All these things, you know, could, or sometimes the voice could even go uh, completely. All right. So that's another, that's another sign of uh, somebody who has gotten a stroke. And then um, there are, Sometimes you, the movement, sometimes you can even ask the person to also move, or sometimes you can even ask the person to smile. Usually it can af end up affecting part of the, of the, of the face. Okay. So there can be a uh, facial paralysis as well, where part of the, the, the face droop. You know, you, as if this part, mm. you realize that that part. Has so what do you do when you've seen all these? When you've seen one sign, what do you do? Immediately, yeah, if, if I, like you, the example That's you right. gave, if we are together and then some, I, I spot one of these symptoms you're talking about, what do I do? You immediately have to go to the, the hospital. I, I, yes, if okay. you know now that we have a lot of ambulances and all that, mm. possibly you call an ambulance service because the more the person you keep the person at home, the brain cells could end up getting damaged. Okay. So the more because it could be the pressure that resulted in the in the stroke. Okay. And now what is happening is that the pressure is still high. The pressure that caused stroke mm. had not gone down. Okay. So what is going to happen is that that pressure could be destroying a lot of things. Maybe it ended up just uh, damaging one artery. Now the person is still at home. Nothing is done to it. Yeah. It will end up affecting so others as well. So the more you delay in seeking it causes, medical attention, it causes a lot. It causes fatal yeah. results. Yeah. We know that these are some of the things that you treat at Endpoint Hepatic mm. Clinic. When we talk about stroke, how do you use homeopathy to not just treat the occurrence as and when, but ensure that it doesn't occur again? Yo, thank you very much. Mm. What happens is that uh, when somebody has stroke, with Endpoint, the moment the person comes, we check the vitals. Pressure, first thing. You need to find out the pressure. Mm. You check the sugar level. You do the normal checks as yeah. orthodox, orthodox do. Mm. And then you have to do scanning. We have a scanning machine that can scan the nervous system. Okay. That is the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves. Mm. Because you see, one thing ha that happens is that once people get stroke, 
usually the nerves also get affected. Yeah. Because the para once paralysis takes place, that is where, and you realize that most people that come to endpoint, if you ask them, because if the, the signs that I, I, I was giving you, it happens when the person has already got in the stroke. When you have already got in the stroke, that is where you have problem with your speech, okay. you have problem with your movement, the balancing and all that. But there are some symptoms that start way earlier before the stroke actually strikes you down. Which you can only tell or you can no, the patient using your machine. Yeah, the patient can also see that. Okay. Because if it's a pressure that is bringing it, you realize that sometimes you get palpitation of the heart. Right. The heart could be beating uh, for you to, because the heart always beats, but you don't feel it. As I'm yes, you, th there could be dizziness, there could be bodily pain, there could be sudden fright, there could be s uh, movement in the body, there could be insomnia, sleeplessness. And sometimes, uh, the, the nerves will start also damaging. Once the nerves start working. damaging, burning sensation, yeah. movement in the body, tingling sensation, nervous imbalances and all that. So when somebody comes to endpoint mm -hmm. to clinic, we do a, a scanning for the whole nervous system to know where the, the, the stroke actually, what type of stroke are you having, right. the effect of the stroke and everything. Then we can give medication and then physiotherapy okay. can also you the, the person is also asked to go through physiotherapy at okay. the clinic in one minute please tell in 30 seconds please tell us about the free screening you're doing and then how to contact you you are here so okay. i'd like you to do it thank you yeah. very much uh, endpoint is undertaking free scanning on prostate gland prostate and then free scanning on fertility female fertility that is there to check your reproductive organs the scanning is free but the lab is 300 ghana cities you can contact me on 0244 or the clinic yeah. on 0244 867068. 0244 867068. Thank you so much, Dr. Edubuate, who is a homeopathic practitioner Practitioner's at Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. And you know, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic are the sponsors of our news review segment. So. Hopefully, you get another opportunity to get into some of these health issues. Mm. Thank you so You'll much. Be glad. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you for watching. It's good to stay strong together. It's good to share nutritious meals cooked with Frital, a vitamin A fortified oil. Frital, you deserve a life of goodness. This advert is FDA. Daddy? Daddy, oh, this tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see F-I-N-T-E-S Vintage. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil That's not true. But why? Whoa! Hey. <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty. Seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Across Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with one purpose, to create and share opportunities to grow.
across our continent, across the world, we are creating a better way to a better future. A pan-African future, together. EcoBank, a better way, a better Africa. Welcome back on the AM show, and this is how we actually cap off uh, activities on uh, the AM show. Up next, we'll be serving you Joy News Desk with Sweetie Abochi. But still, before we wrap on the show, we have AM Business, courtesy of Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Enjoy as we get ready for Joy News Desk. <music> So it's been 67 years since Ghana gained its independence. Um, that was somewhere in 1957. And we understand some markets you know, played a critical role in ensuring Ghana gained its independence that time. Right behind me, you can see a number of hats here. And I understand there's a story behind that. I have Gladys um, Adenira, who is a sculptor. Um, she'll be telling us what these hats means. Gladys, you were running me through some stories what exactly is it um the independence of ghana is um not complete without the stories of the market women who helped Nkrumah attain independence the hat represents uh, market women um for whom i'm um, having these exhibitions the independence story of ghana over the years has missed the role that market women played in Ghana's attaining independence. The market women who helped Kwame Nkrumah attain independence with the resources that they had. So this is what the exhibition is about, more an educational exercise. Mm -hmm. Right, so where are these hats coming from? Um, the hats are coming from um, a number of markets, Agbogloshi Market, um, Makola Market, and then under bridge, that is around Graphic Road, where you have the tomato market. They are coming from there. And the individual hats used to belong, that some of them used to belong to market women. And the hat becomes an appropriated object that I'm using in the installation. And it's conceptual art. So the concept of the hat, what does it do? How does it relate to the market woman? One hat is a story of the lifetime of a woman. She wears the hat, she goes out to sell, comes back, and so the hat is part of her story and part of her. So don't see it as a hat, but see it as a story of one woman. Mm -hmm. right, you, you were telling me about some of the comments um, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah made in 1957 with respect to independence about these markets. Mm -hmm. What exactly are they? Um, Kwame Nkrumah said that in the struggle for independence, one market woman is worth more to me than 10 Achimota school graduates. And Kwame Nkrumah was an Achimota school graduate himself. So for him to make such a statement is profound in how, he, how important it was for him, how significant the women's help to him was. What were some of the role these women were playing when Kwame Nkrumah came and all that? What exactly were they doing to support Ghana's independence? The main thing was the financial support. And then it is said that they could rally a crowd 
quickly. And suddenly there's a crowd here and there's a rally going on. They cooked for those who attended the rallies. Um, they sang songs that was praising Nkrumah and what he was going to do. And these things will catch on in the community. So people start singing the songs. They had um, textiles, fabrics made with Nkrumah's head in it. And even I realized from um, my research that Pedroasi Lodge was built by the market women for Nkrumah. And he handed it over to the state. So the women had done a lot for him. And he was grateful for what they had done, even by this statement. Mm -hmm. How many hats have you collected so far from these women? Um, I have um, 26. And 26 because no one wants to give up her hat. Sometimes you want to give them a new one and get what they have used because that is what carries the story. And um, so over a couple of months, this is what we've been able to collect. And we are still collecting. Just from the general market women, regardless of what you sell? No, regardless of what we sell, just general market women. We tell them what we are doing with it, and those who are into it, give it to us. Other people, too, I guess, a bit superstitious, not sure of what you are going to do with their hearts. Mm -hmm. I could also see some crates there. We would go there and know what exactly those crates are also meant for. We're here um, at the National Theatre, and right behind me, you could see some crates. And I understand these are also meant for these market women who supported Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, Grace, tell me, how many do you have so far? Um, we have um, 31 boxes, and um, each one is telling its own story. You notice that they have names on them, some nicknames, some quotations from the Bible. and these crates have also traveled the journeys with the women. They've sat in the market with the women and are part of the story the women are telling. So this is also part of the installation representing the market women. Yeah. Did, they, did they share with you some of the meanings that do we have in the Bible verse and all that? Can you run me through some of them? Um, some of them are blessing girl, um, Isaiah chapter 54, 5, one God, Jesus, uh, they tend to be religious, most of the sayings, and some have just numbers, one, four, three, and so on. And I understand if there's one, four, three, or Well, right before we go, um, this is the Ghana Connect uh, rendition of our town hall in Tamale. And guess who's on the spot now? Evans Mensa is in uh, Tamale. I'm handing over to him. You can expect some more conversations coming from there. Evans Mensa, if you can hear me, uh, over to you in uh, Tamale. Okay, I'll only take a shot of us. Somebody should I'm sorry, do that. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, and thank you very much, Benjamin. Yes, over to me, really so, because we are live from Tamale, and uh, we're going to be bringing you the Ghana Connect Town Hall today uh, here in, in, in Tamale. And you can see behind me the Bagabaga Training College right behind me. If you are in Tamale, you know it popularly as Batko. Uh, when I wrote the full name, people were calling me to ask me, what is Bagabaga Training College? I said, Batko, say, oh, yeah, I'm going to be there. That's where we're going to have this uh, later today. And we're in essence here because we set out this year to make these elections about people. And we found a partner that shared the same principle. When we decided to, to, to draw up a plan for the election 2024, we said, how can we define a project that really incorporates people's voices, but also in essence gets their views head. And so we, we crafted a theme that says creating an informed electorate. And we found a partner in Star Ghana that shares that view uh, to its fullest. And I'm with Ernestina Teta, Dr. Ernestina Teta, who is a projects manager at Star Ghana. And I need to ask you first off, why this town hall? 
Thank you, Evans. As you mentioned, um, Star Ghana is very passionate about inclusive, fair, transparent elections. Over the years, we have done this. But this year, we decided that we wanted to influence the manifestos of the political parties. And we didn't just want to stay in Accra and do desk research and talk to experts. We wanted to come down to talk to the people to which this matters. So we have decided to do this town hall to explore issues of importance to the citizens that they think would, they would be happy to see it manifest or to see it incorporated in the manifestos of the political parties. And that is where we are doing this town hall. So it's the third in the series. We've been to Cape Coast, we've been to Ho, and it's not just that. So Cape Coast was the hub for four regions. Ho was the hub for another four. This is the hub for Northeast, Savannah, um, and then the Northern region. And we are here to explore issues around education, health, and social protection. So that's the core. Yeah, and, 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 and it's absolutely important that we are focusing on those three areas. Okay. Because education, health, and social protection is really at the heart of what many people in this country, the vast majority of those who will vote, they will tell you invariably that these are the three issues of, of most importance to them, and that's why you've isolated these for, for this year. Yes, yeah, yeah that's, right. that's right. Yeah, you know, as part of our work, Star Ghana has a program area that we call Rights to Services, and these are the issues that we focus on, that's what we work in, and we decided that, you know what, instead of spreading ourselves thin to look at all the issues that we handle as Star Ghana, why don't we hone into this, which is at the core and the heart of people, education, health, making sure that they, they go to bed at night knowing that they are protected, they have social protection. These are the core. When we go around the country, we realize that it's the basic of ev what everybody needs to be able to participate in an election. You know, they need to have their basic needs sorted or addressed or taken care of. And that's why we chose these topics. Once these views are gathered, what happens to it? Right. So actually, I should have talked about what we did earlier. So what we did was to do a commission research desk reviews on these areas and as part of that we reviewed the 2020 manifesto of the two major political parties to see the gaps what they promised what they have delivered so we have brought the results to the people to discuss further after this we are going to culminate the results from the desk review and the, the town halls into a policy brief with which we'll engage the um, various manifesto drafting committees of the parties mm -hmm. in the hope that they would hear they would listen and then incorporate some of the key issues we are raising into their manifestos yeah. uh, and, and Doc, thank you very much. And she's going to stay with us throughout this period as we do this. And it's important what she says. So this, the, there are two parts to this uh, uh, program today. There's a the first part where they meet the uh, folks here, the ordinary citizens, and talk to them. The second part is from, is from three, where we bring you live. You want to join us here at the Batco uh, here at, in Tamale. Next program is Desk, and my team there will take over, but they will reconnect with us throughout the day as we build into first the sifting of the issues and a live event at three, you don't want to miss. If you're in Tamale, you want to come here uh, immediately uh, as we begin to gather the views and then at three, join us for a live conversation. Well, thank you very much, Evans Mensa, and of course, all roads lead to Tamale uh, right there. And that's where that event is coming up uh, today, the Ghana Connect Town Hall, but stay with us. This is how we cap off the AM show. Up next is a joint news desk with Sweetie Abochi. Stay for that.
Hello, this is Joy News Desk for today, the 20th of March, 2024. Coming up in this bulletin, government's Agenda 111 comes under scrutiny as minority in parliament accuses government of lack of transparency and corruption. More, as the government says, funding is available to complete 60 of the Agenda 111 projects. Hey, 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 you didn't do any of them. Hundreds of communities plunged into darkness as thieves vandalized high-tension towers belonging to the electricity company of Ghana. We came this morning to see that the towers holding the lines have fallen. Eight of them. Eight of them have fallen on the ground. Activities of criminals causing prolonged power outages in some parts of the Ashanti region. We will tell you more. Basic schools in La Dadekotopong municipality still in ruins 10 months after its roofing was ripped off by rainstorm, more as the pupils reel under severe conditions affecting their academic work. We are not feeling comfortable because um, whilst the teacher, the uh, Maledada uh, school teacher is coming to teach and whilst our, school, uh, our teacher too is coming to teach, it will be confused. I'm Sweetie Abochi. Stay with me for details. In our first story, government agenda 111 has come under scrutiny yet again as the minority is accusing the government of the opaque nature of transactions surrounding the whole project. The debate couldn't have gotten more heated than this as both the minority and majority clashed on the matter. Speaking on PM Express, ranking member on the health committee, Kobna Minta Kando, chastised the government for issuing contracts to people who have currently abandoned the site how we created another bureaucracy at the, at the presidency for this purpose beat every reasonable Ghanaian's mind. That's number one. But that is not a given. That's number one. No. I'm, I'm, I'm building not any point. evidence. I'm it's not an evidence. My point. I'm building my point, Evans. Mm. Let's take time. Number two, I have personally gone round with some members, your reporters, who've gone round to some site where people have taken mobilization more than a year down the lane, and absolutely nobody is at the stage. I this. And there are people, there are no people, nobody at the site. If it is not to satisfy family and friends, what is it? Again, if you go to the Ministry of Health, we have standard prototypes of district hospitals, standard design. But we again engage David Ajay and paid millions of Ghana cities to him to redesign. If it is not to satisfy family and friends, what is it? So from the beginning, from the beginning, the onset till now, there are bizarre circumstances up to date. But none now, of the things you've cited is evidence to suggest that there is corruption, which in essence, in the summary, is what you're suggesting it there is. The, the system is opaque, there's no transparency. As you said there, do you even, when did they open tender for bidding of that project? Do you know? Tell but, me. But chairman of the health committee, Nana Ayuwefriye, said government is moving steadily on the project and is on course to complete at least 60 of them. Please stop that. Stop all that, the, stop, all stop the that, erogenous that. ones, you abandoned. Yeah, I yeah, even said yeah. it on the floor of parliament. You did not. Now, let me also move forward. We have come to complete 
their projects. And, and you see, a government that believes in the fact that you don't all do these projects we are help. talking about, we have don't do secured help. funding. Okay. You, 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 you didn't have secure funding. You didn't have secure funding. You were just making policies without this amount The NMS and the NMS and the NMS and you, Mr. Friend, you didn't have any, you didn't know where you were going to have extra money. So if you could try the hospital. If you don't allow me to get this through, we will not serve our audience. So you're not serving our audience. No, we just have to say, Mr. Friend, Mr. Friend, please. a lot. No. Time, time. Mr. Friend, address. The Address this question for me. Okay, which one? The 50 or 60 you say you're confident they'll finish. Yeah. Is there dedicated funding for yes, it? From the, ABFA. For ABFA. Okay. Convey that is not convey. true. We need more than $1.7 billion oh, to complete this project. No, 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 no. Oh, He's talking about the argument. Uh, what, how much is he available? How much is it available you see, that they, you see, they are going to use to complete? Then, then I come that back is to not the true. NMS issue. It is not true. There's okay. no secure funding. You should show us in the budget the, okay. where the, we have the funding the, to secure to, okay. it's okay. the NMS, the NMS, to, to finance NMS, it. It's not true. NMS, um, when they the appeared, they said they had distributed to us. It's okay. It's okay. Did not it's grant true. an LC to complete it. Are you they use all the money on Dodo, and that the, was for the, five hospitals. The, the, that is NDC for you. The, the question is, is the MCP do you that have come to raise funding, funding to complete the whole project? project. But the answer is no. I want to read a document you authenticated about the funding. The, the projections was to complete the 25%, an estimated amount of $300 million will be required to support this output. Yes. And we don't have the 300 million in our budget. He says, but you have raised 400 million. Okay. In which budget? They have given it to them. In uh, which budget? We're talking about November 200 and something. They've released yeah. several tranches to them. So that even when you add the one, you're trying to budget. Eva, doesn't even add up before Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. you Moving on, the electricity company of Ghana is coughing up several thousands of dollars as the company begins emergency maintenance to restore power to affected communities. The activities of suspected criminals are causing power outages in some communities in the Ashanti region. Ohiming Tewia has more. The miscreants are targeting bulls and knots, holding the base of high-tension towers belonging to the electricity company of Ghana. In one of such operations, thieves caused eight towers covering about 12 kilometers to fall, leading to power outages. The power company has had to ration power supply to affected areas, which included Kumewu, Bekwai, Pansungkwanta, and Ejiso. Here is General Manager, Ashanti Substation Division, Engineer Peter Kufi Fletcher, who first spoke about the severity of the vandalism. We have our tower line, which feeds areas like um a child chrome a just environs if you just see any environs come to any severance in Aguna. we came this morning to see that the towers holding the lines have fallen eight of them eight of them have fallen on the ground and in last night um this happened so it's in fact it happened last night during the rainfall and we came to sites we came to sites and realized that the cause of them falling as a result of some boat and not being removed, some members which have been removed um, from the base up to a level of about three meters from the base have been removed. And these are structures that were intentionally built. Every component is necessary in the construction. So if you remove the boat and not and the members, you compromise the integrity. So yesterday during the heavy windstorm, our line tripped. We tried again and it didn't hold. So this morning, as we are hunting for the cause of the outage, we came and realized that eight of our towers are on the ground. And the cause is basically some parts have been removed from the base. Basically, the boat are not and the members. And this affected power supply. The situation is not only a dent on the operations of ECG, but also a financial constraint on the strained resources. The ECG was spent at least $1.2 billion on maintenance works alone. Engineer Kofi Fletcher again. The cost alone, we are MCG not less than $1 million, $1 million in the construction. The time for the construction alone, we may go almost by a month. This is just even one of the many vandalism around um, our, our transformers which are even in circuit on the post, have been toppled to the ground. 
even steal some part of it. Our RMUs, we go around, our RMUs are even being exposed. Some parts of the equipment, the one that are mounted at the ground, are being exposed. People are just picking some petty part of it. But you see, the petty part of it that you pick, that doesn't fetch you much. The whole equipment is damaged. So we just entreat the public that if you see anybody around this equipment, suspiciously, kindly report. Our our number is uh, 0302 -611 So what does this mean to customers in affected areas? We are showing our customers that though it is a blow to us, customers, the impact on customers may not be felt that much because you are reconfiguring the network to put everybody on supply. Meanwhile, officials of ECG have lodged a complaint with the Ghana Police Service while working around the clock to fully restore power in affected areas. From Kumasi, for Joy News, I'm Interior reporting. Let's get on Zoom now and speak to Ohiming Teria in Kumasi. But also joining us is Benjamin Inti, who is Public Relations Officer of ECG for Ashanti West. First, Ohiming Teria. Oh, I mean, thanks for joining us. You have been on the ground, and as of this, eight towers vandalized, amounting to over one million dollars. What more can you report? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the situation, as of three uh, days ago, impacted on power uh, supply in these affected areas. It, it covers a vast area. The Ajuso and its environs. Uh, Kumawu and its environs, that of Kapai and Mansung Kwanta. Uh, residents who were in their homes expecting to get a power a supply uh, were disappointed. Uh, for instance, uh, we have police in the office uh, who live in these areas and they were also affected. So Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Yes, uh, the, we have police in our office uh, who were also affected uh, by these outages. So uh, yesterday in the morning, uh, we're even discussing how come uh, the power out outages uh, have been so pronounced. And it was later in the day that we got to know that uh, chiefs uh, have ransacked uh, the ECG's uh, uh, towers. And when I got to the scene, uh, I realized most of these uh, uh, towers were located in, for instance, the uh, rice farms, uh, where farmers uh, are always at a site working on these farms. But the discussion I had with the farmers and then the suspicion of ECG officials is that uh, the miscreants uh, might have operated in the night uh, mm -hmm. under the cover of darkness. Uh, so as of yesterday, uh, ECG officials have started working uh, to restore power uh, to these affected areas. And I saw their uh, staff uh, carrying some equipment and then electrical cables and gadgets uh, to these uh, areas uh, to uh, work on the towers uh, which were lying down uh, in these uh, uh, bushes. And then there were also uh, concerns about uh, safeguarding and protecting uh, these high tension cables which were left in these uh, bushes. So ECG officials made uh, efforts and there was arrangement uh, after lodging an official complaint with the Ghana Police Service, uh, they also liaised with police uh, to provide security and protection uh, to these cables to prevent uh, further, you know, uh, destruction uh, to these cables, which serve majority uh, a, a part of the Ashanti region. So that has been uh, the situation. Even this morning, uh, my checks also indicate that the workers, the contractors, are busily working. Uh, to you know, uh, provide and also restore uh, these towers that were removed uh, to its original position. Right. So these current temporary measures that have been put in place, do you think that they will suffice? Or what are the community people saying is the way forward? For uh, community members, m many of them are not aware that they have you no know, ECG towers uh, being attacked by uh, thieves uh, because the towers are in the bushes. They are, I think I, I, I spotted two of them which can be seen, especially when, when you are in the Ajuso area. So I use the Ajuso community. Uh, I was in the Ajuso community and that of Ajuso, there's another tower 
that has also been affected. For that one, you, you can see. So for residents, they don't know that uh, these uh, towers were uh, on the ground or they are falling because uh, thieves had attacked them. Uh, so little did they know that their power supply being cut was as a result of the activities and operations of these miscreants. Uh, but they are happy because as of yesterday, as of last night when I checked and this morning too, uh, power has been restored in these areas which hitherto were affected by the activities of the team. So uh, for them, all that they want to see is to see their uh, power being restored. But you see, he says, uh, because of where these towers are located, protecting them with, you know, a human uh, protection will be a bit difficult. They require the general public to support ECG. For instance, if there are people that you suspect are tempering with uh, these towers and installations, what you need to do is to call ECG to a free number or if, in contact the police uh, service so they can uh, arrest these perpetrators uh, to uh, safeguard uh, these towers so the entire community can have power uh, supply in their areas. Right. Thank you so much. But let me move now to Ben Entry. Benjamin, you are the PRO for ECG for Shanti West. How have you been affected by this development? Hello, Ben. If you are with me, please yeah, unmute. Okay. Okay. Yes. So please I was asking, again. how have you been affected by this development? Well, a very good morning to your cherished viewers. And as Oini Pia rightly said, uh, our operations were affected last night and perhaps even yesterday. And moving forward, I'm sure it's also going to affect our financial health because as the subprime Prime General Manager indicated, we are going to spend more than $1 million to restore the eight damaged pylons. And this was an avoidable debt that we have incurred because it wasn't as well a financial disaster, but you could see individuals who are trying to sabotage our network, or should I say, destroy our budget. In fact, you would also realize that in as much as we are going to suffer this financial burden, there's also a financial loss that we lost yesterday within the period that the outage occurred. Because anytime power goes off, ECG, we lose revenue from unsaved energy. You would realize that yesterday from morning around 6 o'clock to around 6 p.m., that most of the communities were restored to a national grid. Whereas we lost, specialized, we lost revenue during that period as a result of unsaved energy. Then again, we also lose what we call uh, the goodwill from our customers because our customers experience an outage. You would realize that hospitals within the area, the Egyptian government hospital, they always need power to operate to, I mean, treat their patients and I think major surgeries among others. They also lost the part by schools over there, like Jesus Jesus Secondary School, among other schools over there, they all lost power supply. So you could realize that students could not even study. And even so look at the social aspect as well, from the education sector, the health sector, to even businesses, because businesses within that area could not even operate as a result of these uh, the activities by these miscreants. And we are grateful for Joy News for joining this fight because as we need to rightly said, this is not a fight that ECG can win alone. with I say, a partnership between we and the general public. So we humbly have told the general public to assist us. This is how it has impacted our people financially, as well as even the social aspect and the economic challenges as well. Right. But have you made any arrests, any suspects in custody yet? Well, I have to speak. We only reported the incident to the Ghana Police Service and investigation has commenced. And we, it is our hope that very soon do get at least one or two people, because as the general manager rightly said, it's not just uh, just so that this incident has occurred. It's not like a one-off thing. Mm -hmm. It's a menace that is gradually gaining momentum in the Ashanti region, because you realize that if an area will complain of an outage, by the time we get the realize that a transformer is on the ground, has been damaged. The important equipment like proper windings, the boots and not have been removed. Sometimes even the RME food is not being removed as well. And once these activities are, these items are removed, these customers will not be able to get power supplies. So we realize that the interest of just few people who are more or less like trying to damage our equipment will end up causing energy to a lot of people. So we have uh, reported the incident to the Ghana Police Service. We are also liaising with security agents like the NIB, the National Security, among others. Because like you said, where our towers are passing, this is like a 33,000 volt network. We can't bring it to the center of town. Because imagine if this pylon was in the center of town and then the cables were damaged or the cables got to the ground. Imagine anybody within our vicinity could have been electrocuted. 
So we are also happy that in terms of safety, there is no casualty result uh, re reported from the general public and then from the ECG side as well. So it's because of safety reasons and then where we can get corridor. That is why these pylons are located in the outskirts of the major town. But then we need the support because as Oyen rightly said, there are farmers within that area. So if it is your farm produce that you are guarding, you're able to guard it very well. So see the ECG asset as your own asset because ECG is a state institution. Hey, so that belongs to the state, belongs to all of us. So let us come together to help protect ECG installations. Because once we protect the installation, it will increase our chances of keeping the lights on. Yesterday, if it wasn't because we had an alternative route, because imagine the line was what we call a radar line, i.e. a one-way line. These people would have been off until that one month that will restore all the eight hours back to the mm. national grid. But thankfully, it was a ring system, so we were able to supply some of them from the PPRC as well. And as we speak, no customer is off. And we, we also want to thank the media, especially multimedia, for mm. getting to the site on time and then also trumpeting this activity. And we hope that with Uh, it appears we have some network challenges. That was Ben Inchi, who is CRO for ECG Ashanti West. Let's move on now. The Electricity Company of Ghana, as part of its mobilization drive, has disconnected power to Garden City Special School in the Ashanti region. The school for differently able children under the Ghana Education Service has been in darkness for over five weeks for failing to pay a debt of 66,000 Ghana cities to, power, to the power distributor. Students and school authorities are frustrated as they have been plunged into darkness for five weeks now over debt owed the electricity company of Ghana. The situation has adversely affected academic activities and boarding on the campus of the Garden City Special School at Asakari Mapo. Students are forced to spend several hours outside their rooms at night due to the heat. This is making it difficult for academic work to progress. Power Japan is worried about the situation. It's been hell. I will say it that way. Because they have been running up and down from their office, regional office, to the district office. They asked me to make letters. I did the letter. I sent it to the district office. I went there to follow up the letter and I was told it has been endorsed and taken to the region. I went to the region because I wanted to meet the regional director and explain to him that, yes, we owe, we know. We know the school owes ECG. But these are children who are vulnerable. And this particular term has been a bit hard for us in the school because with the male's dormitory, the roof got ripped off. So they are sleeping in the classrooms. And for them sleeping in the classroom and no lights, I mean, it means some of them will not sleep. The school depended on a power generator, which also broke down. The headmistress says the school is yet to receive money from the government to settle the utility bills. As at now, ECG says, until we pay, they will not put the light on for us. But where are we getting the money to pay? Nobody pays school fees here. We don't do any IGF here. So where do we get the money? So until government releases feeding grant to the school, it means we don't have any money. We won't have any money. So are we, continue, are we going to continue sleeping in darkness? At the, this administration block, work is on standstill. William Amankra is the educational director at the Asakori Mampo municipality. He's equally worried about the situation. Them, if they could come and restore the power because of the nature of the children up to now. And this mass disconnection, these youth staff, they've been doing this almost everywhere. Individual houses, companies, some government institutions and the rest. But we are very much concerned because of the nature of the children, special children. And when there is no light, their condition is worst. You see, their issues are triggered by light or darkness. That's why we are so much concerned. Rosalind Frimpong was pleading with the ECG to restore power as the school plans to settle their debt when their funds are delivered. Whatever it is, the bill will be paid. 
But how can we continue to let these children sleep in darkness? Yesterday, they killed two scorpions near where the boys are sleeping. What if they enter the room and they buy somebody's child? How will we explain it? A difficult moment here for the students at the Garden City Special School as they are being forced to sleep in darkness and intense heat. Some of the students here at the dormitory would have to be staying out for quite some time to get fresh air because their rooms are hot. The headmistress of the school is pleading with the electricity company to turn on their lights as they make way to pay their debt. For your news, my name is Nana Mwachitankwe Yadom. Kumasi. That was Nana Bwachi Yadom there. Moving on, classroom blocks at Manle Dada and African Unity Basic Schools in the Lada de Kotopong municipality are still in ruins 10 months after its roofing was ripped off by a rainstorm. Pupils say they are unable to undertake specialized subjects like computing and practicals because the facility is no longer fit for such a purpose. In spite of the promise made by the Lada de Kotopong Municipal Assembly to fix the situation within three months, it appears this promise is becoming a pipe dream. Joy News says Ramat Bashir visited the place and has filed this report. It's been almost 10 months with no roof over a 13-unit classroom block at the Africa Unity Basic School and Manli Dada Basic School in the Ladade Kotopong Municipal Assembly. The roofs were completely destroyed following a downpour in May 2023. The pupils now compete for space with the hot scorching rays from the sun. But as the rainy season beckons, the fate of over 500 pupils now hang in a balance. The grim reality of having to stay home when the rain setting lingers on their minds. Hannah Aitonam Gabo is the head girls prefect of Manli Dada Basic School. She says the situation has begun taking a toll on the academic work of her colleagues. And the academic ways of the students now is coming down because when sometimes it rains, it leaks inside the room, yes. And we don't get time to learn to because if it's raining, we all pack ourselves and sit to one side. Both Manadada and African Unity are still in the same classroom and different, different teachers. So maybe if Manadada is having a lesson and Af African Unity is having a lesson, the teachers became confused. The regular classroom stream has been collapsed into one unit. Aside from the congestion they're currently dealing with, they are unable to pay attention while lessons are underway. It's become a reason why some pupils are absenting themselves from school. If it is raining too, all, all the students must pack themselves at one side before we'll be comfortable. And all, even at the class we are, it's because of the rain. We can't even learn well. And even the sun is caution too much. We can't even stay in the class. It's caution us too much. We are not feeling comfortable because um, whilst the teacher, the uh, Maledada uh, school teacher is coming to teach, and while our school, uh, our teacher too is coming to teach, it will be confused. Okay, for me, I'm striving to learn very hard because when it rains, we can't, we cannot concentrate on what the teacher is teaching on. So we all have to go to another class to uh, purchase this more so that we can, when the rain stops, we can come and then learn. I feel sad because when the rain falls, it destroys our books that we used to learn. So we don't get enough book, enough books so that we can learn with it. For the head teachers of these institutions, cost sharing of classrooms, libraries, and restrooms are a major nightmare they have had to contend with on a daily basis. A timetable for two schools meshed into one when it shouldn't be the case. We're having congestion in the classroom because two schools coming together as one was problematic. Um, furniture was also another. Um, how to draw a timetable for the various teachers to go to class to teach. The two head teachers 
managing our resources very well was a bit challenging. The situation is unbearable. It's un uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. It retards teaching and learning. Instead of progressing, you see them retrogressing. Because sometimes getting information from different teachers becomes very difficult. The Municipal Director of Education at LADMA, Habiba Kotoma, is blaming the slow pace of work on resource constraints. She is confident with the intervention of stakeholders and some companies, that situation will soon be resolved. The fact that uh, the cost is so much, the first company that came on board was not able to complete it last year for us. Then um, we have a current company in place that came forward willingly and asked if they could support any of our schools in distress. And the MCE agreed and handed over African Unity. We, we are hoping that the, this current company will work faster and get African Unity uh, back on its feet. Then uh, the Ghanaian child in La can go back into their normal classroom. Curious to find out the cause of the delay, Joy News visited the head of works for LADMA, engineer Ben Debra. He stated that the budget for the project is yet to be disbursed, but was hopeful that work will be completed in three months when funds are allocated. Beginning of the year, we prepare our budget and we implement our budget based on what has been put in the gift means. When we say gift means, you understand. So every payment that is not in the gift means, it will not be on it. So this year is implementation year. Come in, in three months, um, you see the, the final stages of, of, of the work. Despite assurances from the Ladade Kotoko Municipal Assembly to repair the damaged classroom block, the situation remains dire impeding academic activities and depriving students of the right to quality education. Ramat Bachiru's report for Joy News. Fantastic report there by Ramat Bashiru. Now, in other news, renowned media personality and host of Sandpoint, Ohinayere Givtianti, urges young women to brighten their corner, citing her own journey from a floor manager to a television anchor. Speaking at the Hair Story Summit in Wa, Upper West Region, to mark International Women's Day, Ohinere Giftianti emphasized the importance of perseverance in the face of criticism. Join News Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports from Wa. The summit held at the Edubit campus in Wa and the team counted in accelerating gender equality through economic empowerment brought together participants from various political parties, women's groups, and students from different schools. The event is part of Fit Ghana's annual history campaign aimed at highlighting the stories of women in diverse professional fields in promoting mentorship and advocacy for young women and girls. Executive Director of Teen Talk, Osman Linat, welcomed participants to the summit, setting the stage for discussion on gender equality and women's empowerment. International Women's Day is not just a day, it is a movement to recognize the resilience, strength, and unwavering determination of women from all walks of life. It is not just the continuous celebration of successes, but also to acknowledge the challenges we continue to face in our pursuit of equality and justice. Now, the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party and Vice President of the country is speaking with the Ghana Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry. Let's cross over now and take a listen at the Western Premier Hotel in Accra. One of the key areas that you have to do as a flag bearer is to put together your manifesto committee and charge that manifesto committee with coming up with new ideas, new ways of looking at things. I am very, very clear in my mind that Ghana
can be the foremost country on this continent. We can. It is possible. When you look at the role of the private sector, it is very, very clear and philosophically I'm very, very much aligned to the private sector. And it is very, very clear that for us to do what we ought to do to be the leading, uh, among the leading countries on this continent, then the private sector must play, play its appropriate role. And so I am very clear that we need to look at what is working and what is not working and make the necessary changes to bring in efficiency, bring in competitiveness. I know that um, many of you as the president had read, had listened to me on February 7th when I you know, outlined my vision for the country and talked on some of the policy measures I thought we should take. Um, I think that it is very important that we become a very business friendly country. It is very important that we become a very tax competitive country. And this is why uh, uh, about a couple of months ago, I took a trip to Estonia I've been looking at tax competitiveness across the world. And every year for the last 10 years, the most tax competitive country in the world was Estonia. Every year for the last 10 years. So I was wondering what were they doing? And so I took a team and we went to Estonia to understudy tax competitiveness in Estonia. By the way, they are also one of the most digitalized countries in the world. And so we were able to, to get a good understanding that it is not even very uh, complex, simplicity and transparency, right, in terms of the tax regime. And so we learned a lot from there. So we need to be very tax competitive we need to be able to bring interest rates down for businesses to be able to function. You are competing, you are borrowing at 32% and your competitor in another country is borrowing at 5%. Ab initio, you've lost the game. You are, you are not competitive. So we need to understand that and be able to bring, uh, we need stability in the exchange rate and also a lot of predictability and reasonableness on the import duties that we pay as a country. And I think the president just mentioned about our neighboring Togo, for example, and how we are losing containers to Togo because we are more expensive uh, in terms of import duty than Togo. I, I will uh, comment on, 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 on that. Utilities are another issue. So it was really heartwarming listening to the president and the proposals that the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry is making for us to consider in this manifesto that we are putting together. Why is it heartwarming? It is heartwarming because these proposals aligned with my own thinking. They align with my own thinking. And so I've, I found it difficult to disagree with any, I was waiting to look for something that I would vehemently oppose, but I'm yet to, to find one that I'm very, very vehemently opposed to. It means we are coming on the same page on this issue. We need to be transformational. Uh, and so we need to be taking decisions that will transform the, the country. And I don't believe going forward, we are going to be doing the same things. I want us to do new things. I want us to do things we have not done before. 
And so I know that with you, we are going to work very closely together. Um, I made the point on February 7th that where I want to go with this country, I said that in our first couple of terms in office, we have focused as a government a lot more on social interventions. But now I want us to move the focus to business and the private sector. And that is where I, I have some ideas, and I would, I would speak to some of them once uh, I hear some more from you. Because I know that you have some remarks you want to make, and so I don't want to anticipate some of those remarks. I want to, since I'm here, to listen and to take notes, and for my team to take notes, to listen to you, and then I will share with you some of the policies that I am, uh, by the grace of God, going to be implementing in January 2025. So I'll thank you for your attention, and then I'll sit down and listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Vice President. Please, let's put our hands together for him. <laughs> for choosing to spend this day with us, and also for engaging the mandate of all business associations first. <laughs> was Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia and some of the things, the highlights of my takeaways that we need uh, stability in the exchange rates. We'll bring you a summary of that in a subsequent bulletin. But moving on from my election headquarters, the National Peace Council has cautioned political parties, representatives, and media practitioners to be mindful of the utterances going to the December 7th general election. The Peace Council is raising concerns about the use of insults and tribal statements to score political points. In a heat up of campaigning for the parliamentary and presidential election, the council warns parties, representatives, and supporters, as well as the media, to desist from using words that can put the peace of the country under threat. Nanaya Boache has more. The Peace Council's meeting in Kumase was with political party representatives, some supporters and media practitioners. The workshop is to dialogue on matters that may affect the peace of the country going into the December 7th election, while encouraging stakeholders to resort to peaceful speeches during their campaign. Dr. Harriet Techi is a member of the Peace Council. During this period of our election in 2024, we would continue to live peacefully as Ghanaians. But the focus is more on our political parties, their functionalists and their constituents, and Ghanaians in general, to make sure that we continue to live in peace because we have nowhere to go. We have diverse views, yet we need to express this divergence views in a much more peaceful way so that we understand ourselves and continue to live in peace as Ghanaians. We should not, particularly again with uh, our journalists, they should be careful the way they report happenings in the country. They should use language that will bring peace, not rather a language that will bring hatred. Apostle Bright Susu also admonished the youth to desist from any act of vigilantism. The measures we have in place to educate the youth to make sure that they don't um, enter into any group of people who will be inciting others 
against the process. So we're educating the youth encouraging them never to be part of any vigilantism because those things will destroy Ghana. Some party representatives shared the expectations. Already we stand uh, in the chance of benefiting because as politicians we tend to rule the country. So as they are doing, we are also letting our constituents and our executives uh, at the grassroots understand the importance of dialoguing and that is what we're doing here. We are as a peaceful party and we talk peace and we advise our people to be law abiding to conduct themselves well but we've noticed with very serious concern that the electoral commission is losing its credibility and that is an issue that we are very much concerned about and we try as much as possible to talk to them one cardinal example i can cite is how they recruit officials into to manage the affairs of the election. For Joy News, Nama Bwati Dankwe Yadom. And that's it from my election headquarters. But right now, we're going to take a break. When we return, there's business news. Stay with us. Across Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with the one purpose, to create and share opportunities to grow. Ahenini now want our children to use the internet to learn. No we nina be farmers, doctors, lawyers, fishers, traders in a more kick. Yenini na ye pede yanin yen friends and loved ones who bon komu fundo without any interruptions. Ao, yes, ao. A pe stable service ne to ma send the mobile money na come our parents of ye. JT Trot Room, or Pedosha Chelsea vs Man City game without missing a moment. Hey Ramana, ono ze nengiwa jido obo receive mobile money payments efi ni customers ho. On pay delay so. Ebo ze, love talks in kotin or po. Obo tu maka saa till he sleeps on the phone. Hey Yemwenyi na is made possible because of the red, white and grey telecommunication towers are owa yen community simunti. Dem telecommunication tower si, or ye safe, or ho to the benefit of Obiara our community ni we are here, the Yebobwa. In case of any emergency, Biara, and now you see a theft going on, for the Ghana Police Service on 191 and now 18555, a button is 0209-222220, in 0242-435629, and now 30 for assistance. So welcome the telecommunication towers into the approved locations in your neighborhoods so that you can keep connecting to the people and things you love. Message Ghana Institution of Engineering, and in the Radiation Protection Institute, and Hawaiian DOS. This coming Easter Monday is Love from Family Party in the Park. First April 2024, Rotary Park, Bayer the Day. 
So start putting plans together and let's have the biggest family picnic experience ever. Where are my bubbly little kitty bobs, neckabums, papas, obitsu? We will make available all the kids playing items, trampoline, bouncy castles, electric train, merry-go-round, stationary airplane, horse race, face painting, TV games. For all the adults in Kumasi, get ready for the adult corner. Get your dancing shoes on with some electrifying live band music. The date is Easter Monday, 1st April 2024 at the Rat Trap Park, Denyame. Rate is a cool 10 Ghana cities, 8 a.m. sharp. The Love of Fun Family Party in the park. Easter edition. We simply can't wait. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Ghana Institution of Engineering is calling for more collaboration from some government agencies. Rather than frustrate their operations, President of the Institution, uh, Engineer Kwabana Benpon, said there is the need to build a resilient infrastructure to withstand any shocks. He was speaking at the 54th Annual General Meeting and Conference of the Institution. The 2024 annual conference serves as a platform for engineering practitioners and thought leaders to come together, share knowledge, collaborate, network and contribute to the advancement of the nation's sustainable development. Engineer Kovina Bimpon urged engineers to design and construct physical systems that can withstand and recover from various shocks and stresses including natural disasters, climate change and human-made disruptions. And I dare say, many third world countries, we are very vulnerable to external shocks, such as the current, and I know whenever we hear of excuses to give for the current challenges, it was about the geopolitical wars, it was about the pandemic, climate change, today you know it. Yeah. And you see, a lot of people, we never knew that we were fed, or our internet was fed by undersea cables. But today, even though it is a misfortune, we, are, we now know that we are fed by undersea cables. And I don't know whether the journalists are here. You know, the journalists, they seem to know everything. So immediately they are talking about ACE, and why is it that um, um, these you know, telcos don't have multiple uh, connections and all that? But yes, truly, the internet disruptions as a result of the undersea cable cuts, they say multiple cable cuts. These are all shocks. With their attendant impact on our economic fortunes, it is thus important that as engineering practitioners, we play our part by designing and providing resilient infrastructure for our development. Member of the Council of State, Sam Okujetua, urged engineers to be more practical in their operations. Dubai is a desert place. There's no river that flows there. So they had to distill the seawater. But the streets are planted with flowers and plants being watered several times during the day. Qatar is even building a new city now. I mean, when you see the design of it, you'll be shocked. So what are we doing? What are we doing, my engineers? What are we doing? So I think we have work to do. Mm? It's work in progress. So, Mr. President, I will plead with you that all of you should continue to organize seminars and in these seminars, though if restricted to only engineers, try and get the other professions as we were doing before. This year's conference was under the theme Engineering a Resilient Future, Innovative Solutions for a Sustainable Ghana. Now, unemployment can be addressed if there is more collaboration between the private and public sectors. This is according to academician Professor A.C. Sutherland Adi. 
She says much is not collectively done from both sectors, hence the need for stringent policies to support young people. She spoke to Joy Business at the 13th Teaching and Learning Conference. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, the average unemployment rate in Ghana for the first three quarters of 2023 was estimated at 14.7%, with the rates among females consistently higher than males. The chairperson for the Forum for African Women Education List, A.C. Sutherland, had called for a deliberate approach on the part of the government to address the unemployment menace. It's those who put the curriculum together that should be doing um, this work of making sure that the curriculum speaks to um, getting young people in the frame of mind where they can see what is around them as a resource, right? And so um, the teachers uh, will then take that up and, 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 and move with it. But I think if you look at unemployment, um, I think w what I would like to, to, to put across is what are the resources for employment? And they are there and we should, we should, we should be picking on those instead of looking at the, the negative side of it. Head of the Lufran Mission School, Leslie Tay, called for more support for teachers. This is the 13th teen conference to be held at Lincoln Community School and teen stands for the education network. It started 13 years ago with a very small group of our Lincoln teachers, Ghanaian local teachers who work here, who really wanted to reach out and support their fellow teachers in and that's it for this segment. The news returns after this. Welcome back, but that's all we have for you for Joy News Desk today. We're back in the hour for Joy News Today. My name is Sweetie Aboti. I'll see you soon. of November last year, His Royal Majesty the King Osei Tutu II, Tutu IV, um, launched the Hill Confanochi project. It's a drive to raise funds for the rehabilitation or renovation of the almost 70-year-old Confanochi Teaching Hospital, which was named after the great priest of the Ashanti Kingdom, Confanochi. Incidentally, when uh, Confanochi first put the sword that was supposed to be a unifying factor of all the Ashanti states on the ground. It was the two for said to the first, who was the king of Ashanti then. Um, and so, as part of the 25th anniversary celebration, when the king decided that the time had come for him to lead that drive for people from far and near to contribute to the renovation of the almost 70 year facility, which has never seen any renovation when, since it was built in 1955. It was welcoming and refreshing, and what it's marked of leadership that every young man or woman would aspire to. Now, like I said, every day, on the average, we receive about a thousand patients who are coming from 
at least 12 out of the 16 regions in Ghana. So Convanochi serves as a referral facility for 12 out of 16 regions in Ghana. Ordinarily, retooling of a hospital like Convanochi would be seen as the responsibility of government. It is indeed true. But in many developed democracies, like the United States, Canada, UK, Germany, I'm sure many of us who have lived there at one point or another in our lives are aware that these things are done. Private individuals, philanthropists, and so on, give non-governmental organizations, give towards the renovation, the building of new hospitals, and so on, and so forth. And so the king being a golfer himself, the golfers decided that it was one of the ways by which they could contribute to the king's vision. And so today what has happened is that the golfers are launching uh, a competition of a sort that would see to them contributing generously to the king's drive. I have absolutely no doubt for that for this that the golfers have done, their names will be written in gold. Posterity will judge them for Thank you very much and God bless you. This coming Easter Monday is Love FM Family Party in the Park. First April 2024, Rotary Park, Baya de Deja. So start putting plans together and let's have the biggest family picnic experience ever. Where are my bubbly little kitty bobs, neckabums, papas, OBT? We will make available all the kids' playing items trampoline, bouncy castles, electric train, merry go round, stationary airplane, horse race, face painting, TV games. For all the adults in Kumasi, get ready for the adult corner. Get your dancing get shoes your on with some electrifying live band music. Date is Easter Monday, 1st April 2024 at the Rat Trap Park. The Nyame rate is a cool 10 Ghana cities, 8 a.m. sharp. The Love of a Family Party in the Park. Easter edition. We simply can't wait. We're having a conversation about the big agenda 111 debate. This is an election year after all, and it's a major electoral promise. This current government made that promise to build 111 hospitals in districts across the country. It has become a controversial subject now, and it is one that is splitting the two parties, but it's an important one because it's about health. And a lot has been said about its feasibility or otherwise. And in John Mahama, 
got into that particular subject and has thrown up a fair bit of controversy since then. And we're going to be talking about that a bit. But I want to go through the numbers. It's all a numbers game quickly before I sit down so that we understand what we are talking about. The first number uh, to look at is a number that a lot of, you know, conversation is about. It's 111. And, and that simply is what I said at the beginning. It's as simple as it gets. Building 111 hospitals in districts across the country. The second number I want to talk about is, is, is this number. And that number is important too because you begin to break the, the, the issues down a bit more. We'll talk about how much. We also will talk about where. And 111 is a very important number, uh, but there are a few additional numbers that are important also to consider in, in this matter. Uh, three numbers, three numbers. 102, that is the district hospitals. And then we have seven regional hospitals and then we have two psychiatric hospitals. That's what it's about, right? Those are three numbers very important to pay attention to in terms of what the president said they're gonna do. Then there's, there's a third set of numbers I wanted to tell you about. This is a third set of numbers, right? It relates to dates. April 2020, that's where the promise was first made. And we go to August 2017, 2021. That's where salt was cut. And then you come to October 2023, and that is where we were told that 89 hospitals have so far, in terms of a percentage, 57% complete. Are so far, 57, 52, 52% complete. So timelines are important, right? And then we go to 18 months on. We were told that 18 months to completion. That is the president's own timeline at the time of cutting the sword. At the time, I, I look at the timelines when we began. At the time he cut the sword, he said 18 months it would take to complete this. Then the, another number jumps at you because once you, once you hear the president say 18 months to complete, you then have to measure it against where we are currently. So where are we currently with this? We are in the territory of 31 plus months. And that is a, another number that I need to uh, drum home because we're again tracking from the moment he made the promise to where we are now, 31 months since the commencement. Right? So the government is behind time by how many months? And that is important too, USD, is what one hospital will cost under the agenda 111. If you look at it in the computation terms, they're talking about $1.6 billion is what it's going to cost us to have all the hospitals built. But then, once you look at the numbers, the question then is where are we finding $1.9 billion to build? John Mahama says it looks one that isn't feasible. It's not realistic. It has angered the minority in parliament and there's a conversation to be had. This is an election year. We believe it may find itself in a party's manifesto. If you go back to the NDC 2020 manifesto, they also have their own uh, agenda to build significant number of hospitals, 80 class hospitals. So they all are talking about access because that's what it is. Building hospitals in districts will give you access. So they are very similar. And this year, we'll be doing a lot of scrutiny in terms of these promises. At least now, we can talk about the president's own promise. Considering where the economy is, 1.9 billion for one one hospital, how is it possible to have all that? My guests are joining me for a conversation in parliament, really. The chairman of the health committee and the ranking of the health committee in parliament are both here with me for a conversation. Hopefully, at the end of the day, you can make up your mind what is feasible and what is not. So sit down for a conversation after this. They are across the country. Call them on 0244-335-168 or shop online at syntexgh.com. Syntex tanks are your strong, are your tough, pepsodent, cavity fighter. It's also very important because it is fortified with pro-fluoride and micro-calcium ingredients, sealing tiny and invisible holes in your teeth. And it comes in all forms of packs. It has a 175G big family pack. Uh, all the way down to 12 uh, G sachets, so you can always get what you can afford at any time. Pepsi and every smile matters. My guest joining me here for a conversation uh, on this very important policy proposal by the NDC, but of course, this government had also made it, it's not a proposal anymore because they are in government and they are implementing this. The question is about feasibility, and I've told you what the numbers say. They are 13 months behind time. 
but the president says it can be done. The time they started, again, going back to the numbers, it was 18 months uh, to completion. Uh, we know that it's now 31 months since that thought was cut. But the question really remains, is it feasible? John Mahama has waded into this and caused a fair bit of controversy. Kwabana Minta Kando then is a ranking member on the health committee, joins us in the studio. He is an MP for Jaboso. Also joining me is Dr. Nana Uefri, he is the chairman of the health committee of parliament, an MP for Ephibia, Ephibiasia Sokori constituency. We'll also be talking to Dr. Imano Aifa, he's a deputy country director of Sen Ghana. They've been monitoring the pro progress of the project across the country. Uh, hey, Dr. Free, let, let me bring you in first. Okay. Uh, today you had a press conference. Yes, I did. Why? Um, very good evening to your listeners. Um, basically, the press conference led by myself, um, and on behalf of the majority, uh, was to drum home um, a situation, if not checked, and if we don't go out of it, mm -hmm. Um, this country will be led by leaders um, based upon what they say and not what they mean. And that is based upon the expose by the former president that we should have focused on um, Agenda 1 1 by stating maybe we'll do about 40 hospitals. And he think was. Um, over ambitious um, position by the president, and then also was unrealistic. I think that um, that couldn't have been the position of the former president. Why? It makes him absolutely inconsistent. That's why I brought the manifesto of the NDC. What is the manifesto of the NDC? The manifesto of the NDC in 2020, in page 64, item P, Q, and R, which I would stand to let the public know that indeed the manifesto is supposed to be what we say when you win elections in public policy is a crash of cartoons, is a, is a binding um, a major decision policy document that guides you to rule. So therefore, you don't joke with manifestos in any country. Manifestos interventions are supposed to be culturally acceptable, politically wise, financially okay, sustainable. And therefore, before you put it in, you know exactly what you want to do. Now, if you go into the end of the manifesto of 2020 in page 64, you look at item P, it says that co they will construct regional hospitals in the six new regions and the western region. And this is a fundamental principle encompassed in Agenda 111. Mm. Now, it also states that it will provide district hospitals in districts where there is none. Now, in this country, there's only 88 hospitals that has no district hospital. So if the NDC manifesto is saying that it's going to provide district hospitals in districts that has none. It means automatically it's going to establish 88 district hospitals, plus six regional hospitals and one for Western region. It also states in R that it will establish two non-infectious disease centers, and that put it to 96. Now, therefore, what was the reason why the NDZ came out with this? Was it based upon thinking that it's mere talk, mere rhetoric? And if you say we are over ambitious and we could have cut it to about 40, you are going to 96. So what were you thinking about when you were going for yours? And what were we also thinking about? We would go for optimism. All over the world, there have been leaders who have been bold. They will come out with a policy and people will say, no, you can't do it. They may start and others will complete it. In history, they are vindicated. And now this position is premised on the fact that he's bold about the decision. He won't by 2030. Universal access to health care, quality, affordable access to everybody is there for each and every one. Mm. It is bent upon how the glass is, is half full, half empty. He wants to look at half full as optimism. And he's saying that I'm going to get this done. And he's clear about it. If he doesn't get it done, it's a dream of Ghana. Get it done. And that is better than none. Can so he get it done? He can get it done. But obviously, you can't complete it. Longitudinal trends, which you can do your research now, shows that in, in history since 1992, every government that has succeeded in having hospitals have not gone beyond 12. President Kufour, he did six, and Eurojet was bringing him another six to be 12. And he could not achieve that because Eurojet has been stored until now that they are completing. The NDC were able to start some. The NMS projects were about five or six of them. They could obviously finished Dodua. 
the LCs could not extend to do the phase two of several of their hospitals. It was this government that is completing it because healthcare has, it does not look at the NDC or look at MPP as a medical doctor. I don't look at my patients as NDC or MPP. So I've always advocated in parliament and everybody listening to me knows that in parliament I go for a line that does not healthcare, you don't do politics with it. If you do politics with it, it will catch up on you. So I've always stated clearly in parliament that I will do no politics with healthcare and I will say it as it is. As we speak now, as we speak now, I think the former president has no basis to have come into you, But you said that the current president cannot complete all 111 hospitals. That is a classic definition of a policy proposal that is overambitious. No, no. But if you can't do it... No, it's not, it's not, it's not you can't But you've made the... Pro you, you use the word yes, can't. Yes, I, I, I have stated... Yeah, in but, but, that, but, but that is overambitious. No, that is not overambitious. Because you use the word overambitious. That, that is subjective. Overambitious is ab ab subjective. You can't... Can, ambitious can, is setting yourself targets that you know you can't fulfill. Absolutely, that is... And you've that said... That is the imaginative thinking of a president who also wanted to be a president in 2020. And former president wants to be a president in 2020. And he also set a target for himself and says that you should go for 40 when you clearly is looking for 96. So I just want to defeat that thinking by John Muhammad that he couldn't have stated that. Because if you think others were over ambitious, then you were also overtly over ambitious. But you and John Mahama actually yes. fundamentally agree that the ambition to build 111 hospitals yeah. in, dishes, in dishes across the country is not feasible within the time frame he had. Um, um, you said each government uh, had managed the, source of the, ma the maximum. The source of funding. The maximum no hospitals each government had built is what, 12? Yes, events, yes, but obviously... So, the, the end of so, this so, the, year, so this, your own statistics the, yes, backs that, the former that, president's that, that, that is what makes Nanado's vision different. Now, by the end of this year, they would have been going almost to about about 50 or 60 of them would be completed. And that would be novelty, like it's never happened. Like people would tell you, if, if you're looking at conservative minds, they will tell you that you couldn't have done 60 in eight years. It's not possible because you just look at precedence. And the argument is that if precedence has always looked at 10 or 12, why wouldn't you talk about 20? But he's been able to talk, do, by December, he's going to look at about 60 or 70 done. No, hold on for me for a second. 60 or 70 he, he, he is right, though, is it not? That the basis... The of, glass is half the, full. The, the basis of John Mahama's accusations and criticism and skepticism is unfounded. It actually reeks of double standards. Because you have in your manifesto to do even more aggressive construction of hospitals. It's not only overly ambitious, but it's a special purpose vehicle created to siphon money to satisfy family and friends. Oh, yes, that's what it is. But there's no evidence. Right, I'm for coming. That. Oh, I will, I'm, I'm talking, just, I've just begun. You, my and you have to event. prove that. Right? No there's problem. There's I will evidence. do that. I will do yeah. that. Look, okay, all right, all right. in the history of Ghana, health infrastructure has always been supervised by the ministry in the history of Ghana. Health infrastructure. And we have competent people in the ministry, a special department or unit created for that purpose. As to how we created another bureaucracy at the, at the presidency for this purpose, beat every reasonable Ghanaian's mind. That's number one. But that is not again. That's number one. Not, I'm, I'm, I'm building not my any point. evidence. I'm it's not an evidence. My point. I'm building my point, Evans. Mm. Let's take time. Number two, I have personally gone round with some members, your reporters, who've gone around to some site where people have taken mobilization more than a year down the lane and absolutely nobody is at the site. I, personally, including your reporters. And there are people, there are no, uh, nobody at the site. If it is not to satisfy family and friends, what is it? Again, if you go to the Ministry of Health, we have standard prototypes of district hospitals, standard design. But we again engaged David Ajay and paid millions of Ghana cities to him to redesign. 
If it is not to satisfy primary inference, what is it? So from the beginning, from the beginning, the onset till now, there are bizarre circumstances up to date. But none now, of the things you cited is evidence to suggest that there is corruption, which in essence, in the summary, is what you're suggesting it is. The, the, the system is opaque. There's no transparency. As you said there, do you even, when did they open tender for bidding of that project? Do you know? Tell but, me. But those are self-evident facts, but it doesn't amount to corruption. I am saying that. But that was your is, allegation at the it, start. It is, it is, it is. You concede that you don't have evidence to back that position. Look, everything surrounding this particular project raises questions. Points to the fact that it's an attempt to satisfy primary and friends. Yeah, so now you, you can you, give now you've qualified it. You've qualified as an attempt. No, I'm saying that. By the beginning, give, you were very categorical. You can, you can give it any description you want. Do you understand? So the beginning to the end is problematic. Number two, Evans. In the beginning of this project, this project, as you projected, is estimated at not less than 1.7, 1.9 billion, billion dollars. Dollars, yes. Okay. Okay. Let me take you back a little bit. If you recall, the president promised constructing 88 district hospitals mm. in April 2020. Mm. If you recall, during the COVID, I mean, address. Now, after the promise, then there was another uh, company called Core One, mm -hmm. which is who, Core One Company Limited. Listen to it carefully. Core One Company Limited, which main objective per Register General was to import and export of general goods. In May 2020, they then amended their object to include hospital infrastructure. And that company was renamed as Hospital Infrastructure uh, uh, um, Company mm. in May 2020. And that company has no experience in supervision of health infrastructure. And this government gave the supervision of such an, I mean, such a huge project to a company without any records in the supervision of health projects. This is how bizarre it all started. Now, fast forward. We realized that out of the $1.9 billion, the last time the secretariat appeared before the committee, which my chairman chaired, they had only disbursed not, less, not more than $256 million US dollars. So there's a gap of more than $1.4, $1.5 billion and they sat right in front of us and they told us, okay? So given the economic hardship at the moment, where are we going to get the money? Now, if President Mahama tells you that he is going to build hospitals when he becomes president, there are two clear differences here. Number one, we have, he has a history. He has the records and I'll name some of the hospitals to you. But before I get there, Evans, if you look at the page 63 or so that is saying paragraph Q. On your, of your manifesto. Of your manifesto that my chairman is referring to. It looks as though chairman has set out to set his own questions and he's answering them. So what does he say? So let's, let's read. Mm. Let's, let me read the preamble. The preamble reads, um, to motivate, to, yes, and that is um, paragraph 7.1.3, capacity building for health, isn't it? So to motivate health workers and provide additional capacity for service provision, the next NDC government will, and let's go to the queue, provide district hospitals in, uh, provide district hospitals in district where there is none. Mm -hmm. That's what this says. Yes, but that amounts, that, you know. That we know, cannot be, but, but do you know, see any 88 there? No. Okay. Read it again, read it again. Okay, let's read it. Provide district hospitals in district where there is none. Where there is none. Good. So listen to How it many me. district hospitals no, do not have No, you are getting, you are getting it wrong. You are, you are get, that's yeah, where you go are, wrong. And that's, you are, you are falling into the same trap. No, they are eight, please, eight, please, please, eight, please, eight, please, eight, please, please, eight, please, 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 please,
we said we're building e-blocks, okay? And the criteria was that we were building, we, are, we were starting with district without, um, what do you call it? District without secondary school. That was the criteria, okay? So if I say that I'm going to build hospitals, but I'm going to build these hospitals in district hospitals, district without district hospitals. That's Have I said I'm going to build all? That's it. it that, does that mean that? You none. read it. It's qualified. It said none. Districts where there are none. None. It's qualified. There are none. Yes. Yes. Listen carefully. So, 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 no, any, no, so, no, so, no, so, none here. No, no, no. There's wait, none wait, here. Wait, the no, first no, two. No, 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 Mr. Kando, Mr. Kando. It says relax, here. Relax, relax, relax. So, relax, so relax. any district no, 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 that no. does not have a district hospital under Joe Mamo. Look at it from this way. Listen, look at it from this way. I am going to build hospitals. In About areas, in areas listen, where they are not. Listen, in listen, districts where they are not. Listen, please, please take, take, take your time. Take your time. This is different from a categorical promise, and I'll get there. This categorical. Oh, who? When you were speaking, Chairman, I kept very quiet. Right. Evans. Yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening. I'm saying that. My manifesto says that. We are going to build district hospitals without giving any number. No. In listen, district hospitals. Oh, oh. In no, Take I, your I'm time quoting. and listen. When no. I finish, you, have, you are the host of the program. No, but we so have, you can come we have in. To, we have to finish your own. I program. am now coming there. I have not even referred to that page. I'm English. starting the preambles. But no. have please, please listen. Dr. Oh, Free, Dr. Free, allow, allow him. Allow him. You, you, you quoted it. You quoted the line. Yes. And, and line, I'm saying that. The line, the line must be complete. <laughs> the line must be complete. Listen. When you first quote, I, I will, I'll come back to the quote. So you listen you to did me. not only say you will build, you told us where. True or false? So, what it means is that this line statement is telling you where those hospitals will be built. Yes. Listen. And he also oh, told us. Yeah, you are making this conversation and, very no, it's difficult. No, it's not. I'm, it's your own promise. And you yes, I'm going us, there. I'm not running away from it. Told us, you're not only telling us where, but you have a criteria for which place you're putting it. Yes. And the criteria says, mm. that place must have none. Yes, that's the criteria. Yes. But does that give you a and, number? And, and it does. And it automatically, How? You, you automatically this must This is very, very simple. You, I, 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 I don't understand I, why I, I A question to you. Tomorrow, Joe Mahama Wayne's election mm -hmm. makes you the health minister mm -hmm. and says, Mr. Kando, implement this policy for mm -hmm. me, which I promised. Mm -hmm to build district hospitals in, in districts where there are none. Mm -hmm. The first thing you will do mm -hmm. when you put your... Mm -hmm. How many districts do we have in this country where there are no hospitals? Yes, fantastic, you are right. And they will tell you mm -hmm. there are 88 yes. districts. But that doesn't mean that build in all the 88. What it tells you is that, Mr. Kando, we are in power. Implement this part of the manifesto. So the first thing I would do is that I have to know the number of district hospitals without hospital. Yes, Fantastic. which is 88. Fantastic. The first thing that must come into mind, which this statement is clear on, is that the fact that you are building hospitals doesn't mean you can build it anywhere at all. So you're saying that, mm. you're, you're also saying what he said, that you tell Joe Mahama that it's not possible to no, build no, 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 all no, districts no, no, where no, they no, are No, 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 that's not what I've said. But you're varying, if, no. you're varying the oh, promise. Oh. I have a lot of points to make. Oh, don't let us waste our time. Let's leave the listeners oh, to judge. I'm also interested please, in the argument. Please, yes. So when we can, we'll, let's you allow me to make the point. But points. we can't confuse the public. And then let's allow the public to also judge okay. from what each and everyone is saying. Okay. So you're and, saying that and, and all, saying although that, you know it's 88. I'm saying that. You're not going to build that, it in all I'm saying that. That's not what I've said. That's not what I've said. Okay. I'm saying that. And listen to what I, I'm going to say carefully. What I am saying is that. The party comes to power. We have to build hospitals. This tells you that you don't build it anyhow. Even if you are building one hospital, build it at a place where there is none. That's a clear directive by this. It doesn't mean that where there, everywhere there is none, there will be hospitals. This is logic. This is very basic mathematics uh, in this. Uh, 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 unfortunately. Very, very, it's very basic. Uh, unfortunately. I don't know why you are, not, you, are not, you, are, you are refusing to understand this. But in any case, in any case, so where Chairman had his 88 is his own problem. No, but the 88, you yourself have said it's 88. Is, I have not said 88. It, I'm saying that it's you a said. It's final number. You said that. You said that. It's a, it's a final number that follows from your promise. It, it wasn't invented. And you agree. I, I just Evans, want you to Evans, clarify that. Evans, you, you, that number wasn't invented. I'm saying that. It is, to it me is a number that follows naturally let's, from let, your promise. Listen to me carefully. Yeah. Again, I am saying that. We have never mentioned any 88 in our, uh, in, 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 our, in our manifesto, okay? And then this statement 
is giving a directive where that those hospices must be built, mm -hmm. and not necessarily all. It didn't, even didn't if you, that. if you, even if that is your addition ten. to the problem. No, but that is what it says. No, it doesn't even, say even, that. Even, even, even if it is ten, make then sure you, you build these hospitals where there is none. That's a variation of. So the you yes, allow let's allow the listeners to judge. Mm -hmm. That is your understanding. Okay. Uh, so, so you think that, but we are saying that. Listen. But, yeah, I mean, I think I think you you you. So I, I, no, I've not finished. So I'm I'm just developing the point. You see, so given the economic hardship in the system, the president indicated right on the floor of the house that he was going to just like you said in the initial stages it was eight, 18 months, okay. Then the president came back to tell us that no, he cannot complete all the eight, uh, 111 hospitals in the 18 months, which the 18 months would have ended 2021, 2022, okay? Then the president said that, I am going to hand over all the 111 hospitals before I hand over as president of Ghana in January 2025. That's what the president said. Okay, now Evans, when we, and again, that, that meeting was chaired by my chairman, when we invited the General 11 Secretariat before the committee to tell us about the General 11, listen to what they said. And this is exactly what Joe Mahama is saying. What did they say? Good. What they said was that they gave us a completion forecast. And the completion forecast they gave us says that they were going to complete 20% of the project in 2024. Listen yes. carefully. They were going to complete 20% uh, of the hospitals in 2025. 2025. They were going to complete the 30% uh, of the project in 2027. Have you heard where it's going to? By the general government secretariat. And then they further told us that they were going to complete the remaining 30% after 2027. They don't even know when it will be completed. And this is a president who stood on the floor of the house and told us that he was going to deliver all the 111 hospitals before he hands over as president. And His Excellency John Germani Mahama is saying that it was overly ambitious. And you are left with eight months. He didn't make this statement at the beginning of 2020. He didn't make this statement in 2021. He didn't make this statement in 2023. President Mahama is making this statement in 2024, where you are left with only eight months to go. And out of the 111 hospital, you have not completed a single one. Hold on, Chairman. Is this document authentic? Um, I'll give it to him. He's, um, uh, yes. He's, um, the rank. He's, yeah, he's, he's, yes. I mean, he sets his own questions. And <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I, I still, I still give, come give back. Give I don't want to confuse. I don't want to confuse. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want He's had a good time to speak. But, 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 but it's, I think, I think, it's important to verify. Me, Evans, it is oh, important yeah. to verify on think, Oh, I have soft copies, I should think. Is so it's on Tetic. Absolutely, I, I, I should think. It's, but the content of his yeah. exposition. But, but, is but not, it's important. It's rather confusing the public. <laughs> and I think we yeah. should. Put we'll, we'll come to the substance, but we'll come to that. But I, I want yeah. to clarify this. I have that they, That the Agenda 111 Secretary told you yeah. that they cannot complete the, all the hospitals mm -hmm. this year. They can't complete it next year. They can't even complete in 2027. Mm -hmm. They can complete it at least 30 percent of that whole 100 percent after 2027. That's that's what they've told you. They didn't say that in the in the in the committee. I mean, as far as completion the forecast. Well, he's, 20 he's of hospital. reading his document. So <laughs> but, but you've <laughs> confirmed the authenticity. Of the well, I, I said to you that I'm not going to contest it. I told you. I said I'm not contesting it. So, and, so and, and I don't want him to set a question for me. <laughs> I mean, the, the public don't also have to But, but fundamentally, that com this the, confirms the, your the, Muhammad's the, point, right? This is a clear behavior of uh, Afan. Uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. It confirms your Mahama that it is unrealistic. You see, by events, this within the see, time that the president said for my, himself. My, my very good friend is succeeded in confusing Let's listen. I would want to <laughs> I want you to give me opportunity. Oh my god. I will. Yeah, thank Except you. Except that this confirms Mohammed's point. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't, doesn't conclude. I mean, but I'll take it like that. I'll come I back mean, again. It's it's I, I, I stand on my point that John Mahama have no basis to have attacked President Kufuado for being over ambitious. Indeed, I still stand by that. If he does that, he's been inconsistent and it means that he doesn't believe in his own manifesto. And the NDC manifestos are nothing to write home about. It's just the scripted things, they don't believe in it. If he actually believed in it, you will see that Agenda 
111 has some sub, it's a sub, what he, ha, he, what he wanted to do is a subset of what President Kufado is doing. He wants to complete district hospitals in areas that has none, and there are 88 of them that has none. He also stated that he will build in P, he said, construct regional hospitals in the six new regions and the western region. I don't think that kind of means that he wants to construct one or two. It is categorical statement, close-ended. And therefore, he is going to do, and that is part of Agenda 101 anyway, they are doing six new regional hospitals and the Western Region 1. He also stated that he's going to build, provide district hospital aid, establish two national infectious disease centers. Absolutely, he is doing 96. And he is telling Leonardo for being over ambitious, this he should not go scot-free. We need to learn something in this election here. Obviously, your platform is very authentic. Don't just say things. Probably times are gone where you could say things and go away. The kind of journalists we have, the kind of Ghana we have now, you cannot just do that. Before you say that, people can easily find the facts and cross-check you. So it's a lesson to all those who are leading political parties in this election. Don't just speak. Be prepared to defend what you have done, and that de defines you. Otherwise, people would put a finger on you and identify you as lying or a liar. And that document was full of lies. Now, having put that aside, that I vehemently oppose to his assertion, and that is not true. Then I come to my good friend. He said that the Ministry of Health had standard hospitals. Indeed, Evans, I'm challenging you today. If you say the Ministry of Health has standard hospitals, go design. ask them what is a standard hospital standard design. for standard designs for hospitals. Go ask them what is the standard design for a regional hospital. It is nowhere near what is rich hospital or Accra hospital. Nowhere near. So do you think Joe Mahama was over ambitious to have gotten a modern American hospital of a certain, of which people would glorify it now, the phase one? Tomorrow, we are prepared to come to your show again. I'm challenging you. Mm -hmm. Let the Ministry of Health give you what it has as a prototype of original. It got now, it's nowhere near it. Nowhere near it. So why do we come and say a certain Ajayev design hospitals and the kind of hospitals they are putting everywhere is very uh, ultramolding, so different a style of which you will see, ah, really, it's a different thing. It's not like that mediocre, small thing that they build everywhere. It's so different. So please, if we are moving forward as a country, let's move forward. But let's not impugn people's integrity with what we think it should have been and not what it is. Indeed, we should respect what others are doing. Now, for the issue of family and friends, I so much disagree with Kamina. I mean, please, don't do that. What is the issue of family and friends? The people came to the committee. Some of them have not started. Because of land litigation issues, Bantama, Bantama, they have mobilized money for contractors go on site because of the timelines. So government gave mobilization. Some contractors held it. They explained to us that the consultants have they've not even used it because they have not gone on site because just before you go on site, there's litigation on the land. And these are few of them, about 10 to 15 percent of them. That is not the doing of the president, neither is it the doing of the secretariat. It is just because natural litigation on land in this country, making your own project to execute so difficult, is what has set it back. Should we blame President Ekufuado for this? When everybody listening to me that in this country, there is that obvious problem of land litigation that can draw you back to decades and centuries for simple projects that you should execute. And if they have not done that, they are not the friends who have been giving money to go and squander. And for that matter, they've not done that. Let us look at the problem and tackle it. That's why Bantima, they have just started Bantima. It was mm -hmm. land litigation issue. But, but they went around. I remember when they went around with the journalists. I, 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 I called you. And what they found was some of the hospitals that indeed mobilization is happening. He was right. I mean, our, our reporter confirmed it. Had not started. Some of them. So I can give you an update as of now. As of now. Yeah. Now also, in terms of the 1.9 billion, I don't know where you got it. Uh, I 1.9. It's just down. I, to, the, the president gave a figure. Yeah. At the time that he cut the. Story. Yes, but as of now, it's about 1.56 billion. 
what has um, changed? Yes, 1.5. As far as, well, um, probably um, um, I'm sure um, we, would, we would put it in this regard. Um, if, if no, um, I am talking about some of the projects in terms of six, the six regional hospitals and the Western Region one. A cost us external, external funding. Mm -hmm. External funding. And you cannot incorporate it into this now because it based upon IF, IMF and the way forward, external crediting. Now, the remaining now that we are holding dear to it is, going, is coming from the ABFA. That's 20% of it is allocated. As of now, they've raised about 400 and something million dollars to them. And it's dedicated funding. Mm. So we've taken the new regional hospitals, including the Accra Psychiatry Hospital, which is also external funding. That is why what we have is relatively lesser, and that is dedicated funding from the ABFA. ABFA fund is funded as a coming from the oil fields. Mm. And so long as it hits it, it is 20% is released to them. And this is our own money. Mm. You can decide to go and collateralize it and get huge money and complete Agenda 111. That, that is not what we are doing as a country. Mm. We just want to take the money as it comes. You yeah, but I wanted to respond to that. the findings yeah. they, dis they made when they went around the country where hospitals under Agenda 111 that had mobilization already had not started. So do you want me to also update you as of now what successes they've done in their zones? In areas tremendous, where they discovered tremend that mobilization had happened and work had not started? Yes, tremendous improvement. Given and that orders that as of... Um, um, I've, I've, I've been to a couple of them. I've been to a couple of them. Um, just about a hunter one, for instance, was about 50% completed as of last year, August. But the work is happening. As I'm speaking now, they are fitting, they fitted air conditioning. They are now putting equipment. Equipment. So you might check your news tomorrow that I'm sure by the you next said a moment, hunter. Yes. They are going we will to go there. there tomorrow to check. Get, I have pictures here. You want to see it? Uh, well, that, no, yes. that, that's not a problem. We can verify okay, that. Okay, that's fine. I Just go if, if and I verify. So we can verify it, is, it is projects ongoing, rapidly ongoing, okay? And this is not for you people say, if you go today and they are at this point, you go the next month, they'll be at the same place. But, but, that is why but I'm also prepared to update you I, now. More substantively, yeah. do you have the holistic picture on where we are with all the district hospitals that about, you about About now, the, the sites that are very active are 90 sites. Yeah, there are various stages of completion. Yes, 90 sites are active. If you go today, you see that there are various stages and okay. they are on. And it is, it is the expectation of, by the Secretariat that by close to December, it should be able to be done with about 56 or 60, about 60 or 50, between 50 to about 60 of them. Hospitals. Should be completed and ready to use. But, yes. but, but, but that, itself, that itself tells you that as a yeah. country, we have achieved a lot. Okay. But, and but universal access to healthcare. But for the, for the avoidance like the of doubt. one that you be in a crowd. For the, for the avoidance and of doubt, and I'll take a break on this. For the right. avoidance of oh, doubt. Right. But I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Don't worry. Okay. We'll make your notes. For the avoidance of doubt, the all 111 hospitals will not be completed by January 7th. Yes, I think so. I'll take it. When I return, I'll hear his thoughts on this. Yes, I mean, I think so that that is that has been settled. Uh, and so and so, where, where are we getting the funding from? Stay with me. Thank you for staying with us here on PMS West. We were talking about the, the biggest policy intervention in health as far as this government is concerned to build 811 hospitals. Uh, just before the break, we got clarity on the subject of uh, doing all 111 within the time that this current president has is simply impossible. It can be done now, but the estimates, as according to the chairman, is that maybe 50 or 60 will be done. Um, and, and Mr. Mr. Kando, that, 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 that you don't disagree with. I don't even know why we are here and splitting hairs over this issue. Basically, what His Excellency John Dramani Mahama is saying is what this document has said and is what the chairman has said. Mm. John Mahama simply said that given the economic condition we find ourselves, given the time limit where we are, 
and the number of projects the president says he will do is overly ambitious. Mm. That I is mean, what we have we, all we, agreed. We've mitigated that enough here. That, no, no, but let's establish yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that, that, we have all talk. agreed no, that. So he does not even stand in the right of place to say that. Yeah, I mean, no, Muhammad, why are you not allowing me? We are going back to the, to the beginning of the show. Why are you only four years? Let's, let's make progress. You said we do 96 hospitals. Mr. Kando, a very... So we have agreed that... A very important... No, Muhammad is coming for only four years, so he has only four years. Chairman and ranking, chairman and ranking. Uh, Mr. Kando, let, let me ask a question. We just have a few minutes to wrap up. Give me, give me the, oh, no, no wrap no, up. No, we, 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 we have three minutes. We have three minutes. Then let me make my point. That is why you, when so you're this, going, I was drawing one, attention please, to please, it. Please, please, yes. this one, we have all agreed on it. He hasn't said... No, you, you're still repeating. Go. You're repeating your point. Yes, I'm making your point. So that, I disagree. Yes. But you see, it's your more, importantly, yeah. more importantly, this is a man who, in the history of Ghana, when it comes to health infrastructure, nobody can beat him. Like... Like what the man who has constructed a great hospital, oh. the man who has seen the expansion of police hospital, mm. the Maritime Hospital, the University of Ghana Hospital, mm. the 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 Ghana uh, is not Accra. Please, please. And access to okay, Ghana uh, uh, no, no, is now not Accra. I'm going Accra. It was Accra. only Dodo. The man who has seen Kumaru, which of them? No. Now who it was only the, Dr. Now, the man who I'll come to you to make your point. I'll come to you to make a point. Gary was not today. Dr. Free, I'll come to you to make a point. My chairman was in Accra. My chairman is ranking. Ranking proceed. Mr. Chairman, I'll come to you. I'll come to you to make your point. So this is the man who has seen the construction of the Bekwai. A hospital who has seen the 130 bed uh, hospital, maritime hospital, oh. the completion of the Bronga Harpo Regional Hospital, about 1,260 chip compounds, a, uh, the Kompanoche Eye Care Center, five polyclinics in Upper West, that is uh, Wuchao, uh, Babie, Bulinsi, Ko, Han. You go to. Those were all um, completed by the MPs. Um, um, Five polyclinics in the northern region. Did he? Oh, it, this is scary. Mr. Kando. No, 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 no. Don't go there. Don't go there. Mr. Kando. This is a man. Did he the complete? The hospitals are yes. Complete. All these hospitals I'm talking about. It is not true. Most of them. It is not true. Not up to complete. It is not good. Okay, so he's admitted. He's admitted. He's admitted. Some of them. Where at some a, 80 percent of no, what he is computer is he's, 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 he's admitted that not all, not, not all. all, and I have all of them for here. For example, for me, I have all of them here. For me, was about 85 percent complete, and seven years down the lane, for me, has not been completed. Yeah. Kumahu District Hospital, that is done. Uh, Bepai, no, is that Bepai was more than Bepai is I, 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 need, I need to wrap up on this. You are you convinced, and though? So are you convinced, if though? If Muhammad says he will build hospitals, yeah. nobody, okay. nobody okay. can doubt like him. Well, like but, but, but we are saying that you like are the, only making promises. Like making promises. Like promise okay. Like okay. Like the euro judge that the Dr. Free, no, it's okay. Let, let, let me hear. Let me hear for one minute so we can wrap up. He built more than ten polyclinics. I would have to close. I will have to close if all of you are at the same time. So, let me hear him. So, right, you if you are going to give a promise, so it's my turn. And it's his turn. So, let me so hear him. You can, it will come back to my turn. No, it will. Why? The time because is up. That is his turn. So it's my turn. I will close. So it's his turn. I will close and deprive both of you your time. So I must have my turn. You no, know, the time is up. Let so me hear him. Yeah, How? The He's talking a bit. Let me hear him. The Eurojet so, Hospital, uh -huh. six of them, they didn't touch. They politicized it, they stayed it as it is. We came since 2008. Which hospital did you do? The Eurojet Hospitals. Which ones? You didn't do what? You didn't do. Any of them say we are. You, you, hey, you, hey, you, hey! You didn't please, do please, any of them. Please, uh, uh, please stop that. Stop all that. The, stop, all of the Eurojet that, ones, you that, abandoned. That, I that, even that, said that. it on the floor of Parliament. You did not. Now let me also move forward. We have come to complete <laughs> their projects. And then you see a government that believes in the fact that you don't all do these projects we are talking about. We have don't do secure funding. funding. Okay. You, you, and, and you didn't have secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just making promises without the secure funding. You were just the Address this question for me. Okay, which one? The 50 or 60 you say you're confident they'll finish. Yeah. Is there dedicated funding for yes, it? For the, ABFA. For ABFA. Okay. Convinced? That is not true. We need more than $1.7 billion oh, to complete this project. No, 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 no. Oh, He's talking about the argument. Uh, how much is he available? How much he, is it available you see, that they, you see, they are going to use to complete? Then, then I come back to the NMS issue. It is not true. There's okay. no secure funding. You should show us in the budget the, okay. where the, we have the funding the, to secure. The, 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 okay. the NMS to, to the finance NMS, it. It's the not true. NMS, uh, when they appeared, the they said they had distributed to us. It's okay. It's okay. Did not grant 
and LC to complete it. Are you talking about LC? use all the money on Dodo. And that was for five hospitals. That is NDC for you. The question is the MPP Do you have the secured funding to complete the whole project? The answer is no. I want to read a document you authenticated about the funding. The, the projections was to complete the 25%, an estimated amount of $300 million will be required to support this household. Yes. And if we don't have the 300 million in our budget, he says, oh, but you have raised 400 million. Okay. In which budget? They have given it to them. In uh, which budget? We're talking about right. November 200 and something. They've released yeah. several tranches to them. So <laughs> even when you add the one in the 2024 Papa, budget, Eva, it doesn't even add up to 400 Thank you. Thank you. Thank Are you going to make a news out of this tomorrow? That's not well, true. Call them. Call the secretariat and find how, how much money. I am talking about the budget. documents well, available to us. I'm grateful. The budget. I'm grateful that both of you. I'm speaking to the budget. I'm speaking to the budget. I'm speaking to the budget. I'm grateful that both of you joined me. It's a dedication. And thank you for joining us too. Enjoy the rest of your evening.
is important. It's the only way you get to know the things that happen around you, what affects you today and the future. At Joy News, we have reporters scattered around the country who tell us about the communities they live in, the people and their stories. The key part of our job here at Joy News is to make clearer the muffled voices in every part of society. We shine light on the issues. My name is Aisha Ibrahim, and this is Joy News. Independent, credible, and fearless. My name is Albert Sori in the Upper East Regional Capital, Bolgatanga. And this is Joy News, independent, fearless, credible. I am Anna Sabit on the principal streets of the Chiman, and this is Joy News, independent, fearless, and credible. <laughs> In Ghana, when there's a fire, people are more likely to call a radio station than a fire station. They believe the media will succeed where our institutions have failed. That is a huge responsibility for any journalist to shoulder. Thankfully, at Joy News, we are more than journalists. We are agents of development. We are champions of change. We don't just report. Hey, hello and welcome to Joy News Today. My name is Kenneth Jesse. We are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, Garden City Special School in darkness. Five weeks and counting over 66,000 Ghana cities indebtedness to the electricity company of Ghana. We bring you details as they appeal to the ECG to turn on the light. It's been hell. I will say it that way because I've been running up and down from their office, regional office to the district office. Also ahead today, minority in parliament accused government of violating the constitution in the distribution of funds to the district assembly common fund. Basic schools in the La Dadikotopo municipality still in ruins 10 months after its roofing was ripped off by rainstorm. More as the pupils reel under the severe conditions affecting their academic work. We have details of these and many other stories coming up in the next hour. Don't go anywhere. <music> You're welcome to the program. The electricity company of Ghana, as part of its revenue mobilization drive, has disconnected power to the Garden City Special School in the Ashanti region. The school for disabled children under the Ghana Education Service has been in darkness for over five weeks for failing to pay a debt of 66,000 Ghana cities to the power distributor. Authorities at the school want ECG to connect them to electricity grid while awaiting payment from the government. Nana Bwachi Yadam visited the school and filed this report. Students and school authorities are frustrated as they have been plunged into darkness for five weeks now over debt owed to the Electricity Company of Ghana. The situation has adversely affected academic activities and boarding on the campus of the Garden City Special School at Asakori Mampo. Students are forced to spend several hours outside their rooms at night due to the heat. This is making it difficult for academic work to progress. The headmistress of the school, Rosalind Frimpawe Japon, is worried about the situation. It's been hell. I will say it that way. Because I've been running up and down from their office, regional office, to the district office. They asked me to make letters. I did the letter. I sent it to the district office. I went there. 
to follow up with the letter and I was told it has been endorsed and taken to the region. I went to the region because I wanted to meet the regional director and explain to him that, yes, we owe, we know. We know the school owes ECG. But these are children who are vul vulnerable. And this particular term is been a bit hard for us in the school because with the male's dormitory, the roof got ripped off. So they are sleeping in the classrooms. And for them sleeping in the classroom and no lights, I mean, it means some of them will not sleep. The school depended on a power generator, which also broke down. The headmistress says the school is yet to receive money from the government to settle the utility bills. As at now, ECG says, until we pay, they will not put the light on for us. But where are we getting the money to pay? Nobody pays school fees here. We don't do any IGF here. So where do we get the money? So until government releases feeding grant to the school, it means we don't have any money. We won't have any money. So are we, continue, are we going to continue sleeping in darkness? At the, this is administration block. Work is on standstill. William Amankra is the educational director at the Asakori Mampo municipality. He's equally worried about the situation. Them if they could come and restore the power because of the nature of the children up to now. And this mass disconnection, ECG staff, they've been doing this almost everywhere. Individual houses, companies, some government institutions and the rest. But we are very much concerned because of the nature of the children, special children. And when there is no light, their condition is worst. You see, their issues are triggered by light or darkness. That's why we are so much concerned. Rosalind Frimpong was pleading with the ECG to restore power as the school plans to settle their debt when their funds are delivered. Whatever it is, the bill will be paid. But how can we continue to let these children sleep in darkness? Yesterday, they killed two scorpions near where the boys are sleeping. What if they enter the room and they buy somebody's child? How will we explain it? A difficult moment here for the students at the Garden City Special School as they are being forced to sleep in darkness and intense heat. Some of the students here at their dormitory would have to be staying out for quite some time to get fresh air because their rooms are hot. The headmistress of the school is pleading with the electricity company to turn on their light as they make way to pay their debt. For your news, my name is Nana Mwachitankwe Yadom. Kumasi. Well, still with the power distributor, the ECG is coughing up several thousands of U.S. dollars as the company begins emergency maintenance to restore power to affected communities. The activities of suspected criminals are causing power outages in some communities in the Ashanti region. Ohim Interior has more. The miscreants are targeting bulls and knots, holding the base of high-tension towers belonging to the electricity company of Ghana. In one of such operations, Thieves cost eight towers. We came this morning to see that the towers holding the lines have fallen. Eight of them, eight of them have fallen on the ground. And in last night, um, this happened. So it's, in fact, it happened last night during the rainfall. And we came to sites. We came to sites and realized that the cause of them falling were as a result of some boat and not being removed some members which have been removed um, from the base up to a level of about three meters from the base have been removed and these are structures that were intentionally built every component is necessary in the construction so if you remove the boat and not and the members you compromise the integrity so yesterday during the heavy windstorm our line tripped we tried again and it didn't hold so this morning as we we're hunting for the cause of the outage we came and realized that eight of our towers are on the ground. And the course is basically some parts have been removed from the base. Basically, the boat and and the members. And this affected power supply. The situation is not only a dent on the operations of ECG, but also a financial constraint on the strained resources. The ECG was spent at least $1.2 billion 
on maintenance works alone. Engineer Kofi Fletcher again. The cost alone, we are saying not less than one million, one million dollars in the construction. The time for the construction alone, we may go almost by a month. This is just even one of the many vandalism around. Um, our, our transformers, which are even in circuit on the post, have been toppled to the ground to even steal some part of, of it. Our RMUs, we go around, our RMUs have even been exposed. Some parts of the equipment, the one that are mounted at the ground, have been exposed. People are just picking some petty part of it. But you see, the petty part of it that you pick, that doesn't fetch you much. The whole equipment is damaged. So we just entreat the public that if you see anybody around this equipment, suspiciously, kindly report. Our, our number is uh, 0302 -611 -611. So what does this mean to customers in affected areas? We are showing our customers that though it is a blow to us, customers, the impact on customers may not be felt that much because we are reconfiguring the network to put everybody on supply. Meanwhile, officials of ECG have lodged a complaint with the Ghana Police Service while working around the clock to follow... The general manager rightly said, it's not just a whistle that this is just affected. It's not like a one-off thing. It's a menace that is gradually gaining momentum in our country region because we realize that if an area of consumer is an outage, by the time we get the realize that our consumer is on the ground has been damaged, the important equipment like copper windings, the boots and not have been removed. Sometimes even the RMS units have been removed as well. And once these activities are, these items are removed, these customers will not be able to get power supplies. So we realize that the interest of the few people who are more or less like trying to damage our equipment will end up causing an outage for a lot of people. We have uh, reported the incident to the Ghana Police Service. We are also going to speak to the NIB, NIB National Security, among others. Because, like you said, where our towers are parked, this is like I said, a 3,000 volt network. We can't bring it to the center of town. Because imagine if this pylon was in the center of town and the cables were damaged or the cables got to the ground. Imagine anybody within that vicinity could have been able to speak there. So we are also happy that in terms of safety, there is no casualty result, uh, reported from the general public and then from the ECG side as well. So it's because of safety reasons and then where we can get corridors. That is why these pylons are located in the outskirts of the major town. But then we need the support because as you know, rightly said, there are farmers within that area. So if it is your farm produce that you are guarding, you're able to guard it very well. To see the ECG asset as your own asset because ECG is a state institution. It that belongs to the state, belongs to all of us. So let us come together to help protect ECG installation. Because once we protect the installation, it will increase our chances of keeping the lights on. Yesterday, it wasn't because we had an alternative route. Because imagine the line was what we call a radial line, i.e., a one way line. These people would have been off until that one month that will restore all the eight hours back to the mm. national grid. But thankfully, it was a ring system, so we were able to supply some of them for community access as well. And as we speak, no customer is off. Well, news just coming in indicates that the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAT, have embarked on an indefinite strike with immediate effect. Let's read portions of their statement they released to you. And it says, we have assembled you here this morning to help carry our message and sentiments to the authorities that be at the Ministry of Education, the Ghana Education Service, and all who care about the education enterprise in the country. In recent times, we, the pre-tertiary teacher unions, NAT, NAGRAT, and the CCTGH have raised our voices over and over again on the following issues with the employer and asked for resolution, failure of which we hinted advice in ourselves. So these are the reasons why they are going on strike. One is the delay with negotiation of the collective agreement. Two is the scheme of service, which they say they have drawn the attention of their director general of GES to the fact that the Ghana Education Service does not have a functional scheme of service for teachers. And then if we can see the third reason why they're going on strike. So this just happened, news just coming in. The third reason is that equally important to the teachers are the following issues. And they've listed it there. Let's get onto the telephone lines right now and speak to the chairman of NAT, Isaac Ousu. Uh, Mr. Ousu, welcome to the program. We've outlined some of your reasons for going on strike, but really, tell us the basis for it. Well, uh, let me say a very good afternoon to your cherished uh, viewers and listeners as well. Right. right. And as, as you rightly read our press 
that we just released today. Okay. okay. Uh, we, the Free Tertiary Teacher Union, not Nigeria PCC, we believe that the leadership, the employer, i.e. the government, is not being fair to us. And as leaders, we cannot sit down for our members to be accusing us, uh, thinking that maybe we are even the best in government. One, the issue of our collective agreement has a spy. And uh, per the arrangement, February this year, the negotiations should have completed. We have been the attention of the employer. Until this, they have not said anything. For the delay in the supply of the teacher's laptop, the contract was signed in November 2020. My brother, we are entering into the fourth year now. And to this, not all the teachers in the country have received the laptop. And this and other many more that we feel that we cannot sit aloof for our members to be signed day in, day out. So in view of that, we send notice to the employer for the past three weeks. Uh, the three weeks has elapsed, and we didn't hear anything from the employer. We've equally sent uh, copies of the notice to the Labor Commission. And so we believe that we have followed the due process, and in view of that today, we are telling all our members across the country to stay at home effective today. Mm, you've mentioned the negotiation or the delay in the negotiation of the collective agreement. What really is that collective agreement you talk about? Yes, the collective agreement is a contractual agreement that governs the employer and the employee, our relationship, as to uh, our working relations. Right. right. If there is any allowances, uh, leave, motion, and what have you. That is what we are referring to our collective agreement. Right. right. At, the at, the at the beginning, at the beginning, at the beginning of this of year, year, government, government increased, increased the salary, the salary of, of. Can you hear me? Hello, Hello Mr. Isaac, Isaac Owusu. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We seem to have lost him on the telephone lines there, but we'll try and reconnect and get back to him to give us more information about their latest strike, uh, which they are embarking with immediate effect. Well, let's move to Parliament now, because the minority in the House are accusing government of breaching the constitution of the country and the recent Supreme Court rulings in the distribution of funds to the District Assembly's Common Fund. The minority and some majority MPs have been up in arms against the Finance Ministry in recent times over the delay in releasing funds for development at the local level. According to the deputy ranking member on the local government committee, Benjamin Kudu, government owes the district assembly's common fund billions of cities and has also refused to comply with the law to release money to the fund on a quarterly basis. We here and we appear to be simply interested in approving the formula approving the formula, but when the administrator is gone, the Ministry of Finance determines what to do with the, 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 the Secretariat. The problem is that the Ministry of Finance has been violating the Constitution. Article 2522 2 clearly states that the disbursement should be done on a quarterly basis quarterly basis, then they were not doing it, they decided to cap the, the fund, we went to court, the Supreme Court took time to give rulings, but aside of violating the constitution, the Ministry of Finance has refused to also observe or obey the ruling of the, the, the Supreme Court. For instance, as we sit here now, the, the Common Fund is being owed some 3.5 billion Ghana cities over the past uh, two years. And for 2023, the debt again has risen by another 3 billion. So I don't know where the Ministry of Finance is keeping the money meant for the, uh, this Assembly's Common Fund. We stay a while in the House of Legislature because the whole central MP also says the finance ministry unlawfully removes some revenues like the mineral royalties in computing total revenues of the state to deduct district assemblies common fund from. In computing total revenues, they have 
deliberately taken out some important revenue handles from the total revenue. For instance, the Ministry of Finance is keeping mineral royalties out of the definition of total revenue, which is wrong. It's against the, the ruling of the Supreme Court. So ro mineral royalties are not included in the total revenue computed for the purpose of determining how much is due to the uh, this assembly's common fund. The speaker has referred this matter to the finance committee for uh, uh, inquiry, but all attempts to get the Ministry of Finance to come and answer to this question have failed. The Ministry of Finance will never appear for any inquiry to be done. That's why things are like this. In fact, I often say that the biggest enemy, I don't know why the Ministry of Finance hates Common Fund. The biggest enemy to the Common Fund Secretariat is the Ministry of Finance. They don't want to make it prosper. I don't know why. But the entire country, all the assemblies depend on the disassemblies common fund. In fact, in fact, there are some assemblies which don't have any means of uh, internally generated funds. So they depend on the disassemblies common fund. But the, the Ministry of Finance, through some certain means, is refusing to release the funds to them. The Finance Ministry has been responding to these accusations. I want to put on record that, Mr. Speaker, Yes, we do owe common funds some allocation, some areas, and we are working very hard to make sure we pay those monies. But I want to also put on record that we haven't um, defaulted or we haven't gone against the, the Supreme Court's ruling. That is a fact and that I should put on the, on the table. We have come to Finance Committee to explain how we arrived at we arrive at the revenue numbers for DACF. So I just want to put that on, on the table that we haven't gone against the ruling of the Supreme Court. But I want to assure the House that we work together to make sure we clear any outstandings that we have with the um, DACF. My, my colleague on the other side also mentioned the fact that some um, assemblies, municipalities, and metropolitans don't have any form of IGF. But that is also incorrect. I mean, for the property rates, they are, they are homes or houses in every constituency, every municipal and every um, district. And we expect that they work together with the various authorities to help raise those needs as well. But that notwithstanding, we we'll work and make sure we clear the outstanding as, government is, as is expected of government. Let's stay a while in Parliament and speak to our resident correspondent, Kuku Asante, who is joining us via Zoom. Kuku, what has been happening in the House today? Kindly unmute your microphone so we can hear you. Expected to go on Easter break today, and there are a number of key business that the House had to do today because it's the last day. For instance, the ministerial nominees of President Nekufado I expected to come to the floor for a vote today. About more than 10 of them that were nominated by the president, the ministers, and the deputies. Early on, the minority at the appointment committee have said they were not going to vote for those persons. That would have meant that each and every one of them would have been subject to a secret vote on the floor. But we understand some consensus has been reached, and then this will be a vote by consensus. This will be a voice vote. There's also an outstanding 150 million Ghana city uh, loan that government is seeking to contract. We expect that. Today being the last day for this particular meeting, that loan agreement will also come to the floor for a vote. And so there are key business that the House is expected to do before they go on break. The Speaker of Parliament has been away for a while, and we understand he's back in town, and may make some comments about the President and the conduct of the, the, the Secretary to the President in writing to the clerk, warning him against trying to transmit to the president those documents. So today is the last day, and we expect that the parliament will get away some of this key business before they proceed on Easter break. Kukwa Sante is our parliamentary affairs correspondent. Thank you very much. Now, classroom blocks at Manle Dada and African Unity Basic Schools in the La Dadi Kotopon municipality are still in ruins 10 months after its roofing was ripped off by a rainstorm. Pupils say they are unable to undertake specialized subjects 
like computing and practicals because the facility is no longer fit for such a purpose. In spite of the promise by the La Dadikotopon Municipal Assembly to fix the situation within three months, it appears this promise is becoming a pipe dream. Joy News' is Ramat Bashir visited the place and has filed the following report. It's been almost 10 months when no roof over a 13-unit classroom block at the Africa Unity Basic School and Manli Dada Basic School in the La Dadikotopon Municipal Assembly. The roofs were completely destroyed following a downpour in May 2023. The pupils now compete for space with the hot scorching rays from the sun. But as the rainy season beckons, the fate of over 500 pupils now hang in a balance. The grim reality of having to stay home when the rain setting lingers on their minds. Hannah Aitonam Gavo is the head girl prefect of Manli Dada Basic School. She says the situation has begun taking a toll on the academic work of her colleagues. And the academic work of the students now is coming down because when sometimes it rains, it leaks inside the room here and we don't get time to learn to because if it's raining, we all pack ourselves and sit one side. Both Manidada and African Unity are still in the same classroom and different different teachers. So maybe if Manidada is having a lesson and Af African Unity is having a lesson, the teachers can confuse. The regular classroom stream has been collapsed into one unit. Aside from the congestion they are currently dealing with, they are unable to pay attention while lessons are underway. It's become a reason why some pupils are absenting themselves from school. If it is raining too, all the students must pack themselves at one side before we be comfortable. And all, even uh, the class we are, it's because of the rain. We can't even learn well. And even the sun is scorching too much. They can't even sit in the class. It's scorching us too much. We are not feeling comfortable because um, whilst the teacher, the uh, Maledada uh, school teacher is coming to teach, and whilst our school, uh, our teacher too is coming to teach, it will be confused. Okay, for me, I'm striving to learn very hard because when it rains, we can't, we cannot concentrate on what the teacher is teaching on. And so we all have to go to another class to uh, purchase this, you know, so that we can, when the rain stops, we can come and then learn. I feel sad because when the rain falls, it destroys our books that we used to learn. So we don't get enough book, enough books so that we can learn with it. For the head teachers of these institutions, cost sharing of classrooms, libraries and restrooms a major nightmare they have had to contend with on a daily basis. A timetable for two schools merged into one when it shouldn't be the case. We are having congestion in the classroom because two schools coming together as one was problematic. Um, furniture was also another. Um, how to draw a timetable for the various teachers to go to class to teach, the teachers managing our resources very well was a bit challenging. The situation is unbearable. It's un uncomfortable, it's unpleasant. It retards teaching and learning. Instead of progressing, you see them retrogressing. So sometimes getting information from different teachers becomes very difficult. The Municipal Director of Education at LADMA, Habiba Kotoma, is blaming the slow pace of work on resource constraints. She is confident with the intervention of stakeholders and some companies that situation will soon be resolved. The fact that uh, the cost is so much, the first company that came on board was not able to complete it last year for us. Then um, we have a current company in place that came forward willingly and asked if they could support any of our schools in distress. And the MCE agreed and handed over 
African unity. We, we are hoping that the, this current company will work faster and get African unity uh, back on its feet. Then uh, the Gen Ghanaian child in La can go back into their normal classroom. Curious to find out the cause of the delay, Joy News visited the head of works for LIFMA, engineer Ben Debra. He stated that the budget for the project is yet to be disbursed, but was hopeful that work will be completed in three months when funds are allocated. Beginning of the year, we prepare our budget and we implement our budget based on what has been put in a gift miss. When we say gift miss, you understand. So every payment that is not in the gift miss, it will not be honored. So this year is the implementation year. Come in, in three months, um, you see the, the final stages of, of the work. Despite assurances from the Ladade Kotopo Municipal Assembly to repair the damaged classroom block, the situation remains dire impeding academic activities and depriving students of the right to quality education. Ramat Bashiru's report for Joy News. Two other stories this afternoon. Vice President and flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mohamed Obamia, says there's a need to do business differently and that is what he is committed to doing. Interacting with members of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Accra, Dr. Baumia reiterated the need to lower interest rates to create an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. We need to be very tax competitive. We need to be able to bring interest rates down for businesses to be able to function. You are competing, you are borrowing at 32% and your competitor in another country is borrowing at 5%. Abin issue, you've lost the game. You are, you are not competitive. So we need to understand that and be able to bring, uh, we need stability in the exchange rate and also a lot of predictability and reasonableness on the import duties that we pay as a country. And I think the president just mentioned about our neighboring Togo, for example and how we are losing containers to Togo because we are more expensive uh, in terms of import duty than Togo. I, I will uh, comment on, 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 on that. Utilities are another issue. So it was really heartwarming listening to the president and the proposals that the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry is making for us to consider in this matter. Return from the break with the latest in business. Across Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with the one purpose, to create and share opportunities to grow. tomorrow built by our dreams and our energy across our continent across the world we are creating a better way to a better future a pan-african future together echo bank a better way a better africa when i was young I asked my mother the secret of her vitality and health. She said, the right food, the right exercise, the right amount of sleep, and the right blood tonic. 
Nescofa Blood Tonic is effective for the treatment of anemia, lack of appetite, and stressful conditions in both adults and children. Nescofa Blood Tonic, the right family blood tonic. Another quality product from Ernest Chemists. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Hi, welcome to business. My name is Daryl Powell. Ghana's economy recorded a 2.9% gross domestic product growth rate in 2023, stronger than the revised 1.5% by the finance ministry. The growth rate is lower than the 3.1% recorded in 2022. According to data from the Ghana Statistical Service, the services sector contracted by negative 1.2%. It however remains the biggest size of the economy Government statistician Professor Samuel Kobne-Nim said the last quarter of 2023, however, recorded a higher growth rate of 3.8% driven by the oil and gas subsector. This is the first time in more than a year that Ghana recorded a higher growth rate in oil GDP. In other news, some UK higher education alumni have called for policy reforms in the education sector to improve the quality of students and research output. At a British Council Alumni UK Roundtable session, we discussed a report by, uh, to assess the activities and impact of UK alumni in Ghana. Some alumni noted that since a, a country's socioeconomic development is heavily linked to the quality of results produced by its education system, there is a need to pay critical attention to the sector. Here's more in this report. The Alumni UK Roundtable and Networking Cocktail, organized by the British Council, aims to bring together UK alumni from various industries in Ghana to facilitate connections and knowledge sharing. One of the highlights of the event was a panel discussion on an upcoming report that highlights the fact 
tells the motivations behind the post-study engagement of Ghanaians who have studied at UK higher education institutions. Naomi Balfoje, a research and product associate at Confidant, the research partner of the project, shed more light on this. The feedback we are getting is that the UK education is really, really making some good impacts in Ghana and people are applying their knowledge in various fields. Um, people in business are applying critical thinking um, in education. People are engaging more with their students so that they can uh, implement the, the good things they learned about how their lecturers related with them to make education easier for them. And so the output of this study will inform the type of um, support that they can give to the alumni. Um, so if somebody is already in education, what kind of support can British Council give to them to make sure that they are making more impact? Sherry Bim Amenado, an alumnus of Robert Gordon University, explains the benefits of UK higher education on socioeconomic development. UK education students focus on the person. So I think equity and quality is equity and quality challenge. So I think clearly that's been one of the most standout things for me where you experience education that's more tailored to you. You have time to speak to a professor. You go to a professor's office, speak about something you are passionate about, and he listens to you. It's his job. He's being accessed. But you know, the numbers in Ghana do not augur well for, especially when we find ourselves in an era where we also want to educate a large number of people. I think the UK progressively over the years have done have gone past that stage. So maybe for where we are, that's what is working, but that's also the striking difference. Regarding the improvement of standards in the Ghanaian education system, John Nani, a member of Alumni UK, commended the British Council for their efforts and called for more partnerships to ensure same. It's great that we are doing these exercises to get information and um, see how best we can help our educational system here in Ghana. Much is left to be desired when you look at the kind of education that's in the UK and then the kind of education that we have here. Um, I think um, it's a good initiative and it should be promoted and it should be helped. And that's it for this segment. Uh, sports is up next here on GN Today. Do stay with us. Daddy, Daddy, <sighs> this tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see F-I-N-T-E-S, Vincent. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil us. That's not true. But why? Hey! <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Let's do sports now on Joy News today with me, Muftaru Nabila. 
Abdullah, Ghana's 100 meters record holder, Benjamin Azamati, was unsuccessful in his attempts to win a gold medal for a country in the men's 100 meters that happened at the Legon Sports Stadium on Tuesday. Uh, the outcome of his performance left many Ghanaians disappointed, and he says he's equally disappointed because he wished he could have done better. You know, having like the whole nation on your shoulders and having to represent them very, very well brings a lot of you know pressure on you. Um, but I've always seen pressure as me performing better because, of course, I think Ghanaians or I believe Ghanaians wish me well. They want me to do well. That is why when it doesn't come out the way they want it, they get mad about it. But I'm a fan. I'm a fan of football, and I also get mad when players don't play well. So I, I really understand that. I really understand the criticism and everything. And I accept it, I take it, um, I don't get mad about it. It's normal, it happens. But I, I've always said one thing to myself that whatever that the fans want, I believe that I want more for myself. And as much as they are disappointed, I'm more disappointed. I just have to work on myself, work harder, to be able to make them excited, to be able to make them proud. Talk to me, um, I noticed that in the last 20 meters of the 100 meters, you appeared to be pulled up, but you were still able to psych up yourself for the 4x1. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we prepared ourselves for times like this. There are still ups and downs, and champions never give up. So regardless of whatever that is going to happen in my career, um, as much as it's happened in front of the home crowd, people will think it's really going to break me down. But um, I got a whole team that was depending on me. Um, the other three guys was depending on me, wanted me to run it, wanted us to do well. And I had it at the back of my mind, we had to defend our title as well. So came here, signed myself up, talked to my coach, Elama Manako, um, gingered me for me to go into the relay and just go do well and just qualify to the final. Now let's talk football and Ghana's black satellites. They will come up against Uganda in the final of the men's under 20 competition, which is also part of the African Games 2023. Head coach of Ghana's under 20 team, Desmond Offer, says that he's looking forward to a great final on Friday. As expected, it was a very tough game uh, very against a very, very good team. A team that has been working really hard um, to compete on the highest level. So we had a lot of respect for them. Um, we had to fight for it. Uh, it took us a while, but from the beginning to the end, we dominated the game. Uh, we were never in trouble. Uh, they chose the long ball, which we were a bit surprised because we thought that they were going to play. It was a good footballing playing team, but um, that wasn't the case. We dealt with it well. Um, the first half, they, we didn't create enough chances, in my opinion. Not enough clear-cut chances, but uh, we dig deep and uh, eventually we got rewarded. My boys are not wasteful. We had one clear chance and we, uh, we finished it. Um, I can't recall any part of the game where we squandered any chances. Uh, so I don't, I don't understand your question, basically. Um, you know, we're in the middle of the Ramadan and I want to protect the boys as much as I can. And um, about two days ago, South Africa decided to withdraw ace male and female hockey teams from the African Games, citing uh, that the facility was not good enough to host the event. According to them, Ghana's unpreparedness to host the hockey competition meant that they were going to risk the health of their players if they allowed them to play. Well, there was a reaction from the African uh, Federation of Hockey. They said that um, countries are here to compete and not to give excuses of why they cannot participate. The rule set has to be certified. Yes for qualifying tournament, and this tournament is not qualifying, as we had our qualifying tournament some months ago. With our experience as a TDs, we have here two tournament directors, one from South Africa and one from Ghana. We have two empires manager, one from Nigeria, and one from South Africa again. And we have six members of the African Hockey Federation here. I called for immediate meeting for all together. 
to decide will we play or not. That's your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. We appreciate your time. Welcome back. And in world news today, Senegal's president says he does not regret delaying this year's elections, a move that sparked deadly protests. Macky Sall said he did not make the decision alone, responding to concerns raised by parliamentarians. After violent backlash, many feared the relatively stable nation was slipping into political crisis. But the attempt to push the election back by 10 months was blocked by Senegal's top court. The vote will now take place on Sunday, a month after it was initially due. President Sal said, and I quote, I have no apology to make. I've done nothing wrong. All the actions that have been taken have been taken within the framework of the law and regulations. Critics accused Mr. Sal of trying to stay on beyond his term of office, which the president denied. He argued that the delay was needed to resolve a dispute over the eligibility of presidential candidates. Showbiz is next. Everyone has a story. In fact, there was a time I decided I have to stop the music. A story of that unique place that gives them a vibe. Mochimio, Minasi. A spiritual moment for me whenever I have to record music because whenever the place is dark, mm. I feel I'm in the studio alone, even without the producer. The vibe that births excellence, special skills, talent, and mastery. to E-Vibes with Becky on the channel.
We begin on a rather sad note in showbiz today as Boga High Life pioneer and Aquatip brothel hit maker George Dako has passed away at the age of 73. The late musician, renowned for his skills as a guitarist, vocalist, composer and songwriter, held the title of Tufuhini of Ekrupong with a stool named Nana Ampim Dako I. His death comes just days after the loss of High Life legend KK Kabobo. My colleague Jacqueline Ansuma Yabua has more in the following report. Read to you. Shouted as the king of Boga High Life, George Dako brought a contemporary sensitivity to high life music since the early 1980s. He was popular in the 1980s and 1990s, and his songs are some of the most timeless and enduring high life tracks in Ghana's music circles. One of his songs that struck Europe and the African continent was Akutib Rofo, which literally means the parrot in English, which was released in 1983. <laughs> Other songs of Mr. Daku are Keje Nya, Ubiya Bayua, Midomini Odokala and many more. His demise comes shortly after the loss of another legendary high life musician, Kwabuna Kwachi Kabobo, also known as KK Kabobo, who passed away a few days earlier. <laughs> So rest in peace and may his memory be a blessing. Now, dance in a, is an aspect of culture that distinguishes the philosophies of culture of its origins as a symbol of identity. Dance is a reflective of the constant conception and reconception of self and society. For a Ghana Man series, we throw a spotlight on the kete dance. The term kete refers to a specific set of instruments the music played by those instruments and the dance performed to that music. Originally existing within Ashanti royal court system, Kete is now heard at funerals and weddings, as well as royal palace events. take a look at the Kete dance. The popular Kete dance is associated with the Akans. It is believed that the dance originated from the Kete Krachi tribe in the Volta region of Ghana and was danced by the hunters of the tribe. However, when the Asantis conquered them, they took over the dance. Kete is usually danced in the royal courts of chiefs and is performed for chiefs who sit in palanquins. Not only do Asantis perform this dance, Kete is also popular among the people of Buno. The songs that accompany the dance are usually sound of drums that send specific messages. At other times, the songs do come with lyrics. That's it for the news this afternoon. My name is Kenneth Jesse. But for more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.
count down to December 7, political party manifestos will anchor the key issues that will define the next government. The need is urgent to guarantee that the manifestos reflect the real needs of citizens. Star Ghana and Joy News proudly present the Ghana Connect Town Hall live from the Northern Regional Capital, Tamale. Citizens will gather at the Bagabaga College of Education on Wednesday, March 20, 2024. 3 p.m. for the live town hall engagement. Join us for the pre-live event engagements from the morning as we sift through the key issues of importance to you. The Star Ghana Joy News Ghana Connect Town Hall live on Joy News, Joy 99.7 FM, MyJoyOnline.com and across our social media platforms from 3 p.m. this Wednesday. Make your voice count in the crafting of manifestos only on your election headquarters. Hello everyone, welcome to the marketplace. Coming up this afternoon, Ghana's economy goes by 2.9% in 2023, stronger than the revised 1.5% by the finance ministry. We will analyze. Also coming up this afternoon, businesses in rural Ghana incur losses over limited internet access. Ahead, we also discuss the IMF's push for developing countries such as Ghana to take advantage of artificial intelligence. We can see three, four, five percent productivity gain if we go forward with artificial intelligence effectively. So this is my first point. We desperately need something that would inject more dynamism in the world economy. That's ahead on Let's Talk Tech. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Details coming up. And now as you look at the currency market, but important figures coming out from the Ghana Statistical Service today. Ghana's economy recorded a 2.9 gross domestic product growth rate in 2023, stronger than the revised 1.5% by the finance ministry. The growth rate is lower than the 3.1% recorded in 2022. According to data from the Ghana Statistical Service, the services sector contracted by 1.2%. It however remains the biggest size of the economy Government statistician Professor Samuel Kobnenin said the last quarter of 2023, however, recorded a higher growth rate of 3.8% driven by the oil and gas subsector. This is the first time in more than a year that Ghana has recorded a higher growth rate in oil GDP.
Now, joining us on Zoom uh, is Professor Peter Quarty, Director of the Institute of Studies for Social and Economic Research, to discuss the latest figures. Thank you so much for joining us on the marketplace. 2.9% growth, stronger than the Finance Ministry's uh, revised projection of 1.5%, however, slower than what was recorded in 2022. Your thoughts on our performance? Um, yes, uh, good afternoon to your descending viewers. Um, I think the performance um, still lower, uh, but nevertheless, it's slightly higher than what was projected uh, by government. Um, I must also say that the performance um, was lower compared to 2022, where we had all the extreme rates, challenges, and turbulence. Uh, we've seen mining and firing uh, picking up, growing by um, 2.5 percent. We've seen manufacturing growing marginally, um, but our grid still remains uh, quite resilient and versatile. Uh, crops uh, growing by 4.8. But my concern is cocoa, which declined by a negative 0.3 percent. So it's an area we need to look at uh, carefully. Construction declined significantly by 9.9 percent. It's a major source of worry as well. That um, we are seeing this kind of uh, decline. Nevertheless, uh, we've seen ICT finance also picking up enemy real estate. But um, let me also um, add that we've seen uh, industry struggling since 2020. Um, industries has not been achieving as much as uh, expected. And if agri manufacturing isn't doing well, uh, these are the two major sectors that create the major or the number of jobs that, that we need. That is a source of worry. Lastly, um, Dara, let me point to that per capita income uh, has also increased marginally, but it's also quite uh, encouraging to see that there's some positive growth in income per head. So between 2018 and 2023, gross national income per capita increased from 2,140 2, to 2,300. That is $160 over the six years. On average, our per capita income increased by $26 per year. Uh, it's marginal though, but at least there is some um, improvement in per capita income. So those, those are some of the key highlights I've found from the GDP uh, projection or figures. All right, I want us to talk a, a little bit more about industry because as you pointed out, uh, we've seen industry reverse the, contract, the contraction that we've seen over time. We saw an expansion of 1.6%. What does it say about recovery of industry? Are we supposed to be excited yet about uh, this gain made in the last quarter of 2023? Well, I, I, I don't think that we should be excited, rather, um, we should work hard to ensure that industry growth would grow at a much significant pace. Uh, we've seen um, construction contracting by 9.9. .9. It tells you that contractors are struggling to get access to finance. Contractors are not able, to, they are not being paid on time. And that sector is contracting. And this is a source of worry uh, for us. We've seen manufacturing pick up marginally. Another major sector, but just a marginal 0.9% growth. Um, and even electricity is minus 10.9%. So this, these are all areas uh, we, we need to look at. I'm uh, uh, so quite refreshed and you know, exciting to see that mining and firing, which declined in the last quarter, uh, has picked up and grow, grow, growing by 2.5%. So um, industry is somewhere that we need to focus on. The new taxes that were introduced the cost of doing business, the high cost of this doing business. These are all things that are affecting uh, industry and we ought to, as well as, of course, non-payment of uh, contractors. This is affecting the industrial sector and government has to focus attention to revive that sector. Uh, um, and then the services sector contracted by 1.2% uh, uh, compared to the previous year is still the biggest contributor to GDP are there any warning signs we should be looking out for? Yes, uh, for services, um, we, we ought to look at that, that again. Um, you know, we used to grow 
with significant lead. Um, IT is still continuing to be dominant. FinTech, the financial insurance sector, is also one area that used to grow significantly, but now it's 2.9% because of the DDT and a few inherent domestic problems. But at least now there's a turnaround we've seen a growth of 2.9%. Real estate is also picking up. So that is an area that if uh, the cost of doing business, the enabling environment is, is well uh, prepared uh, or laid out, I think it's the successor will, will, will grow um, higher than what we are expecting. Yeah, and I know that you are very passionate about the agri sector. Uh, I was just looking at the third quarter figure and then the fourth quarter figure of 2023. I think that it remained the same at 4.5%. And so uh, nothing major happening there, if you like. Uh, your thoughts on the performance of agri? Yes, um, agri, you've seen very marginal, as you're saying, 4.3%, now 4.5%. Again, you know, um, you know, we had this planting for food and jobs that was helping with supply of inputs, etc. But some of these agro uh, aggregators and uh, um, input suppliers uh, were not receiving payments, and some were, were, were not supplying, were not able to supply some of these inputs. You know, so it's, it's again uh, an area for concern. And I'm, I'm happy that we have uh, planting for food and jobs 2.0. Mm. It is my hope and belief that. Uh, PFG 2.0 will revive the sector so we see more uh, significant growth in the sector. You see cocoa, again, it points to this illegal mining uh, menace that is uh, crippling our economy. Cocoa production uh, declined by 0.3%. And if we don't reverse this, it's likely to continue. You know, But luckily, crops continue to be resilient. But, but as I mentioned, uh, there is a need to supply more inputs. Um, and, and also yeah. cheaper sources of credit to revive the agricultural sector. Uh, we are told that this is the first time uh, that uh, oil GDP has uh, driven uh, the growth of, of, of uh, overall GDP. Um, tell us what's happening within the oil sector and why that is the case. Well, you know, the oil prices uh, increased for, for, for a while in, in, in that year. So um, it's not just production, but also uh, price uh, improved um, after COVID. Price of oil started picking up because of increased demand, increased economic activity. So that's what is also driving the sector, apart from uh, the, the production that is being reported. Okay. And so based on these figures, I just want us to uh, take a look at uh, 2024, what the outlook is like uh, based on what we are seeing. What do you see uh, the coming months to look like? I mean, first quarter, I mean, we're yet to know what exactly the growth rate will be, but based on what we are seeing, the happenings in the economy, what do you project the economy to look like uh, in the coming days? I think uh, globally, and even in, in our 2024 budget, uh, we are projecting 2024 to be much better than the previous year. So we are likely to see, all things being equal, we are likely to see higher growth rates. Um, as we've seen in the last quarter of 2023, we're likely to see higher growth rates in the first three quarters. And um, possibly the last quarter of 2024, what we cannot say for sure is the fiscal um, after 2024, whether we maintain prudent uh, fiscal balance and therefore will not suffer the political business cycle or election business cycle uh, as we used to in every election year. But otherwise, uh, my expectation for 2024 is, is much uh, brighter. I, I think we, we are likely to grow at a much higher pace, um, all things uh, being equal. What should the government be prioritizing based on the performances of the various sectors? What advice would you give? I think, uh, you know, for me, jobs, 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 and to enhance job creation, we need to target manufacturing, we need to target agriculture. Those are the two major sectors that if, if we're able to support the value chain, we're likely to create more jobs for our citizens. So let's, let's look at the government has to uh, look at agri carefully, how it's going to support, not just one, just providing input credit, but the entire value chain, how it's going to support it 
would fund large scale commercial farming to ensure that uh, we revamp agri and grow at a much faster pace. Then, um, an industry, industry manufacturing is key in terms of job creation. So, what are we going to do to enhance industrial uh, or manufacturing uh, production? The cost of doing business is one major uh, factor, uh, ensuring electricity and, and other uh, costs are kept within reasonable reach. We don't want to see new or higher taxes, but rather to make the existing tax handle more efficient and then allow industry to flourish. All right. Uh, thank, okay. you, thank you so much uh, for your thoughts uh, this afternoon. Professor Peter Quarte there, he is uh, Director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic uh, Research. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You're watching the marketplace. We want to take uh, you to another story that we have been following all week for you. Uh, that is to do with uh, internet disruptions. And we are taking you to rural communities because some business operators in rural communities, including mobile money vendors, are recording low sales following the recent internet blackout that hit the country. Residents and uh, businesses at Apenamadi, a village in the Achuma Mpunya district of the Ashanti region, which already battles for internet connectivity, are heavily impacted by the limited internet supply. Emmanuel Bright Kweku was in the community and has filed this report. And friends, not only to converse amongst themselves, but to primarily connect with the rest of the world. But one of their means to stay abreast of global and national happenings, mobile internet, is being intermittently truncated. Although they have been enduring the perennial challenges with internet and mobile connectivity, the prevailing internet blackout is biting harder. I have been here for only two months. Internet is really bad. Located over 50 kilometers away on the outskirts of the regional capital, Kumasi, Apenemade is a small farming community in the Achimampunya district with a population less than 1,000. This open space underneath the trees on the community's hill is the only luckiest place for internet connectivity. The internet is not really good unless you come to the school premises. For some phones, it works better, but even with that, it's not everything that is accessible. The uncomfortable living spans into businesses in the village, especially mobile transactions. Portia Brago, a mobile money vendor in the community, has had to endure the ordeal of turning away customers due to the recent poor network. She is incurring losses. <laughs> I always receive transaction field notification that is really affecting my business. I have to turn away customers all the time. Sometimes I have to roam the community before I'm able to do transactions for people. Stephen, also a vendor, is reeling under the impact. It accidentally deducts amounts from my account, making me in care losses. Some residents manage to utilize virtual private networks, but the connectivity situation in the area is not allowing a smooth experience on the app. Uh, not, not too long ago, a friend of mine being introduced to VPN, which came out, I mean, but, you know, sometimes because of the network in a hand. Because the network is bad, even the VPN is not really working effectively. Because sometimes the firm team for saying come with me, I basically told him to work because earlier on in the network, you see the app, and see our challenges in the buying point. So while telecommunication operators in the country work around to restore full internet connectivity, 
residents and businesses in remote areas like Apinimadi are eagerly anticipating that they have a better experience to serve the few clients that come around for transactions. From here at Apinimadi in the Achimampunya district of the Ashanti region, my name is Emmanuel Francis. Well, that story leads us to Let's Talk Tech. I'm joined by Henry Kobler, who is lead for Eyes of Africa. Good to have you this afternoon, Henry. Um, I, I, I'm sure you just saw the story that passed. Uh, tell us uh, what your thoughts are on what you are seeing happening in the rural areas. They're also not spared uh, the impact of uh, uh, internet blackout we saw a few days ago. Thank you very much, Darrell. So, I mean, generally when you're looking at internet connectivity in the country, I think that we've all been affected by it. And so I will trick it out to rural areas and how the operations generally would be affected. I mean, if you're looking at it from, from that set, you would understand that, I mean, the rural areas really depend on the urban areas in terms of some level of um, mobile money transactions hitting in there and uh, also being able to communicate with their um, their loved ones in the urban areas and actually out of the country. And so they would generally be affected, especially when we don't have too much better connectivity hitting the rural areas. You're expecting that um, that hit when it comes down to, to that. So I know that they wouldn't really be spared, but generally it's, it's a condition where we all have to sort of endure till we have a proper solution. And hopefully we have some level of plant um, which comes in place to be able to uh, subject um, ourselves to proper internet connectivity and, and not face this, um, regardless of the conditions as mm. to being natural or um, man-made causes to, to our internet lines. All right, and, and it appears generally that the situation is improving, but there is criticism about um, Ghana's recovery uh, compared to other countries. Uh, the criticism is that it has been slow. Very, very slow. I mean, um, I'm sure that we had options where we could have I mean, I mean, now we're jumping on the Google's Ekenor fiber and, and trying to recover f sort of from that. Um, we can understand all the explanations that are coming in, but I think that if some other people are putting in place some um, plans in terms of these disruptions to be able to recover quickly, I think that there, there needs to be some level of um, introspection into what we could have done better off and, and put these things in place when we sort of fully recover. I mean, it's general internet. This is like what we sort of depend on now. And, and so when our recovery process basically comes a bit low, then it means that we're not sort of supposed to be, uh, we're not prepared for these conditions, which is not um, one of the, the, the pointers we should be looking at. I mean, generally, imagine if we're actually having the same disruptions during the elections. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we can't really blame that there could be a lot of um, miscommunications coming in. And at that time when the tensions um, rising. I don't think that that's, that's giving a lot of room for explanations as to um, uh, we've been able to buy um, extra bandwidth from international partners and all of that. And so I think that there, there needs to be more improvement in, in the way where we're putting some of these infrastructure in place. And I think the government is uh, probably in, in the best future positions to make some of these regulatory and policy demands um, and, and make sure that they sort of come in alive um, and, and are able to make sure that these uh, infrastructures are also coming in better for uh, some of these telecommunication networks to jump on. I want us to switch topic and talk about artificial intelligence because there was a major conference uh, this week in Accra. Uh, we saw the managing director of the IMF there, Kristalina Georgieva, where she was um, urging African countries, developing countries to take advantage of um, AI. Uh, she mentioned that you know AI has a potential to boost productivity uh, by between three to five percent. I'm just wondering where we are as a country uh, when it comes to adoption of in, uh, artificial intelligence. So now I would interest you to know that basically I'm, I'm doing a lot of studies when it comes out to artificial intelligence personally, and so um, in that area I'm even building applications that come alive to um, be deployed in that system, but. Um, in there, um, again, being a student of that, I could also tell you that I think that we're not so prepared for such systems to be, be able to be deployed. I mean, um, if you're looking at these systems to uh, deploy, first of all, you need, you need to have the fundamental basics um, right. I mean, yeah. most of our institutions do not even have the real basics of, of, say, information gathering, information analytics, I mean, available enough to even jump onto artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence takes a bit of time to be deployed. I mean, it's taking some mobile mobile phones and mobile applications, yes, 
to sort of adapt to this. And that is only because they've had some level of infrastructure and breakdown um, to their major minor processes that, that, that spans in the business. So I can give an example. If a bank um, in Ghana says that we want to do artificial intelligence, I think that they would be in the best suited position to do that because they've had their mobile applications in the system for almost probably two or three years. They've sort of gathered a lot of data and traffic as to how the users are on the mobile applications and all of that. And so, yes, it would, it would definitely be a very good platform to sort of uh, deploy these systems. But if I'm taking uh, most of our government institutions and uh, how we're now jumping on digitalization um, pointers and we don't even have uh, a major data sort of um, gathered in, I think that uh, we would sort of have some level of um, low productivity in there. It would, it would be us throwing money into these infrastructure and not getting much from these infrastructure. I mean, technical uh, or technological systems are very expensive to deploy. I mean, to get an AI engineer to sit to work on um, applications and or oh, really is going to cost you that much. And when you're having just about uh, two or three percent of people jumping onto that application to use, I mean, part of uh, your budget, I think that it wouldn't really work well in that regard. And so I think that right. it would take time for us to sort of deploy and come alive, especially in the, in the public sector. But we should basically start making sure that we're getting the basics of our operations in place to be able to connect to big data, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, almost all the new systems that are sort of coming. Okay. Uh, we could always be alive and waiting for, for them to be able to deploy. Quick one, we just have about one minute uh, while we talk about embracing artificial intelligence. Interesting um, development form yesterday's graphic business standard back breakfast meeting where the CEO of the Ghana Tourism Authority was saying that they were looking at uh, the adoption of AI to uh, encourage uh, domestic tourism experience. I don't know exactly how they intend to do that, but I thought it was fascinating. It is, but I don't think that they're actually ready for it, sad to say, because I mean, generally I'm even looking at the basics like I've mentioned. Um, I wanted to see some level of payment systems integration is being ready for, let's say, Quill. I've actually been on their website. I've not even seen it. It's a simple Google form that has actually just been filled for people that are going to go for paragliding. And I think that that's like the barest minimum. There could be a lot more that should have been in place enough to actually now start thinking of artificial intelligence. The basics is very important. Can I make a simple payment to my paragliding if event? Um, what kind of information is available? Is there a mobile application that's sort of gathering um, the data of the people that would have gone last year, last two years, last three years to the paragliding that you could definitely be sending them information, getting them to show their interest. I mean, all of these data comes together to play before you actually start thinking about artificial intelligence. And I think that right. we really not it's sad to say, but it's actually a very good point where we actually envision it. Maybe we could do a leapfrog maybe, but I think that um, it's a fascinating idea, but we need to get the basics right. All right, Henry Kobler, the lead for Eyes of Africa. Always a pleasure to talk to you on the marketplace. And uh, that's the marketplace uh, this afternoon. Thanks for watching, everyone. There is uh, more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. You can head there for the day's latest, including Ghana's economy going by 2.9% in 2023. According to the statistical service, we had a discussion on that as well. High inflation, most Ghanaians shifted spending in 2023 to essential goods. That's according to Maverick uh, report. You can get more on that on myjoyonline.com forward slash business. My name is Daryl Kwao. All right. I, there's some bit of uh, an event taking place. We want to take you live now uh, to the Electoral Commission, I believe, where there is a, a press conference happening there right now. He stated, for clarification, biometric voter registration kits, which comprise a laptop, camera, scanner, and printer, are entirely separate from the Commission's registration data systems and are incapable of manipulating election outcomes, as suggested. These kits, though crucial for voter registration, require specific activation to function accordingly. Without such activation, they serve no purpose beyond their individual components as a laptop, camera, scanner, or printer. What this means is that they are of no value beyond what 
they were manufactured to be. Similarly, the laptops stolen, the stolen laptops cannot be utilized for voter verification or registration. It remains just a laptop. As such, they cannot be used to compromise our systems and undermine the credibility of the upcoming elections in December 2024. The integrity of our systems and elections remain intact. Again, there seems to be some confusion as to the use of our equipment. It's imperative to understand that the commission utilizes two distinct equipment for its operations. The biometric voter registration kits, which is used for voter registration and the biometric verification devices to verify voters using their fingerprints or facial features on election day. These devices in isolation cannot fulfill the functions of registration or verification without proper activation. It is important to note that at the completion of every registration exercise, all data captured are erased from the laptops in a process termed end of life. As such, we assure the public that the stolen laptops contain no sensitive or valuable data. Consequently, the theft bears no impact on the integrity of the upcoming elections, nor does it serve any political agenda as insinuated. Upon detection of the theft, the commission promptly notified security agencies involved in the maintenance process and investigations are actively ongoing to apprehend and prosecute the offenders, the suspects, sorry. The commission places high value on its assets, including the biometric registration kits and biometric verification devices. Hence, its continuous reliance on the police and other security devices to protect all its installations. The commission urges public figures and citizens alike to exercise due diligence by verifying information before dissemination. This responsibility is paramount to maintaining public trust and preventing unwarranted fear or panic. The Electoral Commission remains committed to upholding the highest standards of transparency and integrity in its operations and elections. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the attention. I also want to add briefly, because of what is alleged to have been stolen, uh, the commission is hearing that we are at risk ahead of the 2024 general elections. The Commission wishes to use this opportunity to assure you, the media and all Ghanaians, that we are not at risk and that we are fully ready for the 2024. These are laptops that do not contain any information of anyone. They are just laptops, as they are manufactured to be. They do not contain any information of any voter, neither do they contain any critical information so we want everyone to know that we are, we are fully ready for the elections ahead.
So there, there is no risk as far as the Electoral Commission is concerned. Again, we are also uh, picking information that some people are confusing the BVDs and the BVLs. We want to tell you, the media and the general public, that the BVDs are used for verification during elections. They are used for verification during elections, the BVDs. The BVRs are used for registration. The BVR, they come in the form of, in, in a box. We call them the BVR kits. In that box, you are going to have a laptop. You are going to have a scanner. You are going to have a camera. And you are going to have a printer and other devices which constitute the kit. So each of the individual equipment that make up the kit, on their own, they do not have any bearing on our activities. Neither do they have any bearing on our registration exercise. It's only when we put them together. And when even we put them together, we must activate them and connect them to our system before they can be used for the registration purposes. And when it comes to the BVD, we only use them when you are going to vote. And we want to establish that you are the one you claim to be. So if even a BVD is missing or a BVR is missing, they have no impact on our elections. Because on their own, unless they are activated and connected to our system, on their own, they cannot do anything. And if per chance someone even steals a BVR or a BVD and takes it somewhere, you can still not register with it. You can still not be able to register applicants. The reason is that before registration will take place, we need to activate that particular equipment and connect it to our system. So we want to allay the fears of anyone out there who is hearing that, oh, some items have been stolen. Again, we want to emphasize that what the EC said yesterday was that five laptops are missing. And we are working with the security agencies to, to arrest and prosecute the suspects. Again, we are also hearing people saying that, how secure are your systems? Especially so because we have many security personnel, police personnel around. How did these things happen? Again, we want to assure each and every one here and the good people of our country that our systems are secure. Our systems are very, very robust. And as I indicated earlier, we are, we are so robust to the extent that we, we are convinced that in 2024, come December 7th, we are going to organize another, another perhaps transparent, credible elections, which will go down as one of the best in our country. So again, our systems are very, very much secured. So anyone who thinks that, oh, something has happened, and as a result of that, there is a problem, we are, we are convinced and we are certain that all our systems are, are active, all our systems are secured, and we are ready for the activities of the year. The next one, the next question, which we are also hearing people asking has to do with, uh, people are making, some people are alleging that the EC spent $150 million in our acquiring our equipment in 2020. $150 million. Let me say that when this Electoral Commission took over in 2018, August of 2018, there was a contract. There was a contract of $56 million to upgrade our equipment so that we'll be able to use the equipment for the 2018 referenda and to also use them for the DLE, the district level elections, in 2019. A contract worth $56 million. And in 2020, we were supposed to acquire new equipment. But this electoral commission, under the leadership of the chair, took the decision that it wasn't worth it spending 56 million of taxpayers' money only to upgrade, to organize a referenda, and to also organize the DLE in 2019. So we, the commission took the decision not to sign that particular contract. So in 2020, the commission did an open international competitive tendering to acquire again in 2020 the commission undertook an open competitive international tendering process to acquire new technology 
So the commission was able to acquire 8,500 verification, no, 8,500 biometric voter registration kits, 8,500 of them. We also acquired almost 80,000 verification devices. We have a new state-of-the-art data center, as well as a data recovery center. Then we also had a software to be able to do the registration. All these things were acquired at a cost of almost $59 million. Just just oppose that with 2018, only upgrading and refurbishing at $56 million. We had all this in 2020 at $59 million. And those are the equipment we are still using. We use them in 2020. We use them in the two, uh, 2023 district level elections. And we are going to use them this year in the 2024 general elections. So when we hear some people saying that the EC spent $150 million in 2020, then we, we are surprised. We don't know how they got that particular information. In any case, the 2020 elections, it cost the Electoral Commission and the, the country $132 million. So if the whole election cost us $132 million, how did we only buy the equipment at $150 million? It doesn't add up. So this is an information we want the general public to know that the Electoral Commission is very much concerned when it comes to spending taxpayers' money. So on behalf of uh, my colleague and the chair, we are very grateful for your attention. Excellent. So we now open the floor for uh, any questions or comments. But my colleague will make a point before. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, to add to what Dr. Bosman actually said, um, there are also some concerns that uh, probably we have um, some um, vital information on the laptops um, stolen. Uh, this is also not true in the sense that after every registration exercise, we do what we call end of life. And with this end of life, the data on the laptop synchronized, is synchronized and it is actually um, sent into our database. So we don't have any information on the laptops, the stolen laptops. So there is no um, cause for any alarm. Thank you. Okay, um, if you have please have this way, if you want to ask a question, join me on this. Okay. I don't call yourself the last question. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Eliza Dampong, so I'm a new guy. Um, I want you to respond to a post by Anthony Kujo, who says that Um, I'm not going to say I'm going to go on and get there. Um, so 
the first question was about decoy. Do to engage in procurement, is that not so? I think the commission which wishes to state unequivocally that the commission is not planning to undertake any procurement of biometric equipment. We are not planning to undertake. And indeed, we've just explained, and my colleagues stressed, that five laptops are missing. So the BVRs are intact. The number we mentioned, 8,500 BVRs, they are intact. The verification devices are also intact. And the commission has had meetings with our parties, other stakeholders. We have never said it anywhere that we do not have the equipment to undertake the 2024 general elections. So as I said, uh, we believe that those who are public figures, when they are putting out information, they need to ensure that they don't put out information that will mislead, miseducate, and misinform the public. This is not true. The commission is not thinking about any procurement of equipment. I think there was a question how you reported to the police. Or, or the question was about did you have a meeting with parliament yesterday? Yes. We had, a, we had a meeting with the leadership of parliament yesterday, made up of the majority and the minority. It was in that meeting we made it clear to them that five of our laptops are missing. We didn't say at the meeting that BVDs were missing. Neither did we say BVRs were missing. We said five laptops. And these five laptops do not contain any information of voters. It doesn't contain any information of voters. They are laptops, just as we know laptops, what they do. Thank you. So um, as uh, Dr. Bosman said, you know, um, proud to our um, meeting with the leadership of parliament, the commission had taken, taken the necessary steps to um, report to the security agency. So you find out that at the place where we are preparing the BVR kits for the registration exercise sent, maybe the routine maintenance of the BVRs, we have the national security and we also have the police presence there. So this was actually taken up by the national um, the security agencies before we had the meeting with the leadership of parliament and that question cropped up. So it was when it cropped up that the commission actually made it known to the leadership that five laptops have been stolen and not even the BVD. So all our BVDs are intact, like Dr. Bosman said, and then the BVR kits are in intact, except the five laptops. And if we are emphasizing that it doesn't actually contain, they don't actually contain any information. I said we do end of life. When we have finished with the registration exercise, um, we do the end of life immediately after the registration exercise so that we can offload those data onto our system. So we don't actually have a time frame within which immediately after the exercise, we make sure that we embark upon the end of life and then make sure that the data on the laptop is captured onto our system. Thank you. That's all. Which one? What, what, what was your question? I asked whether when the commission detected that laptops are being tempered with, did you engage the political parties in any way to inform them what the situation is? And my second question was, you said the, system, the National Commission Office is under 24 hour security. How come that these machines were tempered with if the security as Elia said, we are preparing our BVR kits. It was detected last um, week. It was last week that we detected. With a meeting with political parties, we haven't actually, normally we engage the political parties using what? IPAC. 
know, and we have um, a structured um, meetings with them where we, 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 we meet with them and then we inform them. So at the next IPAC meeting, the commission will inform the political parties. And uh, we are saying that we have a well-structured and um, a well-installed security system, apart from the police who are there, apart from the national security who are there, the commission also has its own security. And this detection was not made by any other person but by the commission. It is the commission which actually detected. And um, you, you, you know that definitely no matter how um, strong your systems are, at times there are some of these um, things which crop up. But we are assuring the public that we have um, a robust um, system where we can actually detect these thefts. And it is because of the system that we have in place that we are able to know that these laptops have been stolen. Thank you. And just to ask briefly, I think one of the things we need to know also is that anytime the EC is doing registration, before we begin, before we begin the registration, we give a report to all the political parties. So all the political parties will know the state of the registration before we even begin. And when we finish, too, we have what is called the end of day report, which is given to the political parties. So what it means is that the political parties are able to tabulate and put all the figures together. So if even something is missing, the political parties, they are convinced that with the structures the EC has put in place, because at every stage of our activity, the political parties are there to monitor and in many instances, they have their agents there who are supposed to ensure quality assurance. So we want to allay the fears of everyone that the commission under the leadership of the chair, we are committed to very transparent, credible process. We did that uh, in the years before. We'll continue to do that in 2024. Thank you. I think we are done now. On Information. information. But do they have any specialized software for purposes of election installed in them um, before they were stolen? And you mentioned suspects, um, how many uh, suspects have been identified um, as of now? But don't you think that we need to uh, take a look again at your bookkeeping um, systems so that we don't have this? The question as to <clears throat> how many suspects, you know, the numbers, yes, keeps on changing because as and when uh, during the investigation maybe a name crops up, then they pick up the person. So as at now, once the investigation is still going on, we can't tell exactly how many people have been picked. Um, the stolen laptops, you know, we said that the BVR kits is made up of the laptop, the cameras, the fingerprint scanners and other things. So if 
we don't have the laptop, assuming, assuming that we are not able to get a laptop, we will just procure laptop to replace the stolen ones. That's the five ones, so that the kit can actually work, because the kit cannot actually work without the laptop. So if it is the fingerprint scanner, which is even not working, you know, you either fix it or you buy a fingerprint scanner so that the whole kit can work properly. Um, with, the, with, the, with the security aspect, that one will also wait for the report of the investigations and other things. Normally, um, they make um, recommendations as to what to do to prevent some of these things. But in the interim, the commission has also beefed up the security uh, measures at where we are working or preparing the BVR kits. Thank you. Thank you very much. down to December 7, political party manifestos will anchor the key issues that will define the next government. The need is urgent to guarantee that the manifestos reflect the real needs of citizens. Star Ghana and Join in proudly present the Ghana Connect Town Hall live from the Northern Regional Capital, Tamale. Citizens will gather at the Bagabaga College of Education on Wednesday, March 20, 2024. Engagement. Join us for the pre live event engagements from the morning as we sift through the key issues of importance to you. The Star Ghana Join News Ghana Connect Town Hall live on Join News, Joy 99.7 FM, myjoinline.com, and across our social media platforms from 3 p.m. this Wednesday. Make your voice count in the crafting of manifestos only on your election headquarters. Hello, my name is Kenneth Jesse and this is Election Brief. Within the next 30 minutes, we have the latest update from the political scene. We're live on DSTV channel 421, GoTV channel 125, all social media handles and around the world on myjoyonline.com. Election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol, your clean fuel in full quantity, and Chartered Institute of Management Accountant and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, together as the Association of International Certified
And this afternoon, President of the Ghana Journalists Association, Albert Kwabnajumfo, has warned those hatching plans to attack journalists before, during, and after this year's general elections to abort such plans as the umbrella body will not countenance such attacks. According to him, the GJA is determined this time to ensure the safety of every journalist in the country as it jealously guards the country's enviable democratic credentials. He signaled the warning at a day's workshop organized for journalists by the U.S. Embassy in conjunction with the GJA in Accra. My colleague Carlos Coloni has the rest of the story. Held under the theme, Journalists for Peaceful Discuss, the one-day workshop, the fourth in series by the U.S. Embassy in collaboration with the Ghana Journalist Association, equipped practitioners with skills on fake news identification, disinformation, responsible and accurate reporting before, during and after the 2024 elections. Advising journalists to choose accuracy of a speech, President of the Ghana Journalist Association, Albert Kobena Jumfo, asserted the GJA's commitment to ensuring practitioner safety in the polls. The GJA has a mandate to promote democracy, freedom of expression, human rights and other responsibilities as enshrined in Ghana's 1992 constitution, including national development and general good of the citizenry. It is for this reason this project was muted to enable the GJA build the capacity of journalists in preparedness of the task ahead, which is elections 2024. Let's not rush at all time to choose speed over accuracy. It is worth mentioning, however, that there is growing intolerance against the media and attacks on the media is on ascendancy. Whilst I encourage my colleagues to refrain from conduct that inflames passion, I wish to also send caution to those who assault the media that the GJ will not countenance any attack on journalists going into the elections as any such thing will be fiercely resisted as we have demonstrated in recent times. Now, we know that the imposition of media blackout is more powerful and I want to emphasize that the GJ stands ready to defend its members at all times. The U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Virginia Palmer, however, urged the media to report the truth at all times to uphold and safeguard the shining democratic credentials of the country. Adding, the U.S. Embassy will keenly monitor the political processes this year. The change we need is the professionalization of the security services um, and structuring our economies to ensure that economic prosperity is shared across classes, regions, and subgroups, again, without discrimination. And Ghana has long been a regional example of stability and the democratic success. But again, across the region, that's, that's under threat. So we can't take it for granted. I know you don't. Um, and you journalists are the absolute linchpin or bedrock the, the internet is down this morning. I couldn't look for better synonyms. But um, you, are, you are absolutely essential to, to, to making that true and to protecting that and protecting those values. And I know you face threats, both physical and digital, that seek to silence critical voices and stifle press freedom. And the courage to report honestly in such an environment is commendable. And it's testament to the resilience and dedication of the journalist community. And we'll do everything we can to make sure that you're not threatened in those ways. Um, but, but your courage to want to report the story and report the truth, um, no matter what, um, is, is so, so important to democracy. It's a collective responsibility. Governments, civil society, and the international community have a responsibility to protect, support, and champion the rights of journalists and media organizations because your safety and freedom are indispensable to the health of our democracy. Jifate is a beneficiary journalist and president of the Tamar Regional Chapter of the GGA. This training has been very informative. It's a step in the right direction by the GGA and the U.S. Embassy. It's given us an opportunity to learn new things. Speech is good, but accuracy is better. So we should focus more on accuracy because if you are the first to break the news and you mislead the public, you have done the public more harm than good. And then um, because people are very passionate about elections, issues about elections, when you 
put the wrong information there, you inflame passions, and that is not good for us. As this year's election campaign intensifies, journalists are encouraged to curb the spread of disinformation and fake news, especially on social media. For Joy News, Carlos Caloni, Accra. The Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry is unhappy about devastating effects of erratic power supply on their businesses. Highlighting their concerns, President of the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Dr. Clement Tosayabu Mako, admonished MPP flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Balmia to prioritize the energy sector to save businesses should he be elected come December. Right, so let's engage my colleague Samuel Imbura, who is currently at that engagement for more. Uh, Imbura, does this engagement with key stakeholders in the business sector signify that Dr. Baumia has officially kick-started his campaign? Exactly, Kenneth. Hello, Imbura. Remember... The, 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 I mean, that the manifesto of the NPP would be open to the public to solicit views from them in framing up the manifesto. So this is actually the first step of it. The vice president is seeking the views of key stakeholders and the Ghana National Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry is the first point of call because they are in the private sector. So yes, this is the first step of the vice president in starting his campaign um, ahead of the 2024 uh, general election. So once the views of um, these key stakeholders are collated, he will inculcate that into his manifesto. And when he gets to the main campaign round, right. he'll be able to share with them his vision right. for the country. Right. Uh, the Ghana Chamber of Commerce also voiced out their concerns about the numerous tax burdens that are affecting their businesses. When they did that, what did the vice president say? Well, the major concern has to do with the COVID-19 um, levy or tax, for instance. They are of the view that, I mean, they, it is a, a nuisance tax and a burden on the traders and business people as well. So for that matter, it should be scrapped. So in response to these concerns by the, uh, the Chamber of Commons, the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Bami, and flag bearer of the MPP, said the concerns and recommendations raised by them actually align with his uh, vision and when he is given the opportunity he would ensure that the concerns are addressed mm. and aside these issues raised were there any other issues that were raised at this meeting well there, there were issues about the um, taxes as well uh, where the vice president is talking about how the tax system is currently being ruled out in the country his major concern is the mode in which the Ghana Revenue Authority collects its tax and more than less harass uh, business owners. He says when he comes into office, he's providing a clean slate to give tax amnesty to all businesses in reducing the burden on them. So at the moment, we, he's done with the engagement with the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We are currently at the Ghana Bar Association office where he'll be soliciting their views as well uh, in framing up his manifesto. Samuel Imbura, thank you very much for that update. Let's uh, listen to Vice President and MPP flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Baumia during his engagement with the Ghana Chamber of Commerce. And that we become a very business friendly country. It is very important that we become a very tax competitive country. This is why uh, uh, about a couple of months ago, I took a trip to Estonia. I've been looking at tax competitiveness across the world. And every year for the last 10 years, the most tax competitive country in the world was Estonia. Every year for the last 10 years. So I was wondering what were they doing? And so I took a team and we went to Estonia to understudy tax competitiveness in Estonia. By the way, they are also one of the most digitalized countries in the world. And so we were able to, to get a good understanding 
but it is not even very uh, complex. Simplicity and transparency, right, in terms of the tax regime. And so we learned a lot from there. So we need to be very tax competitive. We need to be able to bring interest rates down for businesses to be able to function. If you are competing, if you are borrowing at 32% and your competitor in another country is borrowing at 5%, ab initio, you've lost the game. You are not competitive. So we need to understand that and be able to bring uh, we need stability in the exchange rate and also a lot of predictability and reasonableness. Now, in the countdown to December 7th, political party manifestos will anchor the key issues that will define the next government. Today, Star Ghana and join you in the northern regional capital of Tamale to engage electorates. First in the series of the Ghana Connect Town Hall engagements is scheduled for 3 p.m. today at the Bagabaga College of Education. It is